An Outcast's Wish. Highland Heartbeats Book 3. By Aileen Adams. Chapter 1. Mackay Douglas rode along the northern boundaries of the Duncan stronghold, an expanse of land that ranged nearly horizon to horizon. The rocky slopes of Ben Nevis along the edges of the western Grampian Mountains were a sight to behold, as sunrise bathed its slopes in a pinkish-purple glow. Filling his lungs with the scent of pine and heather, Mackay reined in Bruce's gelding to watch the sunrise. He smiled, as always thinking of his mother whenever he peered at the slopes of the mountain. She had been captivated by that mountain, truly believing it was the home of fairies and spirits. She called the mountain Ben Neves in her Scottish Gaelic tongue God rest her soul. Och nothing matched such a wondrous sight, one that always managed to lift his spirits haunted or not. Mackay watched for a few minutes, and then nudged Bruce forward, eyes again sweeping the lush green landscape, looking for signs of trespasses or rogues who occasionally crossed Duncan lands as they headed away from the western shores of Scotland toward the large cities of Aberdeen or farther south toward Edinburgh or Glasgow. Or perhaps even farther south to the lands of Northern Ireland, or to cross Hadrian's Wall into Northern England. Bruce stepped carefully along the marsh club moss, the horsetail, and the ferns that edged the forest downslope, still dripping moisture from yesterday's rainfall. The air was filled with the scent of pine. He gazed over the land, as he paused on the top of a low rise. Down below the sweeping forests were rich with willow, birch and oak, all filling with new growth and foliage now that winter was gone. Warmer days ahead. The hooves of his horse crushed creeping buttercups still closed against the damp and chilly morning air, but come noontime the dog rose and the lady's mantle flowers would emerge to soak up the early spring sunshine. Such a fine day it would be, and he reveled in it, glad that the harsh cold days of winter were over, tired of being cooped up in his small house behind the armory or inside the manor house watching, no, enduring, the love-besotted exchanges of his lifelong comrades and their wives. Mackay's mind wandered to the previous night. Last evening Mackay had stared in bemusement near the front door of the manor house, leaning against the wall, arms crossed over his chest as he watched the way Philip, laird of the Duncan clan no less, ogle his wife Sarah. Literally ogle. Not that long ago Mackay would never have seen such an expression on the face of the laird, a fierce and respected warrior who, though kind and fair to his own people, caused his enemies to tread carefully if they got so much as near Duncan land borders. If Mackay hadn't seen that tender look himself, that crooked smile as he lifted a finger to tap the end of his wife's nose with such a playful gesture, he wouldn't have believed it. He and Philip had known each other from childhood. Philip was only a few years older than he. Actually, Mackay was closer in age to the laird's younger brother by two years, Jake. Jake had an even more fearsome reputation than Philip, with good reason. He was often away fighting, but last year he had been wounded, had nearly died. He'd been home for good since then. He too had fallen in love with Sarah's younger sister, Heather. Love. If that's what love did to a person, Mackay wanted nothing to do with it. He'd shook his head as he watched the lovers at the table. Sarah, Philip's wife for over a year, sat on the bench near her husband, hands resting gently on her growing belly. She was with child, an event that had precipitated much celebration during the cold winter months. Her baby was due in a few months' time. Could falling in love and making a baby really provoke such a change in a man? Mackay tugged at one lock of his hair as he contemplated the question. Sarah sat on a bench on one side of the large table in the great room, while Philip sat at its head where he belonged, smiling as he'd urged his wife to finish eating the chicken and root vegetables on her plate. Across from her sat Heather, who'd watched with obvious amusement, stifling a giggle behind her hand as Sarah had rolled her eyes in her direction. Jake had emerged from the kitchen just then, glowering as he entered the great room. He'd taken one look at his brother and his sister-in-law, and shook his head. Then, as Mackay watched, his expression changed the moment his gaze landed on his new wife Heather. Mackay barely stifled the groan he felt rising in his chest. Ye gods, those two were fully besotted with their wives. It was almost too painful to watch. Still, unable to pull his eyes away, he'd scratched at the stubble of beard on his jaw and watched the interplay between those two as well. 
two of the greatest warriors in the Highlands, the laird and the younger brother of the mighty and fearsome Duncan clan, acting like love-struck youngsters. He shook his head, amazed that mere emotions could compel such a transformation in the brothers. What are you smirking about, Mackay? He'd glanced at Jake, glowering in his direction, and laughed. At you and your brother. With that, Philip pulled his attention from his wife and looked at him, brows raised in curiosity. And what exactly has you so amused? Mackay pushed himself away from the wall and gestured at all four of them. Actually, all of you, that way you gaze at each other, love struck, your eyes glistening with amorous intentions, your lips aching for the touch of the other. Jake plucked an apple from the platter on the table and flung it in McKay's direction. It had barely missed his head, splattering into pieces as it struck the wall beside him. He'd guffaw. I think your besotted brain has affected your aim, Jake, he teased. They expected no less from him. He taunted playfully, as he was wont to do, always the one to try to find humor in any situation. Certainly, things had changed around here, but as far as he was concerned those changes had been for the better. He was glad for the laird and his brother. They deserved to be happy, and he didn't begrudge them that happiness one bit. Truly, if he were to be honest with himself, he would admit that he was a bit envious. He had never been in love. Had never really been interested, or paid much attention to courting anyone. Lately, however, Watching the relationships between those four had him second-guessing. Maybe it was time for him to also find a wife and settle down. Just as the thought blossomed in his mind, he shook his head with disgust. Was he too going soft? Philip and Jake stood, each kissing their wives on their foreheads before Philip had beckoned him to join him outside. The fun was over. Nothing soft about either one of them then, their expression serious. He'd followed the two outside. Are you and your men ready? Philip asked. Mackay nodded, his hand automatically dropping to the head of the axe tucked into his wide leather belt. Aye. Hugh and his men are going to patrol the southern perimeter, and I'll take the northern. Philip was determined to put an end once and for all to the ongoing ordeal with Siana Cameron, the woman who had tried to kill Jake, not once but twice during the past year. She had also stirred trouble between the Duncans and two enemy clans to the north and west, the Orkneys and the MacGregors. Soon, Philip was to meet with the leaders of those enemy clans to renew the tentative truce that had existed between them for years, a truce that Siana's hatred and thirst for revenge had endangered. No one wanted another war with either of the clans. Siana, a local healer who had grown up with the Duncans, had been banished after they'd learned of her plot. She had briefly cavorted with the Orkney clan, but after Siana encouraged them to kidnap Sarah and failed, they too had turned their backs on her, not wishing to go to war with the Duncans over a woman. Philip and Jake wanted her found. The sooner the better. Siana had fallen in love with Jake years ago, but he had not returned her affections. After he was wounded in battle, he had been brought home. Siana, had been called upon to aid in his recovery. Jake had grown worse. Desperate to save his brother, Philip had journeyed southeast to the coast, seeking a well-known healer named Sarah MacDonald, a lowland dweller whose reputation had reached the highlands. He'd kidnapped her and brought her to Duncan Manor to care for his brother. It had been she who had discovered Siana's treachery. Siana had sought revenge following her banishment, first against Sarah and then just prior to winter against Jake. Heather had saved his life. Now that spring had arrived, Philip had renewed his search to find Siana and take care of her once and for all. They all knew that until Siana was dealt with, there was a strong possibility that she would continue to seek her revenge against the Duncans. Now, with Sarah bearing Philip's firstborn child, he was taking no chances. Mackay had grown concerned with the ongoing feud. This past winter he had heard Jake and Philip speak often of the woman, as cold winds whipped outside, the snow creating heavy drifts against the manor house and those in the nearby village. He'd sensed Philip's frustration over his inability to capture Siana, but worried about his laird's thirst for revenge. Obsessions could be dangerous things. 
Mackay didn't begrudge Philip and Jake their marriages, nor the love they obviously felt for their wives. Then again, their relationships were still new. What would happen in another year's time, or perhaps five? He only had his own parents' relationship with one another to base his feelings about marriage upon, and their relationship had been neither happy, nor had it endured the tests of time. Looking back on it, Mackay couldn't really remember many times when his parents weren't arguing. A volatile couple they were, both stubborn, both loud, and both constantly seeming to struggle for, something. He had seen such obsession tear apart his own family. The pain it had caused his mother. Not something he wanted to contemplate happening to the Duncan brothers. We'll find her, he told Philip. He meant it. Philip nodded. If she survived the winter. She had survived. Mackay knew it. He brought himself back to the present. As he searched the slopes of the hills and down to the edges of the forest, he had no doubt that the wicked healer had survived the winter. She had an uncanny knack for saving herself, whether it was through trickery or plain luck. He sighed, gazing over the landscape, contemplating his own state of affairs. Actually, he had none. Certainly, he had been attracted to several village women over the years, but not enough to evoke an invitation of marriage. He shivered at the very thought. Foolish notion, isn't it, he said to his horse. The gelding merely flicked an ear toward him, not at all interested in his opinion. To say that Mackay had a rather dour outlook on relationships and marriage was an understatement. No, women were too much trouble. He focused on his task at hand and continued riding, his gaze continually sweeping the landscape, looking for signs of anything out of the ordinary. Like Siana. He doubted he would see her. If she was smart, she would have left the region months ago before the first snow had settled on the ground. Then again, the woman seemed to have developed a knack for causing trouble. These lands were already dangerous. The Duncans had fought long and hard to protect their borders from clans throughout the highlands. One of these days. He heard a sound like a twig snapping, and pulled his horse to a halt listening. It hadn't come from close by. The birds in the trees still chirped. Not far away a rabbit emerged from the nearby brush and sat upright, ears tilted forward chewing on a piece of grass. Whatever that sound had been, it wasn't close enough to frighten the wildlife away. After pausing for several moments and not hearing it again, he urged his horse forward, his hand resting on the axe tucked into the right side of his belt, a versatile tool and weapon he carried nearly everywhere, along with the fourteen-inch dirk tucked into the belt on his left side, its sharp edge inserted into its sheath resting against his outer thigh. He continued forward. Had the sound merely been the wind rustling through the trees and brush? Perhaps a branch weakened and loosened from its anchor by the harsh winter just passed? Had it perhaps fallen, tugged loose from branches higher up by the early morning breeze? Or had it been the bleat of an animal, a deer perhaps? A wounded creature? He took no chances. He moved cautiously through the rocks dotting the hillside along which he rode, his eyes narrowed with concentration as he scanned the ground below, trying to see into the shadows of the trees of the forest below. What was that? He thought he had seen movement, a brief glimpse of a shadow, a darker shade just inside the tree line. A bear. Too tall for a deer. He glanced at his horse's ears, looking for signs that Bruce was concerned, but the gelding didn't appear alarmed by anything. Still, one couldn't be overly cautious. He was more than a couple of hours' ride from the manor, too far for a villager to have travelled gathering roots or even foraging for firewood. Mackay nudged his horse in that direction, pulling the axe from his belt, his back stiff, his heart thudding. Immediately tense, every sense heightened, he approached the area where he had seen the brief movement. He drew nearer, angling his advance from the side, not wanting to approach whatever it was if it was anything at all from the front. His horse easily picked its way down through the rock-strewn slope. He tried to keep to cover wherever he could, but tree growth along the slope was sparser than farther below. His tension warred in contrast to the beauty and serenity of the landscape surrounding him, the sun warm on his face and soaking deep into his bones. 
Mackay paused at the edge of the tree line, his sorrel gelding blending into the background of the trees and the hillside behind him. He waited, listening. He heard nothing unusual, but still, something felt different. He thought he caught the faintest wisp of wood smoke in the air, so faint he could very well have imagined it. He knew something was in those woods. He felt it in his gut. Dismounting slowly, Mackay continued to seek the deeper shadows. He tied the reins around a small tree, and then slipped into the shadows himself one slow step at a time. He had seen something. Perhaps it had been an animal, but if it wasn't, who would be lurking out here, hiding deep in the woods? He knew of one person at least, but shook his head, resisting the urge to jump to conclusions. In fact it could be. There. He saw something flash on the periphery of his vision, and turned toward it. It was a shadow, and it had not been caused by an animal. An animal would have made noise darting from his presence. He had heard nothing, though he caught just the barest glimpse of someone, and he was certain it was a person, disappearing behind a tree in the near distance. Gripping the battle axe tightly, he followed, prepared to either defend himself or attack if need be. He did his best to stick to shelter, while at the same time focusing on where the shadow had been headed. Who was it? An enemy clansman on the Duncan lands. An outlaw. Glancing down, he saw half a footprint in the loamy soil, the other half disappearing on top of a scattering of pine needles on the forest ground. He noted the broken pine needles, making the trail easy to follow a short distance, then paused briefly to search the woods. His senses finely attuned to the normal sounds of mourning in the woods, his pulse racing, he crouched with anticipation. He tried to think like the person he was trailing. Where would he go if he were hiding from someone and trying to get away? He searched the area. There. He'd go there, off to the right toward the thick overgrowth of bramble bushes. Maybe it was wild hawthorn, but Mackay didn't know or care at the moment. His grip tightened on the axe handle, he quickly followed. Taking ten more steps, Mackay then paused half-hunched listening. Was that the sound of someone breathing, gasping for breath? Up ahead. He headed toward it, moving quickly now. Once again, he saw a shadow dart between the trees. Not quite as dark as the surroundings. He followed, intent now on his target, and quickened his pace still more. The figure was running now, no longer trying to remain quiet or stealthy. Mackay followed, heart pounding, eyes riveted to the dim figure rushing through the forest, branches swatted to the side, sticks breaking, the sound of breathing louder. Suddenly, the figure disappeared. Mackay stopped short and held his breath, seeking the moving shadow of the fleeing figure, cursing himself for losing him. He jogged forward, not hearing the sound coming from behind until it was too late. A breath later, something hard glanced against his thigh, causing him to temporarily lose his balance. He tripped and barely caught himself from falling, going down to one knee as he thrust out his left hand and braced against the base of a pine tree, the bark digging into the palm of his hand. Anger surged through him, not only at his own carelessness but at whoever was out there. How had he managed to circle around behind him so quickly? Even worse, how could he himself have allowed that to happen? Mackay heard running feet, saw movement off to the side, and latched his eyes onto the back of the figure racing away, darting through the trees. Regaining his footing, he pursued. The figure was close, so close he heard the laboured breathing, saw the person swatting branches out of the way as he tried to escape, careening recklessly down the slope of a ravine, seeking the shelter of rocks and the thick undergrowth of brush in the nearby distance. Stop or you'll feel my axe in your back, he threatened, not really surprised that the figure kept moving. He was determined to catch him, to learn his identity, to find out what he was doing out here. He gained ground, darting around trees seeking an angle to cut off the runner. The fleeing figure was slowing, hunched over slightly. In a matter of seconds he had caught up, and reached out to grab the edge of the cloak flying behind the figure, so close he managed to clasp it for a moment before a garbled cry of alarm mingled with pain escaped his attacker, and he darted forward with lurching, almost drunken steps. Mackay heard the raspy breath, and in the back of his mind noted the small, slender figure. A boy. Stop. The figure kept running. 
Mackay grew annoyed now and redoubled his efforts. His attacker was a lad, he was sure of it. In a matter of steps, he once again gained ground. Thinking to put an end to this pursuit quickly, he lunged for the figure, tackling him roughly to the ground. They both fell. He fell on top of the boy, who had landed face down, arms sprawled in front of him on the ground. He caught only a glance of a dirt-smudged face and leaf-tangled auburn hair. Definitely not Siana with her unmistakable red hair. He quickly rose to his knees, grabbing a handful of the cloak and lifting the boy's upper torso from the ground. Get up, he growled. Get up and tell me what you're doing on Duncan lands. The boy didn't respond. He didn't even move. Mackay frowned with confusion. Then he realized the figure wasn't moving at all. Not a finger twitched. Blast it, had he hurt the boy. His anger gone, he quickly turned the lad over. A young lad for sure. He noticed several things at once. The small hands, the pale features, and there beneath the dirt-smudged face, a visage too delicate to be that of a lad. He swore. How is she? Mackay asked, as soon as Sarah emerged from the room, still stunned from the knowledge that the lad he had been pursuing through the woods was no lad at all, but a lassie, and a very pretty woman at that. After he had turned her over and brushed the leaves from her hair, he had seen the braid trapped between the cloak and the tunic she wore. Noticed the shapely legs wearing boys' trousers, soft-soled leather boots laced tightly upward along the calf. The narrow waist. The swell of bosom and then finally, the blood. She had a gash on the side of her head, near her right temple. His mind reeling with questions, he had lifted her into his arms and carried her back to his horse. Not much trouble at all, as she was light as a feather. Why was she out here dressed as a boy? He gently brushed some of the dirt from her face, a face so finely structured, he was amazed that someone so delicate could survive out here in the wilds of the highlands. It had taken a bit of doing to lift her onto the horse and keep her balanced while he leapt up behind her, but he had managed it. He'd adjusted her body and manoeuvred so that she sat side saddle, trying to ignore the soft spots that proved she was a lass. He rode thusly, her torso leaning against him, his arms bracing her form on either side as he grasped his horse's reins. It had taken him several hours to return to the manor house, as he kept his horse to a walk to avoid jostling the lass leaning against him. He didn't know what was wrong with her or why she had not stirred since he had tackled her to the ground. What he did know was that he liked her softness against his body, her warmth and the feel of her breath on his neck. She hadn't roused once, and he worried that she might have some severe injuries, hence his decision to keep his horse to a walk. At the same time, he'd wanted to urge Bruce into a run, to get her to the manor house quickly so that Sarah could care for her. How long had she been out there in the woods? She was filthy, her hair tangled with twigs and dirt, her face smudged, her hands and even her fingernails caked with dirt. Even so, he could tell she was a pretty young lass, with a high forehead, perfectly shaped eyebrows and long eyelashes. He admired the line of her nose slightly raised at the end, and those full lips and firm jawline. He'd found himself glancing down at her often, at the swell of her bosom, the thin bones of her wrists and those small hands of hers resting in her lap. Who was she? A surge of protectiveness had welled up inside him, startling him, but he'd brushed it away almost as quickly as it came, scoffing inwardly. What did he care? He would take her to Sarah, and she could take care of the lass and that would be that. Did you hear me? Sarah had spoken to him. What? She frowned. You're the one who asked me, Mackay. I said she hasn't woken up yet, she replied. She carried a wooden bowl of water in which a blood-stained cloth floated. What's the matter with her? She took a quite nasty bump on the head, Sarah replied, eyeing the cloth. She also has severe bruising, maybe some cracked ribs. Not broken, but... Had he done that? Had he tackled her so hard he had injured her? He frowned. I don't think I hit her that hard. The bruises are older than this morning, Sarah interrupted. You didn't injure her ribs or give her that knock on the head. Did someone beat her, he asked aghast. The thought of someone laying his hand on a woman made his blood boil. He quickly glanced at Sarah, knew that she likely felt the same. 
She and her sister, Heather, had both been beaten and tormented by their stepfather, the cowardly bastard. It's hard to say whether her injuries came from a beating or from a severe fall. Nothing to give any indication of who she is or where she comes from. She shook her head. He nearly growled in frustration. I don't recall seeing her in the village. Do you? No, I've never seen her before. Neither has Philip, Heather or Jake. Martha is sitting with her now, but I'm sure that when she wakes we'll find out more about her. She looked up at Mackay, an eyebrow lifted. Does it matter? The question startled him. Well, of course it matters. We have to find where she belongs. Even if she was running away from something. And if she was? Then we should do what we can to protect her. He wasn't surprised by Sarah's words. She was that way, as was her sister. Still, he couldn't fathom why a young lass like this one would be hiding out in the woods on Duncan lands. Where did she come from? Why was she out there? Was she running from someone, and if so, who? Chapter 2 She floated in and out of consciousness, her senses trying to reach out and absorb sounds and smells whenever she fought her way out of the fog. Nothing seemed familiar. No odor of pine dirt nor air laden with mist that carried with it the scent of ferns and flowers. Where am I? Her eyes felt so heavy she couldn't force them open, no matter how hard she tried. Her body felt heavy as well, the lethargy that had overtaken her so powerful that she couldn't pull through it. She felt the texture of rough fabric on her cheek, the cloth carrying with it the scent of damp, musty earth and a vague hint of sweat and leather. Her memories were vague and fleeting, the images provoked by smells and sensations flashing through her mind, evoking confusion. Then there was the pain. It seemed to come from everywhere in her body, not limited to any one particular spot. Her head throbbed and every muscle in her body ached, so much so that when she did emerge from the depths of the blackness that enveloped her, she wanted to fall right back in, to escape. She remembered being in the woods, being hurt, having difficulty breathing, the pounding of her head. She had tried to fight through it, to survive. How long she had been in the woods, or why, was a mystery. Where was she? What were those sounds, she heard? She tried to focus on them, and after several moments finally realized what they were. Voices. Voices. For some reason, the realization frightened her. But why? She felt someone stroking her skin, no not someone something. Fabric, a cloth laid on her forehead. It felt cool and soothing. Then, out of nowhere, heat burgeoned from within and she felt like she was burning up. Where was the coolness? She wanted the coolness back. She couldn't make sense of anything. She felt trapped in this darkness, semi-awake but not conscious, at least not enough to understand anything going on around her. Why couldn't she open her eyes? Why did she feel so weak? What had happened to her? Once, she thought she heard the sound of gentle female voices, but that confused her even further. What were women doing in the forest? She didn't remember any women there with her. The simple act of trying to work that out was exhausting. Every so often she surged upward from that all-consuming blackness to hear distant voices, mostly female, but on occasion a male voice broke through. Fear encompassed her then, prompting her to retreat back into the darkness that felt so safe. No pain, no worries, no fear. That darkness became her sanctuary, her defense, her safety from, from what? She tried to think, to remember, but the darkness continued to pull her deeper. Voices again. Propelling her up from the darkness, though she wanted nothing more than to stay there. To float in that empty blackness, no pain, no fear. Fear. Fear of what? She heard the voice speaking as if from a great distance. A woman's voice, encouraging and gentle, yet consistent. Open your eyes. Come on, you can do it. That voice so soothing, so comforting. She wanted to please that voice and struggled to force her eyes open. Why did they feel so heavy? Try. Finally she managed to make her eyelids flutter, but along with that came more awareness, of pain. She wanted to go back into the darkness, but the voice kept encouraging. 
Her head throbbed and her chest hurt, hurt to even breathe. I knew you could do it. Her eyes were open, but her vision remained blurry. She blinked and tried to move but found it impossible. Maybe this was enough for now. She blinked again. Gradually, the figure above her began to come into focus. A woman, smiling down at her. She felt the woman's hand smooth the hair back from her forehead, and then place something cool and refreshing on it. A cloth soaked in cool water. It felt wonderful. She glanced past the woman and saw that she was in a room, a bedchamber. Without turning her head, it was too much effort, she saw the woman sitting in a chair beside the bed. There was a small table nearby, rough-hewn walls and a closed door behind her. From the corner of her vision, she noted the edges of a stone fireplace. A coverlet was pulled up nearly to her chin. She felt warm, comfortably warm. She looked up at the woman and tried to speak. Nothing came out but a raspy breath. You're very weak so don't try to talk just yet. You're safe here. For some reason, the words brought her a sense of comfort, but on the heels of that thought came another. Why wouldn't she be safe? Her eyelids grew heavy, those moments of semi-wakefulness exhausting. You're going to be all right, the woman said. You sleep. Rest. The next time you wake up I'll have some broth for you. When next she woke, the room was wreathed in semi-darkness. The undulating glow of a fire caused shadows and flickers to dance against the wall opposite the bed. It was easier to open her eyes this time, and she did so, simply looking around for several moments, trying to recognize something, anything that would tell her where she was. Nothing. She stared up at the ceiling, watching the shadows cast from the fire. No sounds. She was alone. Gathering her strength, she turned her head, curious about her surroundings. She was in a bedchamber, still. The same one as before, but not one familiar to her. She lay in a narrow bed against a wall, a small table and a chair filling the space between the edge of the bed and the opposite wall. A small bedchamber, but it was very warm. On the wall facing the base of the bed stood a small stone fireplace, the source of the heat and dull glow in the room. She lay quietly for several moments, realizing that her head didn't throb quite so fiercely. She listened to the occasional crackle and pop of wood in the fire. Where was she? What was she doing here? How had she hurt herself? She tried to remember what had happened but couldn't. She tried to move, lift her arm from beneath the covers but was too weak. Moments later, she fell back into a dreamless sleep. She wasn't sure what woke her, or how long she had slept, but the sound of soft footsteps on the wood floor brought her out of sleep. Startled but not knowing why, she opened her eyes. The room was filled with light. Daytime. She glanced toward the door just as a woman holding a bowl of something steaming tapped the door softly closed with her foot, and turned toward her. She recognized the woman, who had hovered over her earlier. You're awake that's good, the woman said. She placed the bowl on the table, and sat down in the chair, leaning toward her while she reached out a hand to place it against her brow. Even better. Your fever has broken. Fever? I had a fever? You must be hungry. I have some broth. Will you take some? She tried to speak. Where? The sound of her voice prompted a wince, so thick and raspy. Even the effort to speak was exhausting. You're at Duncan Manor, the woman said. My name is Sarah, Sarah Duncan. This is the Laird's house. How? The woman Sarah smiled. Mackay found you in the woods miles from nowhere. What were you doing in those woods? What is your name? She tried to answer and while her lips moved, no sound emerged. She frowned. Her name? She was found in the woods? Her name? She couldn't think, couldn't remember. Her eyes widened with alarm. Her name. What was her name? She felt her heart skip a beat. Why couldn't she remember her name? I. I can't. I can't remember, she said. Sarah offered an encouraging smile. You took quite a bump on the head. Don't worry yourself. You'll remember soon enough. 
In the meantime, would you mind if I called you Alice? The name was not familiar, but she supposed it would be all right. She offered a weak nod. Who was she? Why couldn't she remember her name? Why couldn't she remember where she'd been? She looked up at Sarah. I... I don't remember anything. Sarah leaned to take the spoon in the bowl and stirred the liquid, releasing steam. You don't remember anything before waking up here, or you don't remember anything before you were in the woods. She thought about that. She remembered being in the woods but not why nor how long. Before that, nothing. She frowned, but even that slight movement pulled at the muscles and skin of her forehead and prompted a new burst of throbbing near her temple. Sarah situated the bowl closer to the edge of the table and then leaned forward, gently lifting her head from the pillow and bracing it against her arm, she then reached for the spoon with her other hand, bringing it toward her lips urging her to take some broth. Her mind whirling with questions and emptiness, she sipped the liquid from the spoon. It was warm and tasted rich and fatty, but had a slightly bitter aftertaste. She glanced up at Sarah. I can tell by your grimace that you taste the herbs. They're healing herbs, Alice, and they'll help you get better. It's a chicken broth with plenty of fat to give you strength. Good for physical healing perhaps, but would it help her remember? She doubted it. She could only hope that with more rest and a day or two of healing that she could remember who she was, where she belonged, and most curious, what she had been doing out in the woods on Duncan lands. She didn't know. She didn't recall hearing the name before, but with her loss of memory she couldn't be certain. However, if she did belong around here or in any village near the Laird's property, surely Sarah would have recognized her. She was able to take several more spoonfuls of the broth, and with each one the taste of the herbs didn't seem quite so strong. The warmth flowing down her throat and heating her belly invigorated her, but she was still too weak to even attempt to sit up on her own. That's enough for now, Sarah said. I have to leave for a little while, but my sister will come check on you soon. You try to sleep. She nodded. As Sarah rose and picked up the bowl and stepped to the door, she turned toward the window over her bed. The light seemed soft as it did at dusk, but for all she knew it could be early morning. She'd lost all track of time and place. Even as she tried to take in her surroundings, the thought uppermost in her mind was her confusion. Could a bump on the head really cause her to forget everything about who she was? She heard voices just outside the door. A woman's voice, probably Sarah's, and then the voice of a man. Without knowing why, the sound of the man's voice made her want to cower under the covers. Her eyes riveted to the door, fighting the lethargy that urged her to fall back to sleep, she stared at the entrance, and then swallowed heavily when the door opened. A man filled the doorway. He was tall, with reddish-brown hair that reached his shoulders. He wore a dark green tunic under an open vest. His legs were long, encased in leather breeches and well-worn boots. Broad shoulders, narrow-waisted, he was handsome. Eyebrows the same color as his hair frowned over eyes that bore deep into hers. Well-sculpted features, a smattering of pale freckles high on his cheekbones. The sharp angle of his jaw hidden behind a stubble of beard, his mouth a narrow slash, lips slightly downturned. He continued to stand in the doorway, one hand resting on the head of an axe tucked into his belt. Vague recognition swept through her. Who was this man? Why did he seem so familiar to her? He stepped into the room. Her eyes widened. She tried to burrow deeper into the covers. Sarah tells me that you seem to have lost your memory, he said, stopping halfway between the door and the side of the bed, arms crossed over his chest, legs hip-width apart. Almost threatening. His head now tilted at an angle, as if he studied something he could not describe. You don't remember what you were doing out in those woods? She offered a very slight shake of her head, knowing that any more than that would cause white flashes of pain throbbing anew. His eyes bore into hers. She wanted to disappear beneath that discerning gaze, but had nowhere to go. She felt a myriad of emotions, afraid of him and not afraid at the same time. That didn't make any sense. She felt as if he could see straight through her. What did he see? Did he know her? Those woods are quite away from any villages, 
and happened to be along the northern boundaries of Duncan lands. She didn't respond. What could she say? It was growing obvious to her that the Duncans protected their lands and borders with fierce determination, but she could offer no explanation regarding her presence in the woods, Duncan lands or not. He took a step closer. Wrinkles at the corners of his eyes either bespoke a man with a great sense of humor who laughed often, but then again, could be caused by looking into the sun. He wasn't laughing now. His eyebrows pulled down in a frown. I don't recognize you. You're not from around here. He wasn't helping her feel any better about her lack of memory. What had she been doing in the middle of those cursed woods, and how had she gotten there? He abruptly sat down in the chair, and nudged it closer to the bed, peering down at her as though he were examining a bug. She frowned. He was close enough now that she could see his eyes were hazel, though when the light struck them just so she saw a hint of green, an unusual color to be sure. You sure you don't remember anything? The tone of his voice conveyed his doubt. She blinked. Did he think she wanted to experience this memory loss? That it wasn't frightening her beyond belief? Did he know what it felt like to wake up and not remember anything about what made her her? If she had the energy, she would have given him a piece of her mind, but she recognized that energy was something she didn't have at the moment. She felt the irritation, but bit back the sudden urge to snap a reply. Was that the kind of person she was? Temperamental? Easy to anger? She had no idea. He continued to stare at her, his gaze taking in every aspect of her head. Of course, buried under the covers as she was, he couldn't see the rest of her. Just the thought of him looking at her body, she felt the heat of a flush rise in her cheeks. He noticed and frowned again, before pulling his gaze away from her cheeks and toward her hair. This gave her pause. What color was her hair or her eyes? She felt a tremor of panic bubble inside her. Who was she? She watched his gaze travel over her face, focusing on her eyes for a brief second before moving down to look at her mouth, then back to her hair. What was he doing? Why was he looking her like that? You tried to clobber me with a tree branch, do you remember that? What? His comment startled her. She had attacked him. Why? Surely she wasn't so foolish to think she could win any battle with a seasoned warrior, and look like a warrior he did. The axe at his waist a knife the muscular hands and forearms. She stared into his face again, and saw the two-inch scar that traced the line of his jaw beneath his short whiskers. No, certainly she would not be so foolish as to attack a Highlander, and a well-armed Highlander at that. Sorry, she mumbled. What else could she say? More confusion. She wanted to understand, but she had nothing to grasp onto. Not even a blur, a glimmer, nothing to hold onto. Just blackness. His glance passed over the length of her, buried under the covers, and then at the fire flickering in the fireplace, before looking back at her. It looked like you had been out there at least a couple of days, maybe more. What was she supposed to say to that? He slowly rose, still studying her in that odd way, lips pursed, as if trying to determine whether she was telling the truth or lying. At this point, she didn't much care what he believed. She didn't know what she believed. There was nothing she could do, at least at the moment, to convince him that she was telling the truth, as she knew it. Her eyelids grew heavy. He sighed and rose from the chair, turned to leave the room, and closed the door softly behind him. She heaved a shaky shallow sigh, all that she could manage without pain, and closed her eyes, ready to sink back into that comforting blackness where fear, pain and confusion didn't exist. Chapter 3 You didn't bother her, did you? He turned to find Heather standing in the hallway, clothing draped over her arm. He shook his head as he gestured to the clothes. Those hers. Heather nodded. They've been washed and dried. Anything that will help determine who she is or where she came from. Heather shook her head. Mackay nodded, and then stepped past her, heading down the hall toward the stairs that led to the great hall, his thoughts troubled. He wasn't sure if he believed her claim that she had no memory. Brief confusion he could understand. 
He'd been knocked around a time or two in his life, so he understood the disconcerted haze that often followed a thump on the head. But to lose her entire memory. Not to remember who she was or her own name. How could she not have one memory of where she came from, and most importantly, what she was doing in the woods by herself? Had she been by herself or was there someone else lurking in those woods? Perhaps he should go back and look around. He might find some signs of a camp. He had seen no trail, not of a horse or carriage or wagon, not even the tracks of a handcart. How had she gotten there? Where had she slept? Her clothes had been torn and dirty, much like the rest of her. She had been out there for more than a day. So many questions. None of which he could answer. If she had been out in those woods for any length of time by herself, he would be impressed. She'd had no weapons. Even he, as skilled in the woods as anyone, would not venture into them without a weapon. The woods were a dangerous place for anyone, let alone a small woman like herself. She certainly hadn't been afraid to try to attack him with that stout tree branch. She had caught him unawares. That didn't happen often. When he entered the great hall, he found Philip at the table looking over some ledges. Mackay approached the table. I think I'll go back to the woods where I found the lass, see if I can learn anything else. Philip looked up at him with a raised eyebrow. You don't think she was out there alone? I don't know what to think. He sighed. But until she remembers or she decides to tell us what happened, we can't know for certain. He glanced toward the stairs. I just don't understand it. How could someone lose memory of who they are, to the point of not remembering their own name? I'm not sure I believe it. Sarah told me that such a thing can happen to someone who's experienced something so frightening that they block it out of their memory. Don't forget she took a nasty bump on the head. She did, but how many times have you, I, or Jake been knocked upside the head? We didn't experience any memory loss. Maybe it's because our skulls are thicker. Maybe we're just more stubborn. Maybe we're just more used to being knocked about in battle. He shrugged, returning his attention to the ledges. If you go back there, take someone with you. I, I'll see if I can find Hugh. We'll go first thing in the morning. Mackay and Hugh left early the next morning, just after sunrise. Hugh McInnes, like Philip and Jake, was a lifelong friend. They had grown up together on the outskirts of the village. They had been trained to join the Duncan Band of Warriors at a young age, maybe fourteen or so. Mackay had driven himself hard and fully invested in the training. It had given him the opportunity to get out of his house and away from his constantly arguing parents. Hugh's father had died in battle when Hugh was just ten years old, and he had been responsible for taking care of his mother ever since. Mackay had helped him in any way that he could. He had liked Hugh's mother, the complete opposite of his. Sadly, she had passed away a few years ago. Mackay's parents had died soon after his 18th birthday. They had been fighting, as usual, while he was away training. Somehow, a lantern had been knocked over. Fire had engulfed their small home. His parents had fought together and died together. After that, Mackay had joined the Duncan forces and had risen up the ranks. He and Hugh, along with Jake Duncan, were in charge of defending Duncan lands, the villages and scattered farmers living on their lands. Two years ago, due to his loyalty and service to the Laird, Philip had given him his own small house, located behind the armory, a modest one-room house, but it had a small yard and stable. Who needed more? Hugh still lived in the home in the village that had belonged to his mother. They had set out just before dawn, and as they rode Hugh pelted him with questions. Mackay tried to fill him in about the mysterious young woman who had been found in the woods, injured and with no memory, but he had few answers. Finally Hugh sighed. Well, I'm sure there's one question you can answer. What's that? Mackay asked, searching the trail in front of them. Is she pretty? Mackay glanced at his friend. What difference does that make? He saw Hugh grinning and frowned. Don't get any ideas. And don't you be going near her, either. She's had enough of a scare without seeing your ugly face. 
Q glanced at him, still grinning. You've already staked a claim on her, haven't you? Mackay frowned. I've done no such thing, but the lass is confused and she's hurt and... And you held her in your arms the entire way back to the manor house, didn't you? I can imagine you found that quite a pleasant experience, seeing as women don't tend to want you getting so familiar when they're awake. He guffaw. Mackay scowled. So he had been rebuffed a time or two. So had you. Look who's talking. He eyed the landscape around them, trying to distract himself from thoughts of Alice or whatever her name was. She was a pretty lass, no doubt about that, and fierce. The fact that she had tried to take a swing at him didn't anger him, but rather invoked a sense of admiration. More than likely she had hoped to knock him unconscious so she could steal his horse. Little did she know that Bruce would tolerate no riders on his back besides himself. He had taken the brunt of teasing about naming his horse, but both horse and man usually got even. Not even Hugh, his best friend, could ride Bruce. He tried three times, each attempt sending him flying through the air and landing hard. He'd given up after that. Any unfamiliar arse that settled in the saddle, and his gelding protested, and violently, bucking, rearing and twisting. No one even dared try any more. They travelled much the way he had ridden two mornings ago. The sun was a little warmer today, the flowers open and soaking in the spring sunshine. The air smelled rich and fresh and he inhaled deeply, intensely satisfied. Nothing like being outdoors in good weather, riding his horse, away from civilization. By mid-morning, Mackay recognised the area and pointed to the thick growth of trees at the base of a slope. Hugh looked around, a slight frown crossing his brow. Here, he asked, turning to Mackay. You found her here. Mackay nodded as he again looked over the terrain, seeing no sign of man nor village. It's the middle of nowhere. He shrugged as he turned to his friend. What was she doing out here? How did she get here? Neither of them had an answer. He led the way down to the tree line where they both dismounted, tying their horses to low-lying tree branches. He then carefully picked his way through the trees, pointing out the path that he'd left behind in his pursuit of the shadowy figure, still visible. No one, man nor beast, had disturbed his footprints. He located the spot where she had tried to attack him with the tree branch, and pointed it out to Hugh. Hugh bent down and picked up the stout piece of wood, clasping it easily in his hand and swinging it idly back and forth. If she wasn't injured, she might have gotten in a better blow. Hugh's comment gave him pause. She had been injured, but still she had been brave, or foolish enough to circle around and try to knock him unconscious, or worse. Mackay frowned. I've a feeling there's more to this lass than we should assume. She was able to sneak up behind me. No easy task, I assure you. Hugh agreed. They moved slowly through the trees, continually looking for any sign of others. Nothing. In a matter of moments, he came to the spot where he had tackled the lass and pointed. Here's where I caught up to her. Hugh nodded, carefully gazing through the trees. Let's split up and see what we can see. Maybe we can find where she took shelter. Anything that might help us figure this out. Mackay nodded, and the two of them separated, he taking to the trees to the east of the spot, Hugh taking the west. He wandered among the brush, winding his way through the trees, but he saw nothing unusual. Squirrels peered down at him from the tree branches. He startled a rabbit and it skipped away. Once in a while he caught brief glimpses of Hugh and heard his movements among the brush a short distance away. He looked for anything to indicate that the lass had spent more than a short while in these woods. Nothing. Maybe she had been riding and her horse had thrown her. That might have been how she had taken that severe bump to the head. But where had she ridden from? There were no villages on these borders, too close to enemy clans. Then again, someone might have abandoned her here. But why? What if? Mackay. Over here. Mackay turned at the sound of Hugh's voice and quickly made his way through the underbrush toward him. He wound his way among the trees, slapping aside pine branches until he came to the edge of a slope, or a shallow trough actually, running through the middle of heavy tree growth. 
Hugh stood on the far side gesturing. Mackay turned to look where Hugh pointed and spied a makeshift lean-to of sorts. Pine branches and shrub branches laid over a fallen tree maybe four feet off the ground. He stepped closer and saw that the branches had been interwoven. Clever. No one would go to that much trouble for an overnight stay, Mackay commented, examining the edges. These weren't cut by a knife or an axe. While it's been cool, we haven't had any harsh weather just the rain the other day, so this probably sufficed to keep her protected from the brunt of it. Q agreed and then pointed. That fire pit has ashes from more than one fire. He glanced around, frowning, looking up into the trees and then deeper into the forest. How long was she out here? Mackay shrugged. I have no idea. He squatted on his haunches and peered into the shelter. Near the back he saw a leather pouch, half buried in leaves and dry pine needles. He pulled it out by its strap and opened the flap. He dumped it upside down. A dress spilled out. So did something else. He reached for it and lifted it from between the folds of fabric. What is it? Mackay frowned, turning it in his hand. It's a ring. Intricate work, he commented. The ring was well crafted and felt like silver, an intricate pattern tapped into the side of the band. A small, roughly heart shaped, deep red stone fit into the bezel. The ring was small, so small that he couldn't even fit it past the first knuckle of his little finger. He showed it to Hugh. Think it's hers? Hugh shrugged. Either that, or it belongs to someone she knew. An obvious keepsake. He frowned again. You think she was running away? Hard to say, he said, lifting the dress from the dirt. A long, sleeveless gown, it was obviously intended to be worn over a kirtle. It was made of plain undyed woolen cloth. The type of clothing that the village women wore. Serviceable, durable and practical. I don't think she was kidnapped, he remarked, holding up the dress. This is not the clothing of a wealthy woman, nor that of a wealthy family. Hugh explored the area around the makeshift camp. Look over here, he said, stopping near a large shrub. Mackay stuffed the dress back into the leather satchel and strode toward Hugh to see what he pointed out. A rabbit carcass lay nearby, near a sharp-edged stone that looked like it had been chipped away to serve as some type of knife. Now he was truly impressed. She was obviously able to create some type of rudimentary trap. I'm sure we'd find it if we looked around a bit. Hugh nodded. She was definitely out here longer than a couple of days. Mackay nodded. Let's look around a little more, see if we can find signs of anyone else out here. Hugh moved off. They both searched in ever-growing circles around the makeshift campsite. He didn't see any signs of other people out here, other than the footprints made by the young woman. Hugh didn't either. He did find a makeshift and very rudimentary deadfall rabbit trap. It was still set, a piece of old smelly cheese stuck to the tip of the bait stick. Very impressive indeed. The rudimentary campsite, the traps, the ability to skin and gut a rabbit. He was ever more curious to know more about their mysterious Alice. Uppermost in his mind was her true identity and what she had been doing out here. He returned to the campsite and reached for the leather satchel. Hugh emerged from the trees a few moments later, shaking his head. Mackay told him about the trap he had found a short distance away, but other than that, nothing. Nothing to identify her. Nothing to tell them what she had been doing out here. You think she wanted to live out here? That perhaps she was a recluse or something? Mackay glanced at his friend and shrugged. It was not unheard of to find an older man or woman distancing themselves from the companionship of others and to eke out a living in the woods, but mostly those were people who were touched in the head. He had never seen or heard of someone as young as Alice doing so. His curiosity grew. Setting a deadfall trap like that was not instinctive. It was learned. Who had taught her? The dress he'd found and the clothing she had been wearing when he found her were certainly not uncommon to the lower class. The dress inside the satchel was in better condition than the one he had found her wearing, but it didn't speak of wealth, at least not as he perceived it. 
Let's go back to the manor. He sighed. I think she was out here alone, but still the question remains. Why? He nodded. Sooner or later, we'll get our answers. I can promise you that. Chapter 4 Alice sat, knees to chest in the small wooden tub, head lowered and eyes closed as Sarah poured the bowl of warm water over her head, rinsing away the remnants of soap from the much-appreciated but short-lived bath. Her head still pounded ferociously, especially after lowering it as she had, but she was willing to sacrifice the pain for clean hair. She couldn't remember the last time she had had a bath, but judging by the dirty bathwater, it had been more than long enough. Just a short while ago, Sarah, the woman who had been caring for her, had directed one of the housekeepers to carry the wooden tub into the room. It was then filled with buckets of tepid water from the pond in front of the manor house, and then warmed with several more buckets of water that had been heated over the fireplace in the kitchen. When she had first seen the tub brought into the room, and placed in front of the fireplace between the bed and the wall, her heart had leapt with excitement. A bath. Finally, she would feel clean again. At the same time, she didn't want to move. Movement caused pain. Even with Sarah's help, it seemed as if every muscle in her body protested the effort to get out of bed. The air in the room had seemed especially cold, when Sarah helped her out of the sleeping gown that she had been given after her arrival here at Duncan Manor. Yesterday, Sarah's sister Heather had brought her clothes back, freshly washed and neatly folded. Alice recognized the clothes, but frowned, having a feeling that they weren't quite what she was accustomed to. One more rinse. Sarah dipped the wooden bowl into the water again, and poured it over Alice's long hair, falling down over her face like a waterfall. Alice stared down into the water at her puckered fingers. At least her fingernails were clean now, most of the dirt having soaked away. She hugged her knees tighter as the water poured over her scalp, easing her tension and worry if only briefly. She lifted her head, then her hands to brush the hair from her face, water dripping down her forehead and off her chin, as she slowly and carefully turned her head so she could look up Sarah to offer a small smile. Thank you. Her words of gratitude were abruptly halted, as the door to her room opened with a crash, followed by heavy footsteps. At first, she thought it was the housekeeper returning with something else, but then she realized and gasped, barely choking back a startled scream as she tried to huddle into a small ball, desperately trying to cover her naked shoulders. At the same time, Sarah spun around and quickly stood in front of the tub, trying to shield her. Mackay. Sarah scolded. Haven't you ever heard of knocking? Ah, my apologies, he said. He didn't sound like he was sorry, Alice thought. She didn't think he could see much of her in the tub, but she wasn't taking any chances. She pressed her knees closer to her body, and lowered her forehead to her knees again, eliciting a renewed throbbing as she peered up at him. What do you need, Mackay? I need to talk to her, he said simply. Sarah muttered under her breath. Well, you can't talk to her right now. Can you please give us a few minutes? It was Mackay's turn to mumble. Through her still dripping hair she saw him peer down at her, at least what he could see of her beyond Sarah. He was holding something under his arm. He frowned before glancing back at Sarah and nodding. I'll wait outside. As Mackay turned to leave the room, Sarah stepped away from the tub, reaching out to shut the door loudly behind him. She turned toward Alice, hands on her hips, shaking her head. All right, let's get you out of that bathwater. You can't be very warm now. Sarah reached for a large folded square of linen that had been placed at the foot of the bed. She unfolded the linen and held it out, turning her head slightly away so that Alice had a modicum of privacy as she straightened, water dripping down her body. Alice glanced down at herself, eyes scanning her body, the bruises most of them on her legs and torso. Had she fallen? Where had she gotten so many bruises? Sarah wrapped linen around her, and then helped her step out of the wooden tub, and then guided her to sit on the edge of the bed. There's a clean nightgown there, if you want to climb back into bed, or you can put your clothes back on. They're clean. While Alice longed to go back to bed, to close her eyes and to disappear into sleep, she knew that she couldn't hide forever. 
She felt weak, but not quite as much so as she had yesterday. It still hurt to take a deep breath, but she was breathing easier today. She looked up at Sarah. I'll put my clothes back on. Sarah nodded, and reached for the folded stack of clothes that had been placed on the chair. Do you need help? No, I think I can do it by myself, thank you, she said softly. I'll give you some privacy, Sarah said, stepping toward the door. I'll be back in a few minutes with Agnes to retrieve the tub. Take your time. She glanced meaningfully at the door. He can wait. Alice nodded, then watched as Sarah quickly opened the door, slipped out, and closed the door firmly behind her. She heard the sound of voices from the other side, Sarah's and a male voice. That Mackay. A curious sort. Her brief interaction with him before had given her the impression that he was a warrior and not a member of the Laird's personal family. Nevertheless, he appeared to have complete freedom venturing in and out of the manor house. She inhaled slowly testing her limits and then sighed. She knew what he wanted. He had questions. So did she. Did he know what she was doing out there in the woods? Had he found anything that would help to answer her own questions? You're going to have to wait, Mackay. Let her get dressed. How long is that going to take? Alice smiled at his tone of frustration. It served him right. Don't you have anything else you could be doing? Of course I do, Sarah. I'm a busy man. But I still need to talk to her. Well, just wait until she's finished. I'll be back in a few minutes. Footsteps and then Sarah's voice again. Have you talked to Philip today? What? No, why? He was looking for you earlier. Another mumble. I'll talk to him after I talk to her. Both sets of footsteps retreated down the hallway. Alice looked down at the clothes, placed her hand on them, her palm brushing against the thick woolen fabric of the trousers and the tunic. Boy's clothes. The tunic looked well worn, very well worn. She frowned. They seemed familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. These weren't the type of clothes a woman would wear, but they were hers, so she could only wonder. What sort of woman was she? Was she one to flout convention? Had she been allowed to wear such clothes, or had she only worn them because she knew she would be hiding in the woods? Hiding. Where had that come from? On its heels came another question. If she was hiding, who or what was she hiding from? She tsked in frustration and then slowly dressed. It was a laborious endeavor, due to her sore and aching muscles. Everything hurt. It wasn't just a recent fall that had caused this kind of discomfort. She did remember running through the woods trying to escape that man, Mackay, who chased her, but she seemed to recall that her movements were already stiff and her body bruised. She relived the several terrifying moments of darting through the woods, trying not to gasp too loudly for breath, lest her pursuer catch up with her. He had anyway, but the brief recollection only prompted her to wonder more. What had she been doing out there by herself? After what seemed like an incredibly long time, she donned the trousers and pulled the tunic over her head. Once finished, she collapsed back onto the bed, exhausted, until a knock on the door startled her. Are you decent? Oh no, it was that man again. Why couldn't he leave her alone? The latch lifted and the door inched open. You better be decent because I'm coming in. Alice stared at the door as a head peeked into the room. Eyes averted, but only for a moment before they swept past the now empty washtub and curiously ventured toward the bed where she sat. She heard his nearly audible sigh of relief as he stepped completely into the room. He pulled a leather satchel from under his arm and tossed it toward her. It landed on the bed next to her. I believe that belongs to you. She stared at him, intimidated yet oddly attracted at the same time. Again she felt her heart skip a beat and a warmth slowly crept up her cheeks. His gaze was so, so discerning. Did he know something about her? If he did, she certainly wished he would share. She pulled her gaze from his and glanced down at the leather satchel. 
she didn't recognize it but with her left hand, slowly pulled back the flap and reached inside. She pulled out a long woolen and sleeveless gown. She fingered the cloth, a slight frown marring her brow. It was plain fabric, though of a finer texture than the tunic she wore. It had not been dyed, it was in its natural dull off-white shade. She looked up at him, eyebrow lifted with curiosity. Is that mine? I found it in your camp, he said. My camp? In the woods, where I found you. It looks like you had made some kind of lean-to, a shelter. He gestured to the bag. That was inside. He reached for a small leather pouch tied to his belt, tugged at the string and opened it, then plucked something from inside and stepped closer. I believe this might belong to you as well. He extended his hand. Well, at least he wasn't going to toss it toward her like he had the satchel. Slowly she lifted her hand, palm up, and he gently placed the object inside. He watched her every move, his gaze that of a hunter's. She glanced down at the object. A ring. Silver, with a small red stone. She didn't recognize it, and told him so. You still have no memory of what you were doing out there in the woods. He looked and sounded as though he didn't believe her. She lifted her chin and met his gaze. I don't remember. What else did you find? She placed the ring on top of the dress. It was small and looked like it might fit one of her fingers, but she didn't want to put it on. She didn't feel like it was hers. Some rabbit snares. She glanced up in surprise. Rabbit snares? He nodded, crossing his arms over his chest. And the carcass of a rabbit, as well as the remains of several fires in the fire pit. A fire pit, rabbit traps and carcasses. She looked up at him, absently touching her throat, unable to make sense of it. How long was I out there, she gasped. You tell me. I can't. I don't remember. He sighed, his lips pressed tightly together for a moment before he adjusted his position. His demeanor shifted as he took a step closer. She resisted the urge to lean away, as he cocked an eyebrow at her. His gaze swept her from top to toe and back again. She tried not to cringe, to not wonder what he was thinking as he inspected her. Well, you look a little better than you did a couple of days ago. Maybe in a day or two, you'll start to remember. I hope so. She chewed on her bottom lip. Did she? Hiding in the woods? Hunting? Wearing men's clothes? How did she get there? What was she doing out there? She had asked herself those questions at least a hundred times since she had woken up in this room. She looked up at Mackay and swallowed. I suppose I should thank you for bringing me here, she said softly. He frowned again. It was obvious that he wasn't one to hide his emotions, or at the very least, he was not adept at doing so. He continued to study her. Was he trying to determine whether he believed her or not? There wasn't anything she could do about that. She was as confused as he. She had no answers for him or herself. Mackay. Mackay turned as Sarah entered the room, followed by Agnes. She was dressed when I came in, he said defensively. Sarah glanced at her and Alice nodded. He brought these, she said, gesturing to the dress now in a crumpled heap beside her. Sarah frowned and stepped closer eyeing the dress and the ring on top of it before looking at her. These don't trigger a memory? Anything? No, she said. Behind Sarah, Agnes and another young woman lifted the wooden bucket by its iron handles and carried it from the room, water sloshing gently inside. Give it time, Sarah said, her tone kind. Your memory will return in due time. When? Mackay asked, his tone tinged with impatience. When it's ready, she snapped at him, sending him a look of exasperation. Now will you let her rest? Mackay said nothing, but continued to stare at her. Alice lifted her hand self-consciously to her hair, still tangled and wet from the bath. Which brought another question surging into her thoughts. What did she look like? Mackay, Philip is looking for you. Mackay pulled his gaze from Alice and glanced at Sarah with a nod, before turning and abruptly leaving the room, closing the door softly behind him.
Chapter 5 Mackay walked away from the bedchamber, frowning in consternation. As he strode down the hallway and took the stairs to the great hall, he wondered why. Did it matter to him why the girl had apparently been abandoned in the forest? Maybe her memory loss had nothing to do with the injuries she sustained out there. She might have been limited mentally. He immediately shook his head. That wasn't it. She was alert, well-spoken, merely confused. He didn't think she posed a danger to the Duncans, at least not by herself. Maybe he would never learn what she had been doing out there. Maybe she would never regain her memory. For now, her care was up to Sarah and Heather. What ultimately happened to the girl would be Philip's concern, not his. Brushing away his misgivings, he turned toward the small room off the great hall that Philip often used to take care of business needs. He found Philip sitting behind a small desk, leaning back, eyes closed. You've been looking for me. Philip opened his eyes and straightened, gesturing for Mackay to enter the small room. Close the door. Mackay did so, observing Philip's demeanor. He appeared agitated, plucking at his bottom lip, eyebrows lowered over bloodshot eyes. You're worried about something, he said. What is it? Just thinking about the meeting Jake is arranging with the Orkneys. He shook his head and sighed. Siana stirred up trouble and it's time to smooth ruffled feathers. She could be dead. The look Philip darted toward him prompted him to regret his rash comment. I'll believe that when I see her body, and not before. Mackay frowned. It was no secret that Philip wanted his revenge against the former healer. Understandable, considering the fact that she had tried to kill his brother twice, and Philip's wife, not to mention what she could have done to Heather months ago. I doubt that either the Orkney nor the McGregor clans will have anything more to do with her now that they know what she's done. She's fairly much on her own. She may have moved on toward the lowlands or maybe even the coast. Philip grunted. She may have disappeared for a while, but I doubt that she'll put her own warped sense of revenge behind her for long. He shook his head, staring down at the parchment in front of him. Something's happened to her, something that turned her into such a hateful, vengeful creature. I agree, Mackay said softly. Just don't let the same affect you. He wasn't prepared for the look Philip gave him, and sought to allay the reaction. I'm not the only one who has noticed your feelings on this matter, he quickly continued. I'm not trying to overstep myself, Philip, but I do know what happens when intense anger and a thirst for revenge snares a person. Of course Mackay was referring to the increased animosity between his parents, each trying to outdo the other when it came to spiteful actions and behaviours. We may never lay eyes on her again. Right this very moment her bones may be lying in the forest, ravaged by wild animals. You may never know what became of her. Philip sighed again. I appreciate your concern, Mackay, but in this instance it is not necessary. He crossed his arms over his chest. What of the girl upstairs? It was Mackay's turn to sigh. No memory of what she was doing in the woods, at least not yet. Hugh and I found her campsite. It looked like she'd been out there for at least a few days, probably longer. She had the presence of mind to set some rabbit snares, and judging by the ashes in the fire and the bones scattered nearby, she was successful in her endeavours. Philip contemplated that for several moments and then shrugged. Maybe she's been living in the forest for a long time. Perhaps. It was possible. At any rate, Sarah told me that you needed to talk to me. I'll be leaving soon for the meeting with the Laird of the Orkney clan. While I'm gone, I want you to stay close to the manor. Watch over Sarah and Heather. Of course, Mackay said, though disappointed. He thought he would be accompanying Philip to the meeting between the clans. I. I mean carefully, Mackay, Philip said, rising. He scowled down at the parchment and then returned his gaze to Mackay. I want you to remain close by their sides. They don't leave the manor house without your escort. They don't do anything without your knowledge. Neither of them are going to like that. Just how do you expect me to? I will talk to both of them. They will obey me and you. 
Mackay frowned. Are you expecting trouble? I always expect trouble, he said. Whether it comes from Siana, the Orkneys, or the McGregors, I strive to never underestimate what they're capable of. Until this situation with Siana is resolved, and until the Orkneys and I have renewed our tentative truce, I want the women protected. He moved to the door. We'll see how the meeting goes with the Orkneys. Then it will be time to deal with the McGregors. After Jake killed one of them and wounded Clyde. He sighed. What a muddled mess this has become. Well, of course, I'll watch after Sarah and Heather, but Philip. There's something else, but I don't want either Sarah or Heather to know about it. Mackay nodded. Now what? I've heard a rumor that Sarah and Heather's stepfather has learned they're here. Mackay lifted an eyebrow in surprise. It had been a long time since Philip had travelled down to the coast and kidnapped Sarah to help his brother, Jake. Several weeks before Philip and Sarah had both journeyed south again, to take Heather away from her untenable situation. Their stepfather, Patrick MacDonald, was a good-for-nothing, abusive drunkard. While he didn't know much about their former situation, Mackay did know that the man had treated his stepdaughters horribly. Mackay frowned. You don't think he intends to come after them, do you? I don't know, Philip said. But I would rather err on the side of caution than to assume otherwise. Why he would want them back, I have no idea, because from what Sarah told me, he didn't seem to have any affection whatsoever for either one of them after their mother died. Mackay thought about it. It was doubtful that their stepfather would venture this far north for his grown stepdaughters after all this time. Didn't Philip have enough to worry about between the disruption of the tentative truce between the McGregor and Orkney clans, and dealing with Siana? Now, he also worried about Patrick MacDonald. He wondered if it was because Philip's wife was with child, soon to bear his son or daughter. Is this what love did to a man? Turn him into nervous knots of anxiety and worry? While Mackay could certainly understand a man's desire to keep his wife and family safe, he hoped that Philip. You're the only one who I can completely trust keep them safe, Mackay. Hugh will be accompanying me to the meeting. After contacting the Orkneys, Jake will continue on to check the northern boundaries. I will not take chances with their safety. You understand. Philip turned to glance at him over his shoulder as he reached for the door latch. Of course, Mackay said. Though disappointed he wouldn't be accompanying Philip after all, he felt honoured that Philip placed such great faith in him to entrust the safety of his wife and his sister-in-law to his care. He would do anything and everything he could to make sure that that faith was justified. Must you follow me everywhere? The question came from Heather, glancing over her shoulder at him with a scowl. Mackay grinned at her. Over the past couple of days, he had taken Philip's concerns seriously and had done exactly as he'd ordered. The first day after Philip left for the meeting with the Orkney Laird, it had been quite a challenge to keep up with either Sarah or her younger sister. Neither of them ever seemed to stop moving. While Sarah had simply ignored him for the most part, Heather was quite vocal about her displeasure at the way he followed practically on her heels everywhere she went. If either of them so much as left the manor house, he was right behind them. He had followed Heather to her meadow only this morning, only to be soundly scolded. Why was he following the two of them? She demanded to know time after time, repeating the same question. For some perverse reason, Mackay had always enjoyed teasing Heather. She was a bit more volatile than her sister, who tended to merely stare him with an implacable expression when he annoyed her. But Heather? No. Actually, he enjoyed getting a rise out of her. Because Philip ordered me to. I gathered that, she snapped. But why? He merely grinned and continued to follow the two of them around, so much so that even Sarah was beginning to grow impatient with him. That thought elicited yet another grin. Despite the fact that Philip had left him behind, he was quite enjoying himself. Mackay didn't underestimate Sarah either, despite the fact that she was soon to become a mother. When she set her mind to it, 
she was even more stubborn, tenacious and fierce than her sister. Marriage to Philip had mellowed her temper somewhat, but when riled she was a force to be reckoned with. He remembered the day that he, Hugh and Philip had first accosted her at the edge of the woods down by the coast. Fists flying, feet and legs kicking. In his mind, they weren't so much kidnapping her as borrowing her for the sake of Philip's brother. She had fought them like a wild animal, kept them all on their toes for quite some time afterward. Looking at her now, in love with Philip carrying his child soon to become a mother, she had mellowed. So had Heather after she married Jake, to an extent. Marriage suited them both. Which once again had him contemplating his own state of aloneness. And immediately on the heels of that thought came the image of Alice hunched down in the wooden tub, pale knees jutting upward, her long auburn hair cloaking her face, those thin bony white shoulders and her delicate arms wrapped around her knees. A brief surge of desire swept through him at the image, but his attraction to her was more than physical. He still couldn't understand why he was so curious about their temporary houseguest. She grew stronger every day. When she recovered her physical strength, what then? Where would she go? Who would take care of her? Would she return to the woods? Was someone looking for her? Until they learned more about her identity, there was no way to know. Until they did, he was jarred from his wayward thoughts when he suddenly walked straight into Heather, nearly knocking her off balance. He quickly reached out his arms to steady her. Mackay. She turned to face him, arms akimbo. What has gotten into you? He certainly couldn't tell her the real reason, so he played dumb. What do you mean? It's bad enough that you follow Sarah and me everywhere we go, every time we so much as step outside of the house. But if you're going to follow me to the village, I would appreciate it if you would pay attention. She shook her head. I asked you if you knew the blacksmith's son. He frowned. Of course I do. I know everyone in the village. Why? Because he often travels to the outlying villages. I thought I would ask him to come by the manor house tomorrow, take a peek at Alice, and see if he recognizes her. Maybe he knows where she's from. It was a good idea. He was disappointed that he hadn't thought of it. Well. Well what? Do you know where the blacksmith and his son live? Of course I do. Don't you? She heaved a put-upon sigh and rolled her eyes upward, as if striving for patience. If I knew Mackay, I wouldn't be asking you, would I? He grinned. Perhaps, perhaps not. It could be that you're trying my patience on purpose. He barely held back his laugh, as her face reddened with emotion. I'm trying your patience. They live in a hut at the edge of the woods, not far from the smithy. She scowled and moved off in a huff, and he followed, deciding he wouldn't torment her any longer, at least for a little while. The smithy was quiet, and when they knocked on the small thatched house a short distance away there was no answer. She frowned. Where could they be? Likely at one of the outlying farms, fixing a plough or taking care of horses. That's what they do, you know. Another heavy sigh from Heather before she abruptly turned around and headed back to the manor house, mumbling under her breath, as Mackay followed, highly amused. When they returned, Sarah waited at the door. She took one look at Heather's scowl and then turned to Mackay, arms crossed over her chest, eyebrow lifted. Is that the look she gave Philip when he annoyed her? What? I'll need some help with Alice. Why, what's the matter with her? He frowned. Had she taken a turn for the worse? Heather and I are going up onto the ridge to gather some herbs. I convinced Alice to come outside, get some fresh air and feel some sun on her face. It would do her spirit wonders. And? And she's too weak to trek up the side of the hill. I need you to carry her. You what? Mackay took a step back, frowning. Now this was going too far. It was one thing to be asked to watch over Heather and Sarah. He had no problem with that. But why did he have to? Come along, Sarah said, brooking no refusal as she turned into the house. I convinced her to do it, and if we wait much longer she's apt to change her mind. 
Mackay couldn't help it. Are you certain she'll remember that she agreed to go? His question brought scowling looks from both of the sisters. Once again, he bit back a laugh. Chapter 6 Alice tried not to stare at Mackay's jaw as he held her in his arms, following Sarah and Heather up the steep hillside a short distance behind the manor house. She tried but wasn't altogether successful. Up close Alice could see every whisker on his chin, count every last line around the corner of his eye, watch the pulse throbbing in his neck. From exertion? She didn't weigh that much. No not fatigue. He didn't even breathe heavily. He was very strong. It felt nice to be cradled in someone's arms like this. She didn't think she ever had been. If she had, wouldn't she remember? The sensation of hard bulging biceps against her skin, the way he tucked her close against his chest, the sound of his breath as he strode upward. She noted how focused his gaze was as he studied the terrain prior to every step. Then again, was it really superior focus or merely the fact that he didn't want to look at her? Did she care? Her left arm wrapped around his neck, and her palm resting against his upper shoulder allowed her to feel every play of muscle, every twitch and flex as he strode upward. The fingers of her right hand instinctively clutched at the leather lacings of the tunic covering his chest. They were loose, allowing her an occasional glimpse of bare skin. She had hesitated when Sarah beckoned her to come outside with them, but now she was glad she had acquiesced. She sighed and tried to distract herself from thinking about Mackay and his muscles. She didn't know why exactly but something disturbed her, prompting her to remember, something niggling at her brain. She had felt it last night too, lying in bed before she dropped off to sleep. It was something important, wasn't it? Else why would it keep returning? She didn't know what it was. She had been found in the woods for a reason. She glanced again at Mackay, the way his jaw set just so, and then he heaved a short sigh and glanced down at her. Their eyes locked. Her heart skipped a beat. Why are you staring at me like that? Do I have horns growing out of my head or boils on my face? His question startled her, so much so that she automatically leaned back, which in turn prompted him to tighten his grip around her torso. Stop squirming or you're likely to send both of us sprawling down the hillside. Is that what you want? The words were spoken softly and not with anger. Indeed, the corner of his lip twitched upward, and for the first time she saw the beginning of a dimple. She felt the heat of a flush rise in her cheeks. Again. What was the matter with her? Why did she always feel so, so disconcerted in his presence? Because he had rescued her? Brought her out of the woods so that Sarah and Heather could care for her? She frowned. If he hadn't come in after her, she wouldn't have needed. What? She muttered under her breath. What's the matter? She glanced again at Mackay. This is so very frustrating. He lifted an eyebrow. What is? You don't want to be with the sisters. He gestured up the hill. It's nice up there. This time of day there will be lots of sunshine. It will do you good, put some color in those pale cheeks of yours. No not that, she replied softly. This inability to remember. She gazed ahead and watched as the sisters topped the rise, then both turned to wait for Mackay and his passenger. Give it time, he said. Sarah is the best healer in the country. You mean the county? No Alice, I mean the country. Her reputation as a healer has traveled far and wide. We heard of her skills way up here in the highlands, and she lived in the lowlands down by the coast in Kirkordy. Alice wondered how such a thing could happen, and even more so about what had happened to bring Sarah and her sister up here to the highlands. Highland clans tended to be isolated and somewhat judgmental of others, especially lowlanders. The thought gave her pause. How did she know that? Mackay, do you need any help? The question came from Heather, who stood hands on her hips waiting impatiently. Mackay merely laughed and shook his head as he topped the rise. Since when have I ever needed help from you? She can sit there on that rock, Sarah said pointing. She turned to her sister and stroked her belly, an unconscious movement that Alice had seen her performing on numerous occasions. 
She was a lovely woman inside and out. She would make a good mother. Heather watched as Mackay carried Alice over to a large rock and gently lowered her down onto it. She felt every bulge of his rock-hard muscles as he did so, admitting to herself that she was reluctant to leave his embrace. Her hands lingered on his shoulder a moment longer than was probably necessary, but then he straightened and cast his gaze over the landscape. Heather, over there, I think I see some Bogbian. I could use some of that, and over there, a bit farther, I believe I remember seeing some blaberry. Maybe the cook would like some of those, perhaps to make some tarts or if there's enough, to make some dye. Heather nodded and idly swung her empty basket. Sarah pointed to the other side of the field, closer to the edge of the hill. I'll be going over there. Alice watched as Sarah adroitly pointed out various flowers and plants she wanted to gather, impressed by such skill. Although she knew a few plants, she mostly recognized them by their pretty flowers or their leaves, not for their medicinal or healing properties. Mackay, Agnes told me there's meadowsweet up here also. If you're not too busy, can you gather a handful or two for me? Alice looked up at Mackay, as he stared at Sarah with a dumbfounded expression. Finally he replied. You want me to pick flowers? Yes, if you would be so kind. Alice held back a grin. Sarah looked innocent enough, but Alice recognized the sparkle in her eyes and the glance she had sent her sister. Mackay sighed heavily, as if greatly put upon. I suppose I could, if I knew what it looked like or what it was. Sarah made a face at him, and Alice chuckled. These three were good friends he could tell. In fact, everyone in the manor house seemed to be very close. That sense of camaraderie, of friendship and loyalty, and that devotion to family touched her deeply. She gazed out at the landscape, again wondering how she could sense that she had missed out on such things. Was her memory coming back? It's over there near the edge of the woods. She pointed. It's a low-lying shrub with dark green leaves, with tiny white clusters of flowers. Mackay started to move off. Oh wait Mackay, do you want my basket? Mackay gave her a look and she burst out laughing. As Mackay moved off, Sarah turned to look down at Alice. Alice would have laughed as well, but feared it would hurt. Her rib cage was still tender. Are you feeling all right? You're strong enough to sit there without help? Alice smiled up at her. Yes thank you. And the sun does feel good on my face. She watched as Heather and Sarah, each carrying baskets began to wander through the field. She tried to turn to see where Mackay had gone, but the movement caused pain as her muscles protested. So she ignored him for the time being, allowing herself to relax and absorb the warmth of the sun on her face. The land was rugged and beautiful, this field itself surrounded by trees dotting the mountainside rising behind them. The panorama before her nearly took her breath away. It was lush and green, the air was fresh, and the scent of wildflowers growing in the field delighted her senses. She listened to the birds chirping, the rustle of the breeze through the trees, causing the long grass in the field to bend slightly, undulating with life and vigor. Down the slope, the steep slope, she barely saw the roof of the manor house and its outlying buildings. She watched the movements of several people, going about their afternoon chores in the fields beyond. Threading her way beyond the manor property, she followed the dirt path, weaving along meadow and pond in front of the manor toward the outskirts of the village in the distance. Duncan. Duncan, the Duncan Manor House. Sarah and Heather. The Laird Philip and his brother Jake. She hadn't seen that one yet, but she had caught a brief glimpse of the Laird the previous day, before he left on some errand with several of his men. A tall imposing figure of a man, the sight of him had caused a shiver to ripple down her spine. She repeated their name over and over in her mind. It seemed odd, vaguely familiar, but she couldn't imagine why or where the memory had come from. Did she live in the region? She thought again of the Laird. Mackay had caught her eye, frowning toward Alice as if he could see right through her. It had been no more than a passing impression, but it had startled her nevertheless. It was almost as if, as if he recognized her. But if he had, he surely would have said something. No one else at the manor house that she had come into contact with, 
expressed any hint of recognition. Likewise, nothing about any of them triggered a memory in her mind. She realized, she had been imagining that look he had given her. She had confused a look of curiosity with something else. She wasn't aware of the passage of time, focused only on how wonderful the sunshine felt upon her skin. It was invigorating. She had been cooped up in the manor house for several days, and before that she had no memory other than the sheltering canopy of trees in the woods, unable to see more than a short distance in any direction, and too afraid to venture far from her camp to explore. And there it was, another small memory. Not a memory really, but rather something that she felt rather than visually remembered. She pushed the worrisome thoughts from her mind, and concentrated on the field in front of her. Then realized how quiet it was. The birds had stopped singing. She frowned. Sarah stood on the far side of the field, near the edge of the slope that overlooked the manor house. It was quite steep, and Alice worried that she might be getting too close. She glanced around to see if she could find Heather or Mackay, maybe gesture for them to keep an eye on Sarah. Heather had her back turned toward her at the northern edge of the field, hunched down on her knees. Based on her movements she dug at some roots. Alice thought she recognized the yellowish flowers of Brown and Fruick. The knowledge startled and pleased her at the same time. Maybe her memory was coming back. She pulled her thoughts from her ability to identify the root, as she watched Heather. Where was Mackay? Carefully and ever so slowly, she twisted around to see if she could find Mackay, over where Sarah had directed him to gather the meadow sweet. He was nowhere in sight. Had he gone back to the manor house? She wasn't sure. She turned back toward Sarah. Don't get too close to the edge Sarah, she called out. Her voice didn't carry far, the breeze blowing toward her. She was weaker than she had thought. A hearty shout would have been sufficient, but she couldn't even manage that. She shifted her position on the rock, not sure what she should do. Surely Sarah was experienced enough with the landscape around the manor house, and with her gathering of herbs and roots to avoid getting too close to dangerous places. Nevertheless, her swollen belly might prevent her from moving as deftly as usual. Maybe she should. Something hard slammed into Alice from behind. With a gasp Alice was propelled forward, landing face down on the ground beside the rock, the breath knocked from her lungs. Pain exploded in every part of her body. What? She grimaced in pain, her head throbbing anew as she looked up to find a wild-haired woman standing over her, a rusty-bladed dirk raised high in her hands. Wide-eyed and stunned, Alice could only stare up at her, mouth open, no sounds coming out because she couldn't breathe. Why? Before Alice could move, the woman wearing the dirt smudged and torn tunic stepped past her, her gaze focused on Sarah, hands extended in front of her, one clutching the knife, the other extended like a claw tipped with dirt-encrusted fingernails. Where had the woman come from? What did she want? Alice didn't like the look she had briefly seen on the woman's face. Obviously mad, or seemingly so. When she realized the woman was heading for Sarah, she tried to scramble to her hands and knees. Her body didn't want to move. She tried to call out a warning, but her lungs protested her efforts. Where was Mackay? She quickly glanced towards Sarah, her back turned away from her now, unaware of the woman quickly approaching from behind. Now on her hands and knees, Alice realized that the woman intended Sarah harm. Heart pounding, disbelief surging through her, she tried to shout warning but as before her voice was not loud enough to carry the distance. She turned to look at Sarah's sister. Heather. Nothing. Heather kept digging. Alice forced herself to take a deep breath, ignoring the sharp stabs of pain in her chest. She had to do something. The wild woman was stepping ever closer to Sarah. She shouted as loud as she could. Heather. Heather lifted her head and looked toward Alice. With supreme effort, Alice lifted a hand and pointed toward Sarah. She turned to look over her shoulder, immediately rising when she saw Alice on the ground. Alice lifted her arm again and pointed toward Sarah. Heather glanced in that direction, then shot upward, flinging her digging tool to the side as she broke into a run, screaming. Sarah! 
Sarah look out. Alice watched the scene play out in disbelief. This couldn't be happening. Why? Where had the wild woman come from? Why did she seem intent on Sarah? Sarah turned, saw the wild woman now rushing toward her, arms outstretched as if she intended to push Sarah over the edge of the slope. Heather kept shouting as she lifted her kirtle and ran toward both of them. Sianna! Sianna don't! Sarah needed help. Without thinking, Alice reached for a fist-sized rock near her hand, and then scrambled to her feet, heart pounding, pain thrumming through her body as she forced herself to her feet and staggered toward the two women wanting to do something, anything to help. She watched in horror as the wild woman reached for Sarah and pushed her. Hard. With a startled cry, Sarah toppled to the ground. Instead of reaching down with an arm to break her fall, she wrapped her hands around her belly and tried to twist as she fell, so that she'd land on her back. She landed hard, eyes wide, mouth open in a silent cry. Alice saw the wild woman lift her hand, saw the rusty blade. She tried to shout, but Heather was already closing in on the two. An outraged scream erupted from Heather's throat as she bore down on the wild woman. Alice was not far behind. Heather got to Sarah just as the woman crouched down on one knee on Sarah's other side, ready to plunge her knife deep into her belly. Garbled sounds escaped her throat. With an angry feral growl, Heather grasped the woman's arm, twisted her around, and tackled her to the ground. They both rolled in the dirt. Heather! Sarah cried. Sarah tried to rise, one hand gripping her belly, the other braced against the ground as she watched in wide-eyed horror as Heather and the wild woman fought for the knife. Alice staggered forward, her legs weak, her body trembling not only from exertion but fear. She clutched the rock tightly in her hand, forced herself to push past the pain, past the blackness that threatened to encroach on her vision. Go, go. Help them. She had made it halfway to Sarah when suddenly, the two fighting women separated, Heather lying on the ground on her back, her forehead bleeding, the wild woman scrambling to her feet, weaving, the knife now held low in her hand. She gazed between the two sisters, as if trying to decide which one to kill first. No. Alice gasped. The wild woman stepped past Heather and once again focused on Sarah, struggling to rise, cradling her belly, eyes wide, but not afraid. No. Not afraid. She was angry, her nostrils flaring, baring her teeth, her eyes riveted to the woman's face. Heather struggled to roll over as well, scrambling to her knees, desperately trying to tug her kirtle and undergown from around her legs as she managed to rise to her feet. Once more the wild woman raised her hand, the blade of the knife high before it swung downward. Sarah lifted her arm, blocking the blow with her forearm while again twisting on her back, one arm still protecting her belly as she lashed out with a leg, but missed the woman. What Alice could only describe as a cackle erupted from the woman's throat, as she swung downward again with the knife. Alice took a chance, paused, gritted her teeth and swung her arm back. She heaved the rock with all her might toward the woman's head. It missed her head but struck her shoulder, just enough to even distract her from her focus on Sarah. For the briefest of moments, she turned to glance over her shoulder. The woman's face was twisted with hatred, her mouth open in a grimace, her eyes shining with madness. Alice quickly and desperately searched the ground for another rock. A loud scream of rage broke the silence, and Alice darted her gaze toward Heather as she scrambled toward her sister, the look on her face fearsome, jaw clenched, face red with emotion, the veins in her forehead throbbing visibly, blood dripping down her cheek. She grabbed the wild woman around the waist and twisting forcefully, hurled her over the side of the slope. Heather stood at the edge, her braid hanging over her shoulder, her eyes wide, hands balled into fists, her chest heaving with fury. Alice scrambled to Sarah's side, as Heather finally turned to kneel by her sister. Sarah! Sarah, are you all right? Alice reached her at the same time, and placed her hand on her shoulder, urging her to lie still as her sister assessed her for any injuries. The baby, is the baby all right? Heather asked frantically, stroking Sarah's hair, her other hand resting gently on her sister's stomach. We're all right, Sarah managed. Just? We're all right. She turned to Alice. Are you all right? Alice was astounded by Sarah's concern for her. Yes, yes I am. 
She looked at Heather. You're bleeding. Heather touched her fingers to her forehead and then withdrew them, glancing down at the blood. We're all right. We're all right. The sisters stared at one another, both obviously startled by the incident, while Alice tried to make sense of it all. Who was that? An evil woman, Heather muttered, visibly trembling with emotion as she glanced over her shoulder. She quickly stood and moved to the edge of the slope, gazing downward. Is she? She's not moving, Heather said. She looked up and searched the field. Where's Mackay? Chapter 7 Mackay rose to his knees and leaned back, lifting his face to the sky, reaching for the back of his head which throbbed with pain, his thoughts confused and fuzzy. His fingers came away sticky and wet, and he glanced down at them. Blood. He stared at the blood, stunned for a moment, and then cursed and stumbled to his feet, wobbling dizzily for several seconds as his vision slowly cleared. The women. He stepped from the edge of the tree line, his gaze automatically moving toward the rock where he had left Alice. She wasn't there. He glanced to his left but didn't see Heather either. He could see her basket lying on its side on the ground, flowers strewn around it. His heart pounding in panic, he darted his eyes toward the perimeter of the field near the edge of the steep slope, then groaned when he noticed Heather hunched over her sister while Alice was on her knees nearby. Flinching, dread roiling in his stomach he made his way across the field, afraid of what he would find. Someone had snuck up behind him and clobbered him in the head while he was plucking flowers. Of all the foolish, nonsensical things he had ever done in his life. He had been given a job to protect them, and he had failed. It didn't matter why. He reached the women and took everything in in a glance. Sarah lying on her back, knees raised, hands cradling her belly as she stared up at her sister. Heather hovering over her, arms wrapped around her waist as if in self-protection. Alice on her knees next to Sarah, one hand on her shoulder, the other bracing herself on the ground. Mackay. Sarah looked up at him, eyes still wide with fright. It was Siana. Siana. He quickly glanced around. Where is she? Heather silently turned toward him, and then, unwrapping an arm from around her sister, pointed toward the edge of the slope. Down there. Are you all right, Sarah? Mackay asked, hoping his panic was not discernible. Did she hurt you? Sarah didn't answer right away, but then shook her head. She pushed me, but I think I'm all right. Help me up. All three of them reached for her, but Mackay pressed down on Alice's shoulder and told her to stay put while he reached for Sarah's arm. Between Mackay and Heather, they pulled Sarah slowly to her feet. They didn't let her go as she stood for several moments, assessing her condition. She took several slow breaths, hands supporting her belly, all three of them watching her carefully. I'm all right, she breathed. She looked at her sister, frowned when she saw the cut on her forehead. She hurt you. Mackay glanced at Heather, who stared at her sister with wide eyes as if surprised by the comment. Heather continued to tremble, her face ashen as she quickly glanced down at herself then shook her head. No, no, I'm all right. Her voice wavered as she turned to Mackay. I, I threw her over the edge of the slope. Her eyes filled with tears and her lips trembled, again wrapping her arms around herself. Mackay glanced uncertainly between the women and then toward the slope. He needed to go after Siana, but didn't want to leave the women here unprotected. Not that he had done much protecting. He cursed his stupidity. I'm all right, Sarah said. Go to Siana. She may be hurt. He glanced at Alice, also slowly rising from the ground, grimacing in pain. He reached out an arm to give her extra support, and she glanced at him and nodded in appreciation. When she stood, he slowly straightened. I'm all right too, Alice said. Mackay released his grip on her arm and quickly stepped to the edge of the slope. He saw Siana at the bottom, her kirtle twisted around her legs, lying on her stomach, arms flung outward. Wait here, he said. He quickly made his way down the slope, sidestepping, arms out to his sides to maintain his balance. His head hurt, but he ignored the pain. He deserved it. Siana had tumbled quite a way down. 
she would be lucky if she escaped any broken bones. His anger surged. He should have known the woman would not give up her revenge, not based on her past history. He should have been more careful and paid more attention. But the woods had been so quiet, nothing to indicate her presence. She must have been already hiding among the shrubs and trees inside the edges of the forest, had likely been there for some time watching, waiting for her chance. How long had she been hiding there? Watching the manor house, the comings and goings of Philip, Jake and the others. The presence of the birds and the chattering of squirrels had indicated no alarm at her presence, making him believe that she had been there most of the day, if not longer. He reached Siana's side and rolled her over, and none too carefully. She didn't deserve his pity. He didn't care if he hurt her. He didn't care if she, as she rolled onto her back he noticed the odd angle of her head. Her neck was broken. Siana was dead. Good riddance. Mackay quickly glanced at the slope over his shoulder, glad that Heather wasn't watching. He headed back up the slope, determined to get the women back to the manor house and under protection before he sent men back here to retrieve Siana's body. After that, he would send someone to relay the news to Philip. He would be relieved, one worry put to rest. He tried to ignore his own discomfort and the shame he felt at his failure. He deserved whatever Philip saw fit as punishment for his carelessness. He had been charged with the women's protection, and he had let them all down. Even Alice, still weak and recovering from her own injuries, had come to Sarah's defense. He topped the rise. How badly is she hurt? Sarah asked, her voice now calm, an arm wrapped around her sister's shoulders. She's dead, he said simply. Heather uttered a loud gasp and clasped a hand over her mouth as her eyes flooded with tears. He shook his head. Don't weep for her, Heather. If it wasn't for you and Alice, Sarah and her baby might be dead right now. He was sure Heather understood that, but she had taken a life. He remembered the first time he had killed, but it was on the battlefield. He scowled. Sarah should not have had to endure yet another attack by Siana. Heather should not have been the one to kill Siana. He felt a surge of self-loathing rise within him and stood still, arms by his sides mentally berating himself over his failure. He would face the consequences but his heart ached. He glanced between Sarah and Alice. Which one to carry down to the manor house first? Sarah seemed to read his thoughts. I'm fine Mackay, she said, shoulders back, nodding with self-assurance. Heather wrapped her arm around her sister's waist, and the two of them began to slowly make their way through the field toward the path that led back to the manor house. Without waiting or even saying anything to her, Mackay swept Alice into his arms, gritting his teeth against the pain that throbbed on the back of his head. Warm blood still dribbled down along the back of his neck and beneath his shirt. Mackay, you're hurt. I can walk. Alice's voice prompted a sarcastic chuckle to erupt from his throat. Nay, lass. My pride is more than a bit wounded, but I'm fine. Who was she? At first Mackay thought not to answer, but the young woman had done her best to help defend Sarah against Siana's attack. The least she deserved was an explanation. As he followed Sarah and Heather from a short distance slowly down the slope, all of them stepping carefully, he quietly told his Alice about Siana's treachery. Well then maybe that's best, Alice mumbled, arms wrapped around McKay's neck. Oh, I'm not a cold-blooded, bloodthirsty woman, she said softly in self-defense. At least I don't think I am, but it sounds to me as if the woman brought this down on herself. I'm glad Heather killed her. Mackay said nothing, wearing his guilt and humiliation like a heavy shroud. He felt numb, disengaged, and his tight chest and the thickness in his throat were difficult to ignore. By the time they returned to the manor house, Agnes and several of the other staff emerged, all of them talking at once. Mackay slowly lowered Alice to her feet, while Agnes's daughter helped her inside, followed by a weeping Heather with Sarah trying to comfort her. The women were pelted with questions. So too was Mackay, but he waved them off and headed for the armory where he knew he would find several clansmen. He pulled two of them aside and directed them up the slope, telling them where they would find Siana. 
He wanted her brought back and put in the small shed behind the stables, where grain and hay were stored for the horses. The two men quickly moved off, exchanging curious glances as Mackay hailed another clansman. He told him that Siana was dead, and to ride for Philip and give him the news. He didn't offer any explanation and no details. Enough time for that later. Those tasks completed, he returned to the manor house and stopped Agnes as she quickly hurried downstairs toward the kitchen. Are they all right? I, other than some jangled nerves and some bruises, they're all fine. I'm drawing water for baths. She looked up at Mackay. Is it really true? Siana is dead. He nodded. Good riddance, she huffed. Mackay said nothing as Agnes touched his arm. Did she already know what happened? Had she been given the dirty details? That he had failed to protect the women? That the three women, one of them heavy with child and the other injured and weak, had defended themselves against yet another attack by Siana. That Heather had been the one to kill her, and not himself. If he had done his job, Heather wouldn't have had to defend herself or her sister and the baby against Siana's attack. He briefly closed his eyes and sighed, trying to ease the tension building in his shoulders. Let me get water heating for their baths, and I'll take care of your head, Agnes said with a kind smile. Never mind, it's all right, Mackay grumbled. He turned and left the manor house, a myriad of feelings rushing through his mind all at once. He headed for the livery, saddled his horse and rode away from the manor house and back up the hillside behind the house. As he reached the top, he saw his clansmen emerging over the top of the slope, dragging Siana by her arms up over the top. He stared for several moments and then turned toward the woods. Maybe she had been alone, maybe not. He was going to find out. Armed with both Dirk and Axe, he was out for blood, if for no other reason than to redeem himself in his own eyes for his utter and complete incompetence. Chapter 8 Her heart pounded so fast that she feared she would drop dead right then and there. She pressed her face against the trunk of the tree, so hard that she felt the rough surface of the bark digging into the flesh of her cheek. She wanted to disappear, to blend into the background, the pines, the shrubs, the very dirt itself. She'd survive this long, please, more time. She needed more time. She closed her eyes for the briefest of moments, to relish the scent of pine and sap, hoping it would not be her last memory. She hoped that the tree was large enough to prevent her from being seen. They couldn't find her. They couldn't. They mustn't. Alice jolted upright with a gasp, eyes wide, fingers clutching the sheet and blanket that covered her. At first, confusion reigned. Where was she? This wasn't the forest. She no longer smelled the pines nor heard the breeze rustling through branches, nor the sound of a hawk soaring far overhead in the distance. Her chest heaved with her frantic breathing, her heart still pounding fast to so hard she felt the pulse throbbing in her neck. She stared wide-eyed around her. Darkness. Only the dying embers in the fireplace gave her a sense of calm, reassured her that she was not in the forest, hiding from them. She sat up in a bed, in the bedchamber in the Duncan Manor house. Not the forest. Not the forest. Gradually her heart slowed, as did her breathing. Still she trembled. This was the aftermath of the nightmare that made her angry and frightened at the same time. Why couldn't she remember? They had been after her. But who were they? Every night, she had a similar nightmare. Every night she woke like this, skin damp with sweat, pulse pounding, hands trembling. This night, she had to desperately blink back her tears. She could not succumb to her fear. Her unknown fear. Different images, different sensations, smells and emotions. They raced through her mind so fast, fleeting images that she couldn't grab onto. She knew that it was her memory trying to re-emerge, but the images were so disjointed and so confusing that nothing was clear. She sighed and threw the covers back, and then swung her legs over the side of the bed. Her feet made contact with the worn wooden planks of the floor, cool and comforting in their solid strength. Slowly she stood and walked to the window and peered outside. She hugged herself against the night chill as she gazed outward, saw that it was still dark, most likely the middle of the night. 
The Duncan house was quiet. Outside she heard the steady chirp of a cricket, and down by the shores of that pond in front of the manor house, frogs croaking. Moonlight shone on the surface of the water. Overhead stars dotted the sky. The glow of the half-moon separated the darkness of the grounds surrounding the manor house from the shadows of the water, but beyond the darker and inky blackness of the forest hovered as if watching, sending a shiver down her spine. Would the nightmares ever end? Would they continue to torment her, on a nightly basis until her memory returned? What if it didn't? Was she doomed to start her life over? literally rebirth as an adult with no memories or reliance on who she had been before. How old was she? Did she have family somewhere, worrying about her? Would she forever be Alice? Two days had passed since the wild red-haired woman had been killed. Earlier today, just before dusk, the laird had returned with a small group of clansmen. From her window, she had watched them ride into the yard in front of the manor house. The laird and another man had quickly dismounted and rushed inside. She tiptoed to her door and pressed her ear to it, listening to the sound of male voices interspersed with those of the house staff, one of them calling for Sarah, the other calling for Heather. She felt guilty about eavesdropping, but curiosity got the better of her. The man with the laird must be Jake, his younger brother. They had worn expressions that warred with anger and worry. Both were large men, handsome in their own rugged ways, but truth be told, the expressions on their faces as they had entered the manor house had sent a shiver down her spine. At that moment, she worried about Mackay. Would the laird blame him for what had happened? She hoped not, and resolved if given the opportunity, she would speak up in Mackay's defence. After all, he had only been doing Sarah's bidding. Alice was beginning to learn from her short-lived experience that when Sarah asked for something, she was never refused. It seemed everyone wanted to please Sarah. Alice liked Sarah and her sister. They were both kind, compassionate, and even-tempered women. They didn't order people about or look down on others. Neither made unreasonable demands. They were pleasant to be around. In her own experience, she felt that both sisters had offered her a sense of camaraderie and acceptance. Maybe that's why everyone in the household, and even the warriors, were pleased to do Sarah's bidding. She had moved to sit on her bed, contemplating her future as the sound of voices drifted upward. Laughter. Everyone talking at once. Despite the noise, the number of voices in the hall below, she felt isolated. Lonely. Homesick for she knew not what. Alice knew she couldn't stay at the manor house much longer. She was healing, feeling stronger every day. She didn't belong here. Unsettled, aware that she was an outsider, she had for the first time given thought to her next steps. She had to try to decide what to do. She had no idea where she belonged or where she came from. Should she return to the forest? Was the answer there? She instinctively knew that she shouldn't, but she obviously had the skills to survive there. She couldn't sit still. She'd started pacing her room, absent-mindedly nibbling on a fingernail, when suddenly a loud and heavy knock on the door startled her. She'd spun around, hand clapped to her mouth to prevent a scream before she counted to three, and then spoke. Come in. She'd cringed at the fear in her voice. Much to her dismay, the laird and his brother had entered the room, looking even larger than they had appeared from outside. Both stared at her, unblinking. The laird's presence was intimidating, his brother's even more so. The laird stood slightly in front of his brother, broad-shouldered with dark unruly hair, his brooding frown provoking her heart to skip a beat. Dark eyebrows over dark brown eyes stared at her, as if he could see into the depths of her soul. His expression shifted somewhat, as one eyebrow lifted ever so slightly. The man standing behind him, had seemed even more imposing, if that were possible. He looked a lot rougher than his brother. Jake, the one who had gone off to war and been wounded. He was the reason why Philip had ventured south to the coast to kidnap Sarah. Their features were similar, yet Jake's hair was lighter than that of his brother, his face slightly wider, his jawline squarer. She'd feigned calm as she clasped her hands in front of her, so they wouldn't see her trembling, as she stared wide-eyed at both of them. 
She made an attempt to swallow as she curtsied and then changed her mind, afraid that she would choke because her mouth was so dry. Laird Duncan, she choked out her voice hovering just above a whisper. She turned to his brother. What was she supposed to call him? You're Alice. That's what they call me. She gave a nod, accompanied by a slight shrug. I don't remember. My wife tells me that even though you are still recovering from your injuries, that though you barely have the strength to walk, you tried to protect her against Siana's attack. What could she say to that? She'd offered a slight nod. And Heather tells me you even heaved a rock in Siana's direction, Jake said. Distracting her enough, so that my wife was able to tackle her, and throw her misbegotten hide over the side of the slope. Again she hadn't known what to say, so once more simply nodded. You still have not regained any of your memory? She turned to the laird and shook her head. No laird Duncan. The two men had exchanged a look. She wasn't sure she was supposed to hear it, but she heard the laird whisper to his younger brother. She looks vaguely familiar, don't you think? Jake Duncan stared at her for several moments, then frowned and shook his head. The laird had turned back to her. I came to thank you for helping my wife and Heather. You showed great bravery. If you wish, after you have healed, you are free to remain with our clan. Alice had felt a surge of relief at his words, but it was tinged with something else. Fear. She wasn't sure. She'd offered a slight curtsy and thanked the laird and that was that. They turned and left the room, closing the door softly behind them. Now, standing in front of the window, even the memory of the brief interaction left her feeling a myriad of emotions. She stood looking out into the night, not sure what to do. Where did she belong? Was someone out there looking for her? Or had someone abandoned her in the forest, hoping that she would die there? What could? She saw movement. It looked to be a man walking slowly along the shore of the pond. She watched. He stood for several minutes, unmoving, staring out onto the water's surface. He turned to look at something near the field nearby, and in the moonlight she recognized McKay's profile. She hoped he hadn't been punished for what had happened with the wild woman. Siana. Knowing that she wouldn't be able to go back to sleep with her mind spinning with questions and uncertainties, she quickly removed her nightgown and donned the boy's clothing that Mackay had found her wearing in the forest. Though she had been given an old undergown and kirtle to wear, she sensed she'd feel more comfortable in boy's clothing. She wondered why. Uncertain what compelled her to do so, she quietly left her room and made her way slowly down the hallway, stepping carefully so as not to wake anyone before moving down the stairs and toward the front door of the manor. When she reached the entrance, she opened the door and slipped through, closing it softly behind her. She smiled. She had made it the entire way, without feeling extraordinarily tired. The night air felt cool against her skin, raising goosebumps. Still, it felt good, removing the remnants of the lingering fear from her nightmare. Some strands of hair had worked loose from her braid, and she brushed them away, tucking one particularly stubborn strand behind her ear. She approached the pond and Mackay, who stood with his back to her. He didn't acknowledge her presence, although by his stiffer posture she was sure he knew she approached. Mackay? He said nothing for several moments and then slowly turned. He glanced past her toward the manor house, then around the yard. Alice, what's the matter? Nothing, she said. I saw you from my window. You looked. I thought that maybe you would like some company. She regretted saying the words the moment they left her mouth. What made her think that Mackay would want her company? She quickly tried to retreat. I shouldn't have bothered you. I'll go back in. No need. He sighed. I couldn't sleep either. She wanted to ask but didn't. They stood quietly for several moments, but with each passing second, she all the more regretted coming out here. What would be more awkward? To stay here and stand near Mackay in silence or simply turn and walk back to the house. She debated that very question until he turned to glance down at her. Why aren't you tucked snugly into your bed? The question caused her face to flush with heat, grateful he couldn't see it. 
I, I couldn't sleep. Why not? She didn't really want to answer that, but did anyway. I had a nightmare. He grunted low in his throat as he turned to peer over the surface of the pond. The water lapped gently against the shore in a rhythmic slap pause, slap pause. A short distance away, among the reeds surrounding the far side of the pond, several frogs croaked, one after the other, each with a slightly different tone. What kind of nightmare? A nightmare, she replied hesitantly, not sure how to respond. The kind that makes your heart pound and jolts you out of sleep, confused about where you are. He turned to face her. And who you are? She nodded, then realized he might not have seen it. He had. Are you getting any memories back at all? She shook her head, exhaling a soft sigh as she turned to also study the surface of the pond. Just images of hiding in the forest, hoping that they wouldn't find me. Who? I don't know. She shrugged, glancing up at him. That's the problem. I don't know. I just know that I couldn't let them find me. He said nothing for several moments, but then he stooped down, picked up a small stone, and tossed it, skipping it over the surface of the water until it plopped one last time and sank beneath the surface. I hear that the laird and his brother saw you earlier. Yes? She glanced up at him with uncertainty. They seem so, so intimidating. He offered a small laugh. Aye, they've both been known to display some bits of temper, especially Jake. But they've both settled down since they were married. I hope you. I hope the laird wasn't angry with you, Mackay. She had to get it out, not expecting him to respond, yet not that surprised when he did. I've known Philip and Jake since we were very young. I've rarely seen Philip lose his temper. Jake, yes, but not Philip. He paused with a shrug. I'll be talking to him in the morning. He asked for me. He inhaled deeply, and then let the air out of his lungs with a huff. He knows Sarah, and that she and her sister would chafe at being followed around everywhere like I was doing after he left, but I do know that I let them down. He picked up another rock, skimming it again over the surface. No matter what happens, I'll always know that I let all of you down. I shouldn't have been off digging up those flowers. He offered a chortle, that displayed no humor whatsoever. I was supposed to be protecting you, to watch. Mackay, it's not your fault. And whose fault is it? That wicked woman. It's her fault. None of us heard her before she was there. She took you off guard, clobbered you in the head. If I was thinking properly, paying attention, she never would have gotten within ten feet. He shook his head, muttering unintelligibly under his breath. You should go back to the house, Alice. You'll catch cold out here. She felt a surge of disappointment, and tried to ignore the heaviness that settled in her body. Who did she think she was, trying to offer a bit of support and comfort, and to a seasoned clan warrior at that? He didn't need to hear platitudes and sympathy from her. She was only making it worse. Still, she didn't want to leave. You're right, Mackay, I should. But she didn't. Abruptly she sat down on the ground, the grass soft under her backside, content to just sit and stare at the moonlight glistening on the surface of the water. If he wanted to leave, he could. She didn't want to go back to the house just yet. She didn't want to go back to bed, nor did she want to close her eyes and sleep, leaving herself easy prey for another nightmare. To her surprise, Mackay heaved a sigh, tossed one more pebble across the surface of the lake, and then sat down cross-legged beside her. Chapter 9 Early the next morning, even before the sun had fully risen over the eastern horizon, Mackay stood in front of the door of the manor house, heart thumping with trepidation. It wasn't that he was afraid of Philip or Jake. He never had been, and knew that he never needed to be. But today, maybe he deserved to be. He had been charged with the protection of both their wives and Alice. He'd been surprised when Alice approached last night, as he strolled along the edges of the pond. That she had sought him out. She had been very brave the other day, confronting Siana, who could have turned on her with that knife. In her weakened state, she would have been no match for the woman bent on revenge. 
he felt a pull toward Alice, and although he didn't know her and she didn't even know herself, he sensed that she was a good woman. In the field she had acted on instinct. Her desire to protect Sarah and her unborn baby said a lot about the woman, whether she knew who she was or not. He should have said something about that last night, but truth be told he felt a bit awkward in her presence, her close proximity eliciting a mixture of physical sensations and thoughts that had him distracted. He had enjoyed unobtrusively studying her profile in the moonlight, intrigued by the way the corners of her mouth turned up in a gentle smile as she gazed out over the water. He needed to find out who she was but at the same time, he didn't really want to know. She was Alice. On the heels of that thought came another. Guilt. What if she was married? What if someone had abandoned her, hoping that she would die out in those woods? Didn't she deserve to know? If she was running from something, what was it? Such thoughts lingered in his mind, as he slowly entered the manor house and made his way toward the small space that Philip often used to deal with what he called nuisance work. Ledgers. Letters. Mackay didn't really know what went on behind those doors, but he was glad that he was not the laird of the clan. Too much responsibility, not just for the safety of his immediate family, but everyone who lived on his lands. That was not to say Mackay was one to shirk his duty. He would perform his responsibilities to the utmost of his ability. As he paused before the door, his heart thumped dully in his chest. And what would he do if Philip discharged him of his duties? Would he lose his home, his position among the Duncan clan? It could be that he deserved anything Philip or Jake decided to mete out to him. He knocked once, heard a muffled voice from the other side of the door and entered. Philip glanced up and gestured for him to close the door. Mackay waited, trying to hide his nervousness. Since yesterday afternoon when Philip had returned, Jake arriving with him, neither had sought him out nor attempted to speak with him about what had happened. Maybe he should be the one to broach the topic and get it out of the way. Philip. Lair Duncan. What's this? Philip said, tossing the feathered pen down onto the small desk he used. Laird. He shook his head. I thought you knew better than that, Mackay. Mackay was only briefly mollified. Philip, I let you down. I let Jake down. I. Are you all right? Mackay frowned. What? Philip leaned back in his chair. From what Heather and Sarah have told me, you took a solid knock on the back of your head. Are you all right? McKay's hand instinctively lifted, his fingers gently touching the bump and small gash on the back of his head. Yes I am but... Philip peered at him, his expression somber. She could have killed you too. At first I was angry, Mackay, make no mistake about it. I charged you to keep the women safe. Mackay started to agree, but Philip lifted his hand. Mackay, don't fret so. I know that you would give your life for Sarah or Heather. We both underestimated Siana. I didn't expect her to be this close to the village, let alone the manor house. He offered a shrug. Besides, there's not many of us who will turn down even the smallest of Sarah's requests. I was digging up flowers, Philip, flowers. He shook his head, grimacing with self-disgust. What kind of man does that when he's supposed to be protecting? Philip interrupted. Don't berate yourself too much, Mackay. You might be surprised at some of the things that I've found myself doing because Sarah asked it of me. Though Mackay was certainly curious about that, he didn't ask. If it weren't for Heather and Alice. We can't go back and undo the past. We must just be grateful that the women are all right. Siana got what she deserved something she's had coming to her for a long time. Mackay nodded. Still, he couldn't understand why Philip wasn't furious with him. If the situation had been different, would he have been as gracious? About this Alice. Has she remembered anything? Where she comes from? What she was doing out in the woods? Her name? He shook his head. She told me she's been having nightmares. And when did you talk to her? I couldn't sleep last night. I was strolling along the pond. 
She found me there, and we talked for a little while. While Philip raised an eyebrow, he didn't pursue it. Mackay continued, she has the feeling that she was running from something or somebody. She told me that she couldn't let them catch her. Who? Mackay shrugged. I have no idea. Philip frowned, his index and thumb gently plucking at his lower lip as he contemplated what Mackay had told him. I can't help but feel that she looks vaguely familiar. Not from around here, though. I know everyone in the village. Even relatives of villagers who've come from other regions. Someone would have recognized her by now. I've asked around in the village. I have as well, and so too have Heather and Sarah. No one seems to know who she is or where she came from. Neither of them said anything. Finally, thinking that the conversation was over, Mackay turned to leave with an inward sigh of relief. Philip hadn't suggested punishment or banishment. While he was certainly relieved, he recognized that Sarah had had a somewhat gentling influence on the laird. In the past, Philip's temper could be quite fearsome. In the past, such a situation as the attack in the meadow on the ridge above the manor house would have elicited the shedding of blood. Sarah could have been killed. She might have been injured so badly as to lose her child. Heather could have been the one to go over the slope and broken her neck, instead of Siana. Alice too could have been seriously injured, or worse. She would have been easy prey for Siana. He cringed at the thought of Siana's knife plunging into Alice's chest. And yet, while Philip seemed to have forgiven him, he wasn't sure he would ever be able to forgive himself for his lapse in judgment. I have something else I need to speak with you about. He turned around, eyebrow lifted, waiting. My meeting with Ian Orkney. Mackay waited. The Orkney clan had been warring with the Duncan clan for generations. Ian, the Orkney clan leader, was a brutal warrior, neither hesitant nor remorseful for the devastation he brought on neighboring clans. While Philip and the Duncan clan never sought revenge against women and children of enemy clans, the same could not be said of Ian Orkney. It was Ian's son, Fergus, who had kidnapped Sarah away from Duncan Manor not so very long ago. After Siana had been banished from Duncan lands, she had taken up, albeit briefly, with the Orkney clan. After an initial clash with Philip and some warriors of the Duncan clan following that kidnapping, tensions had risen. Blood had been shed. And how did that go? Mackay finally asked. Philip shook his head, his tone slightly surprised as he replied. He's getting on in years. I got the impression that he has no lust for renewing animosities. Of course the feud still stands, but he's not going out of his way to provoke us because of Fergus's actions. Mackay thought about that. And exactly where is Fergus these days? Ian said he didn't know. Do you believe him? I'm not certain. But I still want to keep the patrols going. I want two-man patrols for the next month or so, just to be on the safe side. I'd feel better if I knew where Fergus was. But now that Siana's dead, that's one less thing to worry about. That small comfort, Mackay muttered. I can't say the same thing about the McGregors. Mackay straightened, a frown furling his brow. While the Orkney clan were known as fierce, brutal warriors, the McGregors could be even worse. There were rumours that beheadings of their own people had occurred in recent years. What have you heard? Ian mentioned that Angus McGregor is contemplating revenge for Kent's death and for Clyde's injuries. Mackay felt a surge of temper. And well, they both deserved it. Another situation triggered by Siana who after the Orkneys would no longer have anything to do with her, managed to work her way into the good graces of Clyde MacGregor, nephew of the clan leader of the MacGregors. A truly evil bunch. He shook his head. Siana had stirred up trouble throughout the Highlands. While he often hesitated to think ill of the dead, he couldn't be more pleased that the wicked woman was gone for good. Just months ago, Siana had taken up with Clyde MacGregor. He and his cousin Kent had attacked Heather and Jake, nearly killing Jake. Kent had been killed and Clyde wounded. And the McGregor was out for revenge. Mackay bit back a curse. 
The McGregors were nothing more than bullies. They liked to fight. They thrived on spilling blood, intimidating not only rivaling clans but their own people. Until I learn more, I want you to continue watching after Sarah and Heather. Philip I. From now on, someone will accompany you. That way if either Heather or Sarah need something, or want you to do something, you'll have another pair of eyes watching. Philip offered a shrug. I know that they're not going to like it, not one bit. Both of them may cause you more than a headache or two. But until the baby is born. I understand. Mackay held back his sigh. Still, he couldn't hide his disappointment. He was a warrior, and he needed to be out there patrolling Duncan lands, keeping everyone safe, not just. And I want you to keep an especially close watch on Alice. He frowned. Alice? Yes. Mackay didn't understand. He thought over the laird's words for several moments, and then his eyes widened. You think she's a spy? You think she's spying for an enemy clan? I don't know, Mackay. But until we can find out something about her and where she comes from or who she belongs to, I don't feel as if we should take any chances. Don't forget, there have also been rumours that Patrick MacDonald has learned of his daughter's whereabouts. While Mackay certainly felt that Philip should be cautious, he frowned. Alice a spy. Impossible. Her memory loss. You think she's pretending her memory loss? He harumphed. If she is, she's awfully good at it. As I said, I don't know. And because I don't know, I'm not about to take chances. We made a mistake underestimating Siana. It won't happen again. If she has anything, anything at all to do with the McGregors, the Orkneys or Patrick MacDonald, we'll find out eventually. But until then, you keep a very close eye on her. Do you understand? Mackay nodded, though he didn't feel comfortable with this order at all. He knew he shouldn't feel any hesitation whatsoever to do the laird's bidding, but he liked Alice. Maybe more than he had wanted to admit it. The thought of spying on her, of pretending. I think it's best since she's stronger now that she be moved out of the manor house. Mackay was trying to keep up. And just where do you? He saw the expression on Philip's face, the way he looked at him with a raised eyebrow. Mackay scrambled to translate that expression. Finally he realized. You don't? Philip, you don't honestly think I should? He shook his head. I don't want to be suspicious of her, I truly don't. But I think under the circumstances it is the wisest approach. But I don't want her so far away that we can't keep an eye on her. She can stay at your house behind the armory. Mackay sputtered. Philip, I. There's not enough room. Where would she sleep? Where would I sleep? This is highly improper, even you must admit that. Why, I barely know the lass. That may be so, Mackay. Philip sighed. But right now, I'm only concerned with keeping Sarah and Heather safe. Mackay stared at Philip and saw the genuine worry in his eyes. Understandable. Soon, he would become a father. It was natural that he worried about his wife and her well-being. She had had a close call, and if he could help ease Philip's worries even a little bit, he would be glad to do so. All right, Philip. I'll go up and talk to Alice. I'm not exactly kicking her out, Mackay. Philip sighed. It's just that... Well, to be perfectly honest, I'm not certain I can trust her. Until we find out for sure where she comes from, I really think it would be best if we kept her close but not right under my roof. I understand, Mackay said. Is there anything else you need from me? Just one thing. Philip stood and crossed the small room placing both his hands on Mackay's shoulders. I need you to forgive yourself. There's nothing for me to forgive. Things happen, things that sometimes we have no control over. You didn't do it on purpose. Siana was hell-bent on revenge. If it wasn't yesterday, it could have been tomorrow, or next week. He paused and gave Mackay a gentle shake. We can only do the best we can. As I said, no one anticipated Siana being so close, not even me. So forgive yourself, all right. 
Mackay appreciated Philip's words, but no one blames you for what happened, Mackay. No one. Not me, not Jake, and not Sarah or Heather. In fact, Sarah blames herself for pulling you away from your duties. We're just glad that everyone's safe and unharmed. Mackay nodded and then turned to leave the room. Plenty to think about, that was for sure. With heavy steps he took the stairs, heading for Alice's room. Now, how was he going to tell her that she had to come live with him? Chapter 10 Alice slowly paced her room, occasionally pausing by the window to watch the goings-on outside. In the field beside the pond out front, a group of warriors trained. After she had returned from her middle-of-the-night stroll, and her short conversation with Mackay, if it could even be called that, she found herself more confused than ever. She was feeling better and stronger every day. She wasn't back to her former self physically, but she was no longer bedridden or too weak to pace her room as she was doing now. As far as her memory? Who knew? Maybe she would simply have to start over, but start over as who? Alice. She knew she couldn't stay here much longer. It was not only a matter of her uncertain history, but it was a matter of imposing. This was the Laird's house. She was not part of the family, not a trusted confidant, not a member of the staff. She would have to leave soon, she knew that. What she didn't know, was where she would go from here. How did one start over? What if? She heard footfalls in the hallway, and turned from the window when she heard them pause in front of her door. No immediate knock. If it had been Sarah, Heather or even Agnes, she would have heard a knock, and then the latch to the door being lifted. Another visit from the laird? Perhaps his brother? Finally two short knocks. Alice, it's Mackay. May I come in? Yes, she said, still standing in front of the window, feeling the warmth of the sun on her neck and shoulders. Not wanting him to see her nervousness, she put her hands behind her back and leaned against the wall. When he entered, as always happened, her heart gave a little skip and a jump. She couldn't deny her attraction to him, any longer. That giddy hammering of her heart occurred every time she saw him. The heat of a flush rose in her cheeks, and she quickly averted her eyes to the floor. I'm not. I'm not quite sure how to say this, so I'm just going to come out and say it. She glanced up with a slight frown. Was he going to say something about her wandering out to speak to him last night? She knew that it was not done. Women didn't just waltz out of their home in the middle of the night to speak with a man. Not alone. I'm sorry Mackay, I didn't mean. He lifted his hand and shook his head. Not about that. It's about something else. She watched him, the way he briefly nibbled at his lower lip, as if trying to find the right words to say. All of a sudden, she knew what it was. I have to leave, don't I? He glanced up sharply. I'm feeling stronger every day. It makes sense. It's not what you think. I don't belong here, Mackay. I know that. She gestured to encompass her bedchamber. Everyone has been very kind. She lifted her chin and straightened her shoulders, pushing away from the wall. I don't wish to impose on the laird and his wife. She paused, a slight frown wrinkling her brow as she watched Mackay shift uncomfortably. The thing is, I don't know. I don't know where to go. There's a small house behind the armory. You can live there for a while. She wasn't expecting that. A small house? Does the laird know? Mackay looked directly into her eyes, and then gazed past her out the window. He nodded. He's the one who suggested it. Alice felt a surge of relief. She wasn't sure why but there it was. So I don't have to go back to the woods? Or find someone in the village who will take me in? He shook his head and offered a slight shrug. Not for the time being. She wasn't sure what that meant, and didn't want to barrage him with too many questions. For the moment, she was grateful that she would still have a roof over her head. She nodded. Let me just gather my things. I'll be ready in a moment. Mackay nodded and stepped from the room, standing with his back toward the door in the hallway. 
She turned to the chair beside the bed. Actually, she didn't have many things to gather. She wore the boy's clothing. She had the undergown, the ring, and the leather satchel that Mackay had found at her old campsite. All right, I'm ready, she said, stepping to the doorway. Mackay glanced at her over his shoulder, offering a nod. He looked disconcerted, muttered a small hum under his breath, and then rubbing a hand through his hair, he moved down the hallway, not looking back. She could tell something was bothering him, but how did she know that? It wasn't that she knew him well, but since she had been here, since the moment she had seen him in the woods, she'd easily been able to read the emotions on his face. Anger. Frustration. Guilt. The look on his face now was hard to define, but he was feeling something. She followed him along the hallway, and down the stairs to the great hall toward the entry of the manor house. No one else was around, not Heather, not Sarah, not even the housekeeper. The place looked deserted. She wondered where everyone was, and then decided it didn't matter. It was none of her business. What the laird and his family did should be of no concern to her. Mackay opened the door and glanced once again over his shoulder as she followed him outside. This way. The sunshine felt wonderful on her face. She loved spring. New life. New birth. Clutching the leather satchel close to her chest, she frowned slightly at the thought. How did she know that? How did she know that she loved spring? She sighed as she followed Mackay, receiving only brief glances from clansmen busy with their tasks. She heard the clang 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 of the blacksmith pounding on his anvil. Maybe a sword or horses. In the stables a short distance beyond, she watched as two clansmen tried to settle a prancing gelding. From the armory, she heard a burst of laughter. Beyond the armory and near the edges of the pond, two of the household staff knelt washing linen. And life went on. Time might stand still for her, but it didn't stand still for anyone else. Finally, moving past the armory and toward a small meadow beyond, Mackay gestured. You'll be living here for a while. She said nothing, as she followed him into the small yard with a little stable near the house. The thatched roof house was not large, not much bigger than her former bedchamber in the manor house, but it looked solid and the thatched roof looked in good shape, enough to withstand the spring rains and thunderstorms which would soon arrive. The walls were constructed of stone, covered with clay that had hardened over time. The wall on the left corner up to the window space was covered with a mossy light growth. The thatched roof looked like Lua her brush, with bits of straw and heather intertwined. A chimney at one side, a door near the corner of the opposite. In front of the window sat a long wooden bench. Mackay tugged on the leather strap protruding from a small hole under the wooden latch on the door, pushed it open, and gestured for her to go inside. She entered, taking it all in in one glance. The small fireplace to the left. A cooking pot rested on a low stone hearth in front of it, the stack of wood between the edge of the hearth and the front corner wall. To the right, a pallet on the floor constructed of a lumpy mattress stuffed with straw. The bedding looked clean and comfortable. On the back wall between the bed and the hearth stood a small wooden table with two stools on either side. On the front wall beyond the edge of the bed stood a row of hooks. Oddly, several items of clothing hung from those hooks. There's a small stream that trickles behind the house just down the hill. It drains into the lake a short distance away. You can't see it from the house, but it's handy for washing and bathing when the weather's good. She turned toward him, saw the flash of color in his cheeks and realized that he was telling her she could bathe there. No more wash tubs, no more house servants bringing her heated water. She nodded. There's a small cubby attached to the back of the house. You'll find dried meat, potatoes and root vegetables there. Until summer, anyway. When the garden is going strong, everyone reaps the benefits. He paused. Of course, all the women in the village are expected to help with the gardening, in order to share in its bounty. She nodded again. Of course. Well, I suppose you might as well make yourself comfortable. Again she nodded, not sure what to say. I'll see you later. Later? He nodded. Of course. I live here. The door had almost shut behind him before she found her voice. 
Wait, wait, Mackay, what did you say? You live here? The door opened, and he stepped halfway through the threshold. Yes? Her entire body tensed. Feeling disoriented, she took a step back, eyes wide. But, but we can't live together, she stammered. We're not. Not really. We're merely sharing the space. But, but it isn't proper. He shrugged. Who's going to know? She sputtered. Everyone. Mackay, I. She wanted to run past him out of the house. Anywhere. Her hand flew to her chest, as if in self-protection. This couldn't be happening. Are you sure the Laird knows about this? Of course she wanted to ask more questions, but that's the first one that came out of her mouth. This was... Of course. Mackay nodded. As I said, he's the one who suggested it. But why? Why? He seemed surprised by the question. Yes Mackay. Why? She gestured around the room. Is that your bed? She felt her cheeks flame with heat as she said it. He nodded. Where am I going to sleep? In the bed. This time there was no halting the heat building up inside her, blooming from her chest up her neck and over her face once again. Her eyes widened. Mackay, you're not saying that I have to. He waved a hand in the air. No, Alice. Please don't misunderstand. You need a place to stay. I'm hardly ever here. You can sleep on the bed. I'll make myself up a pallet in front of the fireplace. He tried to soothe her. You don't have to worry. I'm not going to compromise your... But this is... Everyone will think... Her voice faded. She felt shocked to the core. Alice, just about everyone at the manor house in the village, and likely the landowners beyond on Duncan lands, are aware that you are a guest of the laird. Everyone knows me. I am an honourable man, and... I'm not questioning your honour, Mackay. It's only that... You can't go back to the woods. No one should have to live in the woods. And until people around here get to know you a little better, we really can't expect any of the villagers to take you in now can we? Her heart sank. No but... You need a roof over your head. I have a roof. As I said, I'm hardly ever here. Besides, I'm not so horrible that you can't spend an hour or two of your day with me, am I? She felt the heat of a flush. No, not at all, you're very nice, but... She clamped her mouth shut before she said something she shouldn't. It'll be all right, he said. You'll have your privacy. And if you insist on it, I can make a pallet out in the shed with Bruce. Bruce? Who's Bruce? She asked, her heart thumping even harder. My horse. He grinned. She shook her head. This was McKay's house. If anyone was going to sleep in the shed, it should be her. She said so. I can make a pallet in the shed. I don't want to take you out of your own house. Let's take this one day at a time, all right, he suggested. Give it a chance. There's nothing wrong with a man and a woman sharing a roof. It's not like we're... He broke off and awkwardly cleared his throat, and then gestured over his shoulder. I have to go. Make yourself comfortable. If you wouldn't mind, perhaps you can prepare some food for supper. With that he retreated and closed the door softly behind him. She stared at it, only vaguely hearing the wooden latch drop in place over the buzzing in her ears. What was she supposed to think? Everything he said was true. She couldn't go back and live in the woods. She didn't belong there. She didn't belong in the village, either. And she certainly didn't belong in McKay's house. She stood frozen for several minutes, looking around. It was a comfortable-looking house, but the words kept coming back, tormenting her. You don't belong here. You don't belong here. You don't belong anywhere. Chapter 11 Mackay walked away from his house, shaking his head. He didn't like this. He didn't like it one bit. For one, Philip didn't know that he was attracted to Alice. For two, 
How was he going to handle sleeping less than 12 feet away from her and not be tempted? 3. He didn't like the deceit. The look that had appeared in Alice's eyes when he mentioned why it was best that she stay at his house, under his roof, had tugged at his heart. She was all alone in the world, lost even to herself. From her perspective, it might very well seem that no one wanted her, that no one wanted to be burdened with her. He tried to put himself in her position. If she didn't remember who she was or what she could do, how could she be a productive member of any community? Did she remember how to cook? He could have kicked himself over that one. Of course she did. She'd been intelligent enough to set up rabbit snares in the woods, gut and skin them, and cook them over a fire. She was obviously resourceful. But was she a spy? He couldn't believe that. Not because he was naive, but what would she have to gain? In the few days since she had been at the manor house on Duncan lands, she hadn't slipped up once. Not once. Her expressive eyes, the way she blushed, those were signs of innocence of true emotion. He hadn't once gotten the impression that she was being deceitful. She seemed frustrated by her inability to remember who she was or where she came from. He understood Philip wanting him to keep an eye on her, but he already felt guilty. He wasn't sure how all of this was going to work out, but he resolved that he wouldn't jump to conclusions. He would do his best to give her as much privacy and space as possible, while still doing what Philip asked of him. After all, it was the least he could do, especially after he had so miserably failed Sarah and Heather. It wouldn't happen again, and if he had to treat Alice this way, he would. He didn't have to like it. But he would do it. Is she all right? Mackay paused beside Sarah, giving her a sideways glance. Of course she's all right, Sarah. What do you think? I've got her chained to my wall. Sarah chuckled softly. Why so defensive, Mackay? It was a simple question. How is she doing? She seems to be all right. She doesn't talk much. She hasn't regained any more memory. Sarah paused again along the pathway to the village, crouched down, and plucked a single purple wildflower from the side of the cart path. Mackay shook his head. Realizing she couldn't see, he spoke up. Not that she's told me. I haven't seen her outside of your house. It was just a comment, but to Mackay it sounded like an accusation. He stopped walking, hands on his hips. It was bad enough if he'd spent the last two days enduring the silence of his new companion. He didn't have any other way to put it. But to have Sarah even vaguely hinting that he was not a good host injured his feelings. He lifted his chin. I promise you, the lass is free to come and go as she pleases. If she pleases not to, what do you expect me to do about it? Sarah turned to him with a frown. Is that a hint of defensiveness I hear in your tone? He stared at her. What do you want me to do? It's not as though I... It's not as though I have any intentions toward her. Sarah's eyebrow lifted and a slight smile curved her lips. He frowned. I don't. But you like her, don't you? Sarah continued to walk, her steps slow and measured. If Sarah could see it, could others? Then again, Sarah was uniquely intuitive. He supposed that came naturally to her, because she was a healer and often had to treat people who couldn't fully express where they hurt or how. Yes. He shrugged. Why wouldn't I? She laughed again, not looking at him. Why wouldn't you indeed? He scowled. What's that supposed to mean? It means that I can see the way you look at her, Mackay. Why don't you just admit it? Why is it a problem? If you like her, tell her so. It's not that simple, he mumbled. Apparently, Philip had not told Sarah of his ulterior motives when he suggested that Mackay take Alice under his roof, and he certainly wasn't going to be the one to tell her. Relationships are never simple, she commented. There's no relationship, Sarah turned to him, her expression serious. She smiled at him then, her hand gentle as she placed it on his arm. Mackay. I'm not teasing you. I'm serious. Over the past year, 
I've learned that sometimes things happen over which we have no control. Death can come at a moment's notice. She glanced down at her growing belly. So too can life. She looked at him. Don't spend too much time overthinking things. If you like her, you like her. You don't have to apologize to anyone over that. Life is too short to waste a moment on worrying about what other people might think. While he appreciated her words, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that at all. He raised a brow as he replied. How can I get to know her better, when even she doesn't know who she is? She glanced at him. But who is she now? I don't understand. Her name might not be Alice. She doesn't come from here, that much is obvious. But the woman living under your roof right now, she is Alice. She's smart and she must be brave. She survived in the woods for who knows how long. She paused, peering into the distance. She didn't hesitate to help me or Heather when Siana attacked us. She turned to look at Mackay. Don't those actions portray someone of good character? They did. But what if he was wrong? What if Philip was right and she was a spy? What have you got to lose, Mackay? What's the worst that could happen? She rebuffs your interest in her. She shook her head. No one's saying that you have to marry the girl, but would it really hurt to get to know her better? To reassure her that she's not all alone in the world. Her memory might never come back. She nodded in agreement. You're right. It might not. And if she has to start over, what better place than here, on Duncan Lands? She smiled and then continued along the path. Mackay sighed heavily. Everything Sarah said was true. But how would she think about things, what would she think about him if she knew the entire truth? That evening, Mackay sat on one of the stools at the table while Alice sat on the other. He dipped his spoon into the bowl of vegetable and rabbit stew she had prepared. A heavy, awkward silence reigned between them. Still, he tried to stay away from the house as much as possible while still keeping an eye on it, just in case she decided to dart into the woods. To what? Meet with a secret admirer? Someone who she could report to? He shook his head. This was foolishness. She wasn't a spy. If she was, she was very, very good. As far as he knew, she hadn't left the house more than a few minutes at a time, and that was to take care of personal needs. He had followed her the first time as she walked behind his small house down the slope to the stream. The moment she started to disrobe, he had forced himself to turn around and walk away. Not once had she complained. Not about bathing in the cold stream, not about her circumstances and not about sharing their cramped quarters. She was a good cook. She may do with the supplies he had stored in the small cubby behind the house. Quite creative, really. The past two evenings after supper, she quietly scraped the remains of their supper into a small bucket and then took it outside to dump it. As the house grew dark, the glow of the firelight lighting the interior, she retreated to his pallet, still dressed in her boy's clothes, turning her back to him and apparently falling asleep. He, on the other hand, was awake for hours, lying on his back on the blanket he had placed in front of the hearth, head resting on his arms, crossed behind his head. How long was this going to continue? This stilted silence between them. He glanced up at her, surprised to find her watching him. His heart skipped a beat. In the dimming light of day her eyes looked so big, her features so soft. She wore a troubled expression. What's wrong? he finally asked. She said nothing for several moments. Well, I was thinking. I. She sighed and placed her spoon on the table. I'm restless, Mackay. There's only so much I can do around here, she continued, gesturing around the interior of his small house. He considered her words as a slight frown tugged at his brow. I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. I need to stay busy, Mackay. I can't just sit in this house, staring at the walls for hours on end. He shrugged, moving his bowl aside. You're not a prisoner. You can come and go as you please. I know that, she said. That's not what I mean. 
She seemed to search for the right words and glanced hesitantly at him. I need to do something to repay you. Repay me? For what? For letting me stay here. She shook her head, staring glumly at the fireplace. Until I remember who I am and where I belong. After several seconds, she lifted her chin and shrugged. Until then, I need to be more productive. He nodded. All right. What do you want to do? I was thinking of starting a small garden here by the house. She paused and then pushed on. Of course, I'm more than willing to help with the village garden as well, but it would be nice to have a small garden here, wouldn't it? While he didn't exactly see the point, he understood that she needed something to do. I think you used to be quite active before, he mused. Now it's my turn to not understand what you're trying to say, she said. I have a feeling that you're not like most women, Alice, and don't take that the wrong way. What I mean to say is that you were living in the woods, and you were taking care of yourself while you were there. You made shelter. You hunted and captured and cooked your own food. Those are not skills that most women know. She gave it some thought and slowly nodded. And I wear boys' clothes. He smiled. That you do. He thought about it. In fact I don't see you spinning cloth or sitting around all day sewing. I think you know how, but I think you probably don't prefer it as much as being outside. Feeling more comfortable, she grinned. I'm strong, and my skin is not as pale as other women. Maybe I have spent a great deal of time outdoors. If you want to start a garden, you can start a garden, he said. There's a shovel in the stable. The ground's pretty hard still, but if you take it slow, it shouldn't take more than a week to turn up the soil. You can fertilize it if necessary, with Bruce's manure. For the first time since he had tackled her on the forest floor, she smiled. It was a beautiful smile, one that created dimples in her cheeks and lifted the worry from her eyes. He stared, amazed that such a small gesture could give him such pleasure. I'll plant carrots and radishes, perhaps some squash and potatoes. Maybe even some herbs. Her voice seemed softer, invigorated. He shrugged, captivated by the change that had come over her. Plant whatever you'd like. He watched her for several moments, and could almost imagine her planning how she would go about it. Then she looked at him. Their eyes met. At that moment, he felt the overwhelming urge to kiss her. She was a lovely young woman. What would she do if he... Thank you, Mackay, she said. She rose from the table, moved as if to reach for his bowl. Instead, she leaned toward him, placed her hands on his shoulders and gave him a hug. It only lasted a second or two, but it was enough to get his pulse racing. He stiffened, and she quickly released him and then reached for his bowl, mumbling an apology. She had misunderstood. Alice. He reached for her hand and clasped it gently in his own. I don't want you to feel like a prisoner here. You're not a prisoner, and you don't need to do anything to earn your place in my household, though I appreciate anything you accomplish. A thought came to him, bringing with it a smile. I have an idea. Tomorrow, after Sarah and Heather have finished their visits in the village, how about you and I do some fishing? She paused, gazing down at him, head tilted slightly as if pondering. Fishing. Another small smile curved her lips. I think I like fishing. Then we will do it. He nodded. He felt suddenly uncomfortable, released her hand, and stood, rubbing his hands awkwardly along his thighs. I have to go brush down Bruce. With that he abruptly left the house, closing the door softly behind them. As he walked to the small stable, he heard Bruce shuffling around inside. He grinned as he entered. Now how smart am I? he asked his horse, his thoughts preoccupied with the feel of Alice's hands on his shoulders, the smell of her hair as she leaned in close to hug him. Bruce snorted and shook his head, his long black mane dancing in the air. He laughed. He didn't even doubt that Alice would enjoy herself. It was a perfect opportunity for him to spend more time with her, but away from the cramped quarters of the house, which seemed to make both of them uncomfortable. Maybe, Sitting along the banks of the river about a mile from the manor house to the east, he would have a good chance to get to know her better. 
Perhaps being out in the wilds, fishing would help trigger some memories on her part. And if not, perhaps it would be a good opportunity for him to decide once and for all whether her memory loss was genuine. He believed it was, but he couldn't ignore Philip's caution nor blame him for it. Chapter 12 Several days had passed since Mackay first mentioned their going fishing, but nothing had come of it. He appeared to be spending quite a bit of time with Sarah and Heather. Alice tried to cull her disappointment. She knew he was busy, responsible for the safety of not only the Laird's household, but the entire village and outlying properties. His duties were shared by his friend Hugh, who often joined him when venturing away from the manor house. Instead of sulking, she'd kept busy with small chores around his home, helping out in any way she could. Trying to feel useful somehow. She mucked Bruce's stall, organized the storage space behind the house, and strung a line between two nearby trees to air out the bedding. She weeded around the base of the house and cooked. Still when outside she sought him out. She tried not to but couldn't help it. She refused to contemplate what that meant. On several occasions, she'd spied him watching her from a distance. Just today she had looked for him, and not once but twice found him watching her as well, the first time from the doorway of the manor house, and another time from the meadow where the soldiers trained. He'd been talking to the laird both times. It made her feel nice and wanted, and if not wanted, at least watched over. That realization compelled her, as did just about everything else, to wonder what kind of life she'd led before she was found in the forest. Was she neglected or loved? Was she an orphan, or did she come from a large family? As the days passed, she found herself growing more comfortable around Mackay. At ease with his presence when he was around. He treated her, like a brother would treat a sister. Well, a little more solicitous perhaps, but she no longer felt awkward or uncomfortable living under the same roof with him. Most of the time. She realized she had grown quite fond of him, though she tried not to. He was very nice, had a wonderful sense of humor, and was even-tempered. She constantly reminded herself that she didn't belong here. That somewhere out there she had kin, and she needed to find them. But for now she was content to stay. Over the past few days after Mackay had idly mentioned that they go fishing, she had felt better, not quite so. It wasn't that she was bored, but she didn't like being idle. That triggered yet more suppositions as to who she was. She was someone who liked to be active. She sensed that. Obviously, someone who enjoyed being outdoors. So she gradually deduced that she wasn't a typical female, at least not one content with filling her day with womanly chores. She mentioned as such to Mackay, after he arrived home one evening. She had prepared a supper of vegetable soup, and warmed a loaf of bread one of the women from the manor house had brought over earlier that afternoon. Good bread, he mumbled around a mouthful nodding. She agreed. Yes it is but I didn't make it. I don't know how. She frowned, trying to remember. I don't think I've ever made a loaf of bread. He swallowed, trying not to laugh. Every woman knows how to make bread. What makes you think that? She shrugged. I don't know, it's just a feeling. She wasn't sure whether she wanted to say more, but he glanced up at her and offered an encouraging nod. What's on your mind? She might just as well say it. Since we spoke about it last, I have stronger feelings about it. I definitely don't think I'm like other women. His hand stilled the spoon halfway to his mouth. What do you mean? She waved a hand toward the manor house. Oh woman things like baking sewing, girl things. He grinned. Like we talked about Alice, it doesn't matter. You know how to survive. Do you think that's a bad thing? Do you think that's why I was out in that forest all by myself? How so? Maybe I'm just so different that nobody wanted me. She frowned. Did I disappoint my parents? What if I had a husband? and he wasn't happy with the sort of person I was. Mackay offered a slight shrug. Not everyone's the same. That's what makes all of us special. If we were all the same, I would think that life would be rather tedious. She hadn't expected that kind response. 
He didn't care that she didn't like to do women things, that maybe she was not like other women. You're special, Mackay, eh? she said, and then immediately regretted the words that had left her mouth. His eyes widened, and he sat up straighter in his chair, staring at her. She rushed to explain. What I mean is, most men don't want their women to know how to take care of themselves, do they? He offered a small laugh and shook his head. That's more the norm around here than one would think. He left his spoon in his bowl. Why look at Sarah. She's a feisty one. She can run circles around Philip and he's none the wiser. He placed a remnant of the bread back down on the table. And Heather. Did you know that she prefers to wear boys clothes like you, and that not so long ago she used to go sneaking off into the woods to learn how to use weapons? She did. Alice asked dismayed. She did. She's a fighter that one. He shook his head. She saved Jake's life from an attack by Sienna and that scoundrel Clyde McGregor. You know Alice, women shouldn't be expected to act the same any more than women should expect all men to act the same. She nodded and dipped her spoon into her soup, contemplating his words. I know I mentioned us going fishing, and we haven't done it yet, he said. I'm sorry for that. I've been busy doing things for the laird. But tomorrow, I am free. He pushed his chair back from the table. So do you want to go fishing with me tomorrow, or do you have women's chores to do? She gaped at him, but it took only a few seconds for her to realize he teased her. She nodded, grinning back at him. Of course, he said. I'll look forward to it. It was the truth. Alice sat on a rock by the side of the river holding a fishing pole, a smile lifting the corners of her mouth. Just being here invigorated her soul. The river was moderately sized but didn't run too swiftly here, looping around the base of a low-lying hill. It was too far to skip a stone across, but not so far that she couldn't swim it if she had to. Another odd thought came to her. How did she know she could swim? It was a perfect morning, the sun had just breached the horizon. A few clouds billowed high into the sky from the west. A slight breeze tugged at her hair, plaited into one long braid that settled on her back, though wisps of hair around her forehead stubbornly broke loose. This was so very relaxing, and she turned to Make, prepared to thank him again for such a wonderful idea. Women didn't usually go fishing, but he seemed prepared to indulge her love of the outdoors, and she appreciated that. They had brought with them two long sticks, a roll of heavy thread, and a small supply of bread and cheese that he'd managed to coax from the cook. For the first time since she had arrived, she didn't feel like she was someone's burden. Mackay told her that he had arranged for Hugh to take over guarding Sarah and Heather for the day. Why? she asked. Why what? Why do Sarah and Heather need to be guarded? He hesitated. There's a rumor that an enemy clan is planning some sort of revenge against Jake and the Laird, and then we also heard that their stepfather might be looking for them, and so the Laird wanted me to. Why would their stepfather be looking for them, she asked, confused. She saw his expression. He looked uncomfortable. She was being intrusive. Never mind. But it's all right if you go fishing. He nodded. He knows I'm taking you fishing. She wondered what the laird thought about that, but then decided that he had much more important things to worry about. They had walked the mile or so to this location from his small house. When they arrived, he had handed her one of the sticks and a long length of string that he cut with his knife. She immediately knew what to do. While he tied a small chunk of cheese to the end of his string, she crouched down by the water and began to dig up the dirt, looking for worms. Mackay seemed surprised, but then simply shrugged and grinned as he prepared his own pole. You've been fishing before? He didn't state it as a question, and she merely shrugged. She obviously had. Let's see how well I do. He nodded, and then ready to fish he strolled along the bank, looking for a good spot. They spent several pleasant hours along the banks of the river. By mid-morning, they had managed to catch nearly a dozen good-sized fish. They had competed with each other, of sorts, an unspoken contest after Alice caught the first one. They'd shared some conversation, a few laughs, and she'd learned a little bit more about Mackay Douglas. 
She wondered if her growing attraction to him was merely because he had been so nice to her or due to the fact that she had already noticed several admirable traits about him. Regardless, the idea brought her no little consternation. What was she thinking? They may be sharing the same roof, but as far as he was concerned, that's as far as it would go, or at least that's the impression she felt from him. The way he looked at her sometimes, he almost seemed guilty, though she couldn't imagine why. I guess we'd better be getting back, he said, looking up at the sun. Too late now to catch any more. We'll keep a couple of these fish for ourselves, and give the rest to the cook for the house. Is that all right with you? Of course, he said. She felt good. She felt like even in this small way, she was contributing to her own sustenance, her keep, so to speak. In some small way with these fish, she was supporting the laird and his family. Until now, she had been the recipient of the generosity of the Duncans and of course Mackay. Any small way that she could return the favor was a boon not only to her self-esteem, but her pride. They gathered their fishing poles and strings of fish, six on Mackay's and five on hers. They walked slowly back toward the manor house, their pace casual, not in any great hurry. She glanced askance at him several times, but he appeared deep in thought, his gaze continually sweeping the countryside. As they approached the main house, Alice eyed the activity. A few warriors and younger boys in the meadow beside the pond practiced with wooden swords and shields. Several more clansmen with weapons were roaming about. Was their increased presence due to the rumors of the enemy clan? A young woman knelt by the pond, washing vegetables. She didn't see much activity around the house itself. In fact, it looked rather deserted. Where is everyone? He glanced toward the house and offered one of his shrugs. Sarah and Heather might be helping to birth a baby in the village. I'd heard one of the women was close. I think Jake is patrolling somewhere. I don't know where the laird is. He headed for the far side of the house, where a door offered ventilation as well as easy exit from the kitchen. Give me your string of fish. I'll take them to the cook. I'll meet you at home in just a few minutes. She handed Mackay her string of fish, avoiding his gaze, contemplating his words. Home. He'd said it so casually, as if they were a couple. Meet you at home. It sounded nice, but again she forced herself to remember that she didn't live here. At least not permanently. She belonged somewhere, but until she found out where, she couldn't allow herself to get too comfortable. Mackay disappeared inside the house and she strolled around the corner back toward the front, seeking the shade of the large tree that stood between the house and the armory. She leaned against it, watching the men in the meadow practice fighting. She thought about what Mackay told her about Heather, that she liked to wear boys' clothing, but was even more impressed that she had learned how to use weapons. The Duncan clan seemed to be tolerant, accepting of people's differences. She heard voices from a window on the side of the house, not fifteen feet away from where she leaned against the tree, looking up at the leaves, enjoying the cool breeze on her warm skin after hours of sitting along the riverbank. Anything new? That was the laird's voice. She recognized his deep rumbling tone. To her surprise, she heard Mackay's voice respond. No, she hasn't regained her memory, at least none that she has shared with me. Have you noticed anything different about her character? Anything suspicious? Anything to give an indication of whether she's telling the truth or not? Alice froze stunned. Were they talking about her? They had to be. No one else had lost her memory, as far as Alice knew. I don't think she's pretending, Philip. Her confusion seems genuine. A short laugh. She does know how to fish though, caught nearly as many as I did. I have a feeling that the lass is quite comfortable being outdoors. Her survival skills and the fact that she can hunt and fish speak of years of experience. She hasn't asked you any questions about us, the clan, or more importantly, about Sarah or Heather. Nothing more than idle curiosity, Mackay replied. But she's not probing for information, nothing that could be used against us. Continue to keep her close and watch her carefully. I want to know if she mentions anything. If you can, and casually, 
Bring up Sarah and Heather's stepfather, Patrick. Alice sagged against the tree. Mackay had mentioned Sarah and Heather's stepfather, but not his name. Patrick. It didn't trigger any memories. The laird continued to speak. I need to know if she's at all involved in these rumours. I need to know if she has any memory or knowledge of Patrick, where he is, or how he's planning to take Sarah or Heather from us. And the McGregors or the Orkneys. Are they involved? And I want to know if she knew Siana. If they were planning any of this together. They. Philip this is all doubtful. How would Alice? How could she be involved in any of this? To what end? Why send a woman? Why not? It wouldn't cause nearly as much suspicion to have a woman spying on us than a man, and to be found in the woods like that? The lad paused. I simply don't know, and until I do, I'd rather be overly cautious. We're talking about Sarah's and Heather's safety, not to mention the rest of us if the McGregors are involved. I understand Philip but still. Let me know if anything changes. Warm tears flooded her eyes. Could it be true? Mackay was not a friend, not a true friend. He had been charged with guarding her. The laird suspected she was a spy, Mackay, he'd been assigned to watch her. Shocked and hurt, she moved away from the tree and quickly walked around the side of the house and deeper into the shadows of the trees behind it. They thought she was a spy. That was why she was living in Mackay's house. At the laird's suggestion. Her heart pounded and her stomach felt tight with knots. All of it was a lie. Is that why he was being so nice to her? He was pretending. Trying to trap her, to trick her. A tear rolled down her cheek. She lifted her hand to brush it away, with a grunt of frustration. Startled by the pain that stabbed at her heart, she headed even deeper into the forest, trying to quell the emotions rising in her chest. First came the hurt and the pain, and then an overwhelming sense of disappointment. She walked faster, slapping at branches in her way. How could he possibly think? A spy? Her emotions betraying her, she broke into a trot, choking back her tears, trying to relieve the pain bubbling upward in her chest. She felt so alone. Completely and utterly alone. For the first time since she had awakened in the Duncan house without her memory, without anything to grasp onto, she felt alone, abandoned and unwanted. She had been on Duncan lands for nearly two weeks based on her reckoning. So far no one had come to claim her. No one looking for her in the nearby village or outlying properties. She couldn't go back to McKay's house, not now. Would not live a moment longer under McKay's roof, his gesture of hospitality nothing more than a means to an end. She began to run, anger now burgeoning where pain and disappointment had dwelt only moments before. She would not stay where she wasn't truly wanted. She ran faster. To think that Mackay had been pretending to be her friend all this time. She ran, ignoring the pain in her feet from the stones she stepped on with her soft-soled boots. She darted her way among the thick-growing trees, slapping at the shrubs, not caring which particular direction she ran. She had survived in the forest before. She could do it again. Chapter 13 Mackay exited the manor house through the kitchen door, carrying the last two fish on a string, whistling softly under his breath. By the time he stepped over the threshold, he knew why he felt so satisfied. He had truly enjoyed spending time with Alice. He knew that she still had a lot of things to make sense of, and he certainly wasn't pushing for a closer relationship, but he couldn't deny the fact that he liked her. He liked her a lot. Even in spite of Philip's doubts, which he could understand due to his worrying about Heather and Sarah, he was coming around to her side in the affair. He didn't think she was at all pretending her memory loss, or that if she was, she could fool him. While he didn't want to believe that she could be a spy, it was possible. Unlikely, but possible. Still, she was quite different from any woman he had met before, even Heather. He had thought Heather was an odd lass at first, wanting to wear boys' clothes, learning how to fight and use weapons of war, but as he had gotten to know her better and grown accustomed to that aspect of her character, 
he admired her for her spirit. Obviously, Heather was not the only one, and in Alice perhaps Heather had a kindred soul. At the river, he had not had to show Alice how to fish. Her skill had seemed instinctual. He was sure that like Heather, Alice was unique in spirit, and one who didn't much care for others' opinion of her. She was who she was, with no apologies made. Mackay found that refreshing, and understood now more than ever what had attracted Jake to Heather, and eventually compelled him to marry her. Life would never be boring for Jake and Heather, Mackay was certain of it. Did he want that for himself? He scowled at the thought. They didn't know who Alice was. Alice was not even her real name. He should not be thinking such foolish thoughts. He glanced around the yard, looking for her, but didn't see her anywhere. Maybe she had gone back to their small house. He ventured past the armory toward the house, but didn't see any sign of her there either. Nevertheless, he entered, thinking that he would certainly find her inside, perhaps waiting for him to bring the fish. She wasn't. Frowning, he exited his house, placing the fish down on the bench under the window. Alice? His call produced no answer. He frowned as he stepped into the small stable, but didn't see her in there either. Where is she, Bruce? His horse responded with a shake of his head, his mane dancing as he impatiently stomped a hoof. He'd been cooped up inside the stable all day. As soon as he found Alice, he would take Bruce for a short ride while Alice prepared supper. He ventured back around the armory, looking everywhere for her. Had she gone inside the manor while he was speaking with Philip? He walked toward the side entrance to the house and entered through the open door into the kitchen area. The cook looked up, a harried expression on her face. She held on to a headless fish, cleaver poised as she prepared to chop off its tail. Beside the fish head, he saw a small pile of chopped vegetables on the large wooden table in the middle of the room. Cook, have you seen Alice? She gestured with her chin. I saw her running into the woods like something was chasing her. Mackay frowned, confused by the comment. Nothing untoward had happened for the few minutes that he was inside the house talking to Philip. Running? Did something happen? Cook shrugged and slashed the cleaver down, neatly slicing the fish into two pieces. No, it's been quiet around here. Mackay nodded and retraced his steps to the side yard, once again scanning the property at the front of the manor, looking for Alice along the edges of the pond, the meadow where a couple of young lads practiced with wooden swords with their mentor clansmen, and then back again. Where was she? He turned toward the narrow footpath that traced along the side of the house between the natural grasses and the tree line. Maybe she'd seen something. He stepped into the tree line and ventured a few steps into woods, peering through the trees looking for any sign of her. Nothing. Alice? He spoke softly at first and then raised his voice calling again. Alice? Where are you? Nothing. He continued to scan through the trees and shrubs. Not sure what to think he shook his head and returned to the corner of the house where he paused for several moments, scanning the yard, the area around the pond and meadow beyond, and even farther beyond that, and still saw no sign of her. His gaze strayed toward the large tree between the corner of the manor house and the armory. Maybe she had taken shelter under the tree to get out of the warm early afternoon sun. He wandered toward the tree, not especially alarmed but confused. She would have heard him calling her if she was sitting there. Why didn't she answer? She wasn't there. Looking down at the dirt at the base of the tree, he saw small, fresh and undisturbed footprints. So, she had been here while he was inside the manor house. He turned to thoughtfully stare at the house and his heart sank. The tree was not far from the window that opened into Philip's workspace, the room where he and Philip had been discussing Alice just minutes ago. Had she heard them talking? Was it possible? Philip, he said, maintaining an even tone of voice, not whispering but not overly loud either. Moments later, Philip poked his head through the open window, glanced around to see who had spoken his name, and seeing Mackay, frowned. What is it, Mackay? Mackay was sure of it. We have a problem. Mackay, I'm busy. What are you talking about? Alice? 
Philip's frown deepened. What about her? She's gone. Mackay felt startled by the feeling that swept through him. She was gone. Gone. The word evoked such a sense of finality. Remarkably, they had a huge influence on his emotions as well. Sadness regret coupled with guilt. What do you mean, she's gone? You two just came back from fishing. Mackay stepped toward the window as Philip eyed him. I think she heard us talking. He gestured with his thumb over his shoulder. She was standing under that tree. It didn't take Philip long to realize the implications of Mackay's announcement. He muttered under his breath. So go find her. Cook told me that she ran into the woods on the other side of the house. I didn't see her. So go find her, Philip repeated more firmly. If she is a spy, we can't let her make contact with whoever is waiting for her, can we? Waiting for her? How could someone be waiting for her? If she had no memory, she wouldn't know that someone waited for her, if she was truly without memory. If she was a spy. Mackay nodded and turned, quickly making his way back to his stable. In a matter of minutes, he had Bruce saddled. He mounted, and urged his gelding into the woods behind the manor house. He found one track that might belong to Alice near where the small footpath entered the woods, but beyond that he saw nothing, at least not at first. Leading Bruce at a walk, studying the ground, the trees and the shrubs around him, he noticed some crushed dwarf willow, and then a short distance beyond that a broken branch from a witch fern sapling. Once he had a general sense of her direction, he continued his search, but the farther he proceeded into the woods the fewer traces he found. She was in her element, doubt crept into his thoughts. Alice had purposely taken steps to avoid leaving tracks. Only once after the initial indication of her tracks did he find half a footprint heading west. It was obvious that she knew how to take advantage of the landscape to try to hide her footprints, stepping on stones, branches lying on the ground, or even fallen leaves and pine needles to make her way deeper into the woods. At the same time, he knew that taking such measures would slow her down. She didn't have that much of a head start. Still, he and Bruce tried to follow her general direction for nearly an hour before he pulled his horse to a halt, sighing with frustration. Blast it all. Where had the last disappeared to? He leaned his head back, closed his eyes and then opened them, looking up into the branches of a pine tree. With narrowed eyes he searched the branches. Had she climbed up? Was that why he could not find her trail nor many tracks? Had she assumed that anyone who followed would not expect her to do so? He muttered a curse and his horse flicked his ears back at the sound. Do you think she's gone into the trees, Bruce? He retraced his path, constantly looking up into the trees to see if he could spot Alice hiding in any of them. With any other woman, he wouldn't even have considered such a thing, but with Alice. Obviously comfortable in the woods, and with enough skills to survive, he wouldn't put it past her. She was canny, that one. She may not remember her name or who she was or to whom she belonged, but she knew how to survive. Eventually, he retraced his path back to the manor house. His concern grew. Had he completely misjudged her? Was Philip right? Was Alice a spy? He didn't want to believe it, didn't want to believe that he would have fallen for such a ploy. But if he had, he wasn't the only one. And if she wasn't, why had she run off like that? Why not just confront him? Defend herself? Then again, maybe even she didn't know the truth of the matter. If her memory loss was genuine, maybe she didn't know she was a spy. He shook his head and muttered, you're talking in circles. By the time Mackay returned to the manor house, Philip stood in front talking with Jake, Sarah and Heather. The moment he emerged from the woods, heading back toward his house to stable Bruce, Heather rushed forward and grabbed the bridle. You didn't find her? Mackay shook his head. Heather frowned and turned to scowl at Philip, obviously not particularly caring that he was the lead. How could you accuse her of such a thing? A spy? To what purpose? Mackay watched Philip and Jake exchange a glance. Philip, you know something. What is it? 
The question came from Sarah, one hand resting on her belly, the other on her husband's arm. Once again, Philip glanced at Jake. Mackay waited for him to answer. Sarah, Heather, there's something? I was waiting for something more solid to go on, but... Heather turned on him, hands on her hips. What is it? She moved toward her sister. Mackay dismounted and joined them. It was obvious by the way he hesitated that Philip didn't want to mention it, but Jake gave him an encouraging nod. Two things. First, we've heard rumours that the McGregors may be seeking revenge against the clan for the incident with Jake and Heather earlier this year. And what's that to do with Alice? Sarah asked. Philip didn't reply to that question. We also have reason to believe that your stepfather is heading this way. A gasp erupted from Sarah's throat as wide-eyed she stared at her sister before turning back to her husband. Our stepfather. He found out where we were. How? And why would he be coming here? Mackay was startled at the transformation of the sisters' expressions. They both paled, faces drained of color, both glancing at each other with uncertainty before turning toward their respective husbands. Mackay felt anger surge inside him. Just the mention of their stepfather could invoke such visceral reactions. He must be an evil man indeed. Wait, Heather said. You think Alice has something to do with it? She frowned, shaking her head. But how? She can't even remember who she is, let alone. Sarah looked up at her husband. You have suspicions that she's a spy for him. It wasn't a question, but a statement. Philip offered a quick nod. That's preposterous. Heather exclaimed. How can you be so sure? Heather stared at Philip a moment, then turned to Mackay. Mackay, you've been living with her. Has she given any indication that she's pretending her memory loss? Has her story changed at all? Has she remembered something that provokes such suspicions? He glanced at Philip and then shook his head. No, but... Heather looked from Jake to Philip. And these rumors about the McGregors? You think she honestly has anything to do with that? To what purpose? If the McGregors want revenge, they certainly don't need a spy to do so. Why would they? They know where we live. What could she possibly tell them that they don't already know? Philip gestured. Enough. I didn't say that Alice was a spy. It was a mere possibility, especially in light of these two separate yet very concerning rumors. Rumors, Heather scoffed despite Jake's efforts to calm her. And we all know that half the time rumors prove to be unfounded, based on nothing more than gossip. And what if these rumors are founded in fact? Philip said quietly. What if the rumor about your stepfather is true? What information do you have so far? The question came from Sarah, now reaching for her sister's hand. Mackay noted her fierce, protective expression, emphasizing her determination to not only protect her sister, but herself and her baby from her drunkard stepfather. It was also obvious that Philip didn't want to reply, but her steady stare finally provoked an answer. I have information, and I'm not going to tell you from where, that Patrick MacDonald is bringing the law with him to officially charge me and my brother with kidnapping and... Kidnapping. Sarah gasped. Mackay was aware that Philip knew very well that the charge could stick. Philip had kidnapped Sarah, but when he returned to the coast to fetch Heather, she had come willingly, anxious to be away from Patrick and his abuse. He saw the tears welling in Sarah's eyes and the alarmed glance she gave her sister. I will deny it, Philip, she said, stomping her foot against the ground. Heather also nodded. I will deny that you kidnapped me, and that when you found me and you told me why you needed my skills, I went willingly. Me too, Heather said. Philip gave her an affectionate smile. If I have anything to say about it, you will not lay eyes on your stepfather. He glanced at Jake. I do have a feeling that in some way, Siana was behind this, but I don't know if or how Alice could be involved. Heather once again began to protest. Philip raised his hand. Heather, Alice very well could have been involved, if not purposely, then inadvertently. 
she may have information. Information that we need. But she doesn't remember anything. Heather protested. Philip continued. We all know how deceitful Siana was. Even if Alice's lack of memory is genuine, it doesn't mean that she wasn't in some way involved in either of these situations. He shook his head. Her presence in the woods alone not far from our lands is something we can't ignore. Heather lifted her chin and crossed her arms over her chest. And if she wasn't? If she's completely innocent of your suspicions? Philip didn't respond but looked to Mackay. We need to find her. And the sooner the better. Chapter 14 Alice had run quite a distance, choking back her tears, refusing to cry like a baby as she headed deeper and deeper into the woods, darting among trees, watching where she placed her feet with care despite her quick pace. It seemed second nature to do so. Once again, she wondered about her background. Why did she know these things? Maybe she hadn't lived in the woods for a short time. Maybe she had lived in the woods for years. Who knew? The midday sun was warm on her skin. She felt so lost, not physically but emotionally. Alone once again. She had grown comfortable in the company of Sarah and Heather Duncan, and even more so living with Mackay in his small house. Yet all those pleasant memories had been dashed, stomped upon, when she had learned of Mackay's true motive. The laird had put him up to it, encouraged him to live with her, to get close to her, and why? The thought that she could be a spy seemed ludicrous. If she were to spy on the Duncan clan, what had she been doing living in the woods? What had caused those original injuries that Sarah had told her about? Who had beaten her and left her in the woods? She had believed McKay's supposed friendship, his camaraderie. The fact that she allowed herself to even start growing fond of him, only to realize it was all nothing more than a ploy. A myriad of emotions raged through her, not the least of which was anger. She felt a deep sense of betrayal, and struggled to deal with the emotional turmoil that the truth had elicited. Disappointment, sadness and a great sense of loss. She had resolved herself to the idea that she might never regain her memory, never truly realize where she came from or where she belonged. With the amount of time that had passed with no word or rumors of anyone looking for her, she had accepted the fact that likely no one was. She had felt so fortunate that people like the Duncans had taken her in, provided care of her, and given her a roof overhead and food to fill her belly. Now? She felt like a fool. They had all fooled her. Did everyone know about the Laird's suspicions? Did Heather and Sarah know that Philip had instructed Mackay to watch her, to keep her under his eye? Did they also believe she was a spy? Had their pretense of friendship been nothing more than a lie as well? Had everyone lied to her? Finally, exhausted, she found a place to sit and think, about midway up a tree and rock-studded slope, amid a collection of boulders that jutted upward from a cluster of gnarled and ancient pine. Their aroma filled the air around her, providing her with a sense of familiarity and comfort as she contemplated her next course of action. What could she do? Where could she go? She muttered under her breath. It was obvious that she knew how to survive in the wild. She knew how to snare rabbits and hunt fish. She didn't need McKay's or the Laird's protection to survive. She didn't need any of them, and certainly not Mackay. She could do just fine on her own. She didn't know how long she sat there, alternating between angry fuming and tears before she heard the distant sound. She wasn't sure how she recognized it, but she knew it was a horse's hoof brushing against a stone. She peered carefully through the trees, pressing her back against the rock behind her, deeper into the shadows, unmoving as she allowed only her eyes to gaze over the landscape below. There, maybe a hundred yards distant, rounding the bottom of the slope and emerging into a small clearing, she saw a rider. While she couldn't discern the features of that rider, she did recognize the horse. It was Bruce McKay's gelding. Her first instinct was to stand and call out to him, but then she forced herself to remain still, anger once again coming to the fore. He didn't want to find her for her safety's sake. He wanted to find her for his and for the Laird's. They couldn't keep an eye on her if they couldn't find her. 
Once again, warm tears filled her eyes and blurred her vision, but she blinked hard several times, didn't dare move to brush them away. She remained still as stone as his horse moved across the small clearing, and disappeared into the woods beyond. She watched the spot for what seemed forever, waiting for him to emerge, but he never did. The fact that he was out looking for her. No, not for her. She had to keep reminding herself of that. He had his own ulterior motives for finding her, and they likely had nothing to do with her personal safety, but more to do with the Laird's suspicion. Slowly she relaxed, and allowed her head to lean against the granite behind her. Forced to herself to contemplate the question. Was she a spy? No. She couldn't, wouldn't believe it. To what end? She bent her knees and hugged them close to her chest. If she didn't move, she wouldn't leave tracks. And when evening came? She had no flint or stone with which to start a fire. No cloak to ward off the evening chill. No knife, no food nor source of water nearby. No matter. She could spend the night here and deal with those things tomorrow. Her confidence in her skills swelled. She could do it. She would. She would disappear back into the woods. This time she would be much more careful. Mackay wouldn't find her a second time. Alice jolted awake, lifting her head from where her chin rested against her chest, all senses alert. Not sure what had woken her she froze, eyes wide. How could she have fallen asleep? She scolded herself and looked to the west. The sun headed toward the horizon. Should she stay here or move to find a better place to spend the night? Searching the landscape sprawled out below, ears attuned to the sounds of the late afternoon, heading toward evening, the crickets off in the distance and even farther the low croak of a frog. Come morning she would explore the source of that frog, because where there were frogs there was a source of water. A gentle breeze ruffled through the trees, nothing unusual, nothing out of place. What had startled her? She smelled smoke. Then heard a voice. A voice so near that she felt the shiver of fear race down her spine. Not McKay's voice. She didn't recognize it. It had a gravelly edge to it, like someone had just experienced a bout of coughing. I told you we're close. Another male answered. When I get my hands on those two, they're gonna be sorry. The voices came from the other side of the cluster of rocks behind her. Two men perhaps more likely sat hunched over a small fire. She on the south side, they on the north. She didn't move, hardly dared to blink, hardly even enough to breathe. It was so quiet she heard the dull crackle of wood. The breeze blew from west to east, which was why she smelled the wood smoke so plainly. She sat downwind, lucky that neither they nor their horses would sense her presence. She remained perfectly still. How long had they been there? It couldn't have been long, or she would have woken before now, wouldn't she? To think she'd not only fallen asleep but slept so heavily that she'd heard neither horse nor man approach, or two men preparing a fire, didn't bode well. She could only blame that on her emotional exhaustion, the tears she had shed, the innate desire to block out unpleasant things in one's life. I'm not convinced this is a good idea. From what I hear, the Duncans are not a clan to be trifled with. I'll be taking back what's mine what they took from me. And you, as a duly official authority, will back me up, is that clear? Patrick, I'm just warning you that my influence only goes so far, especially with these Highlanders. They are a wild bunch, every single one of them. Alice frowned. Patrick. Why did that name seem familiar? I have the law on my side and you know it. I know it. And I have no doubt in my mind that bastard, Philip Duncan knows it too. What if? No ifs about it. The second man grumbled followed by a loud wet belch. I'll be taking back what's mine and that's all there is to it. But if Clyde doesn't follow through with his promise to help, we're going to find ourselves outnumbered, whether the law is on our side or not. Clyde. Again, a hint of recognition. The McGregor's hatred of the Duncan clan runs deep, and has for generations. Clyde won't hesitate to take part in any plan to destroy the Laird or his brother. These Highland clans, it's all they do. Feud and fight. It's been going on for generations. What was this about? 
Who were they talking about? She heard the sound of sloshing. You might want to take it easy on that, Patrick. You need to have a clear head about you come morning. You keep your nose where it belongs, Connor, and mind your own business. It's been a long day, and a little bit o' oh, ale is not going to hurt nothing. Another bit of sloshing, followed by another belch and then a harsh laugh. I can't wait to see the look on Sarah's face when she sees me, he said. Both of them. I can't believe either one of them had the nerve to leave me. Why, their mother is turning over in her grave as we speak. You said they were kidnapped, Patrick. What the hell do you think I meant? Came the belligerent reply. Of course they were kidnapped. But it's been a long while, over a year. Give me one good reason why me own daughters have made no effort to escape and come back to me, where they belong. And then Alice realized. Patrick. Sarah and Heather's stepfather. She remembered Mackay briefly mentioning their history, even before she had inadvertently eavesdropped on Mackay's supposedly private conversation with Philip. Sarah and Heather's stepfather was here to take them back. How could he? He was just a man, accompanied by one other. But she didn't know that for sure. They had mentioned the McGregors. An enemy clan by the sounds of it. What should she do? She felt torn as anger surged within her again. Maybe it would serve them right. If Heather and Sarah had knowledge of what Philip believed her capable of, that she was a spy, she should let them fend for themselves. She didn't want to get mixed up in all of this. Unfortunately, she already was. And yet, and yet she couldn't forget the fact that Sarah and Heather had taken care of her. Regardless of what they believed, they had been kind. Sarah's ministrations of her injuries had been gentle. She was a healer. She had treated her with dignity and compassion. More than once Alice had seen the deep affection she shared for Philip. She had seen the same between Heather and Jake. They were not being kept at Duncan Manor against their will. The thought of either woman being yanked from their home filled her with a sense of sadness. Nobody deserved that. Nobody deserved to be forced to stay where they were not wanted. This only left her feeling more despondent. She fought those feelings back, not sure how to overcome them. She had to stay focused, aware of her environment. If one of those men ventured behind the rocks, she would be discovered. She had to move, although doing so would be risky. Peering around, she studied the placement of several of the larger rocks. Even if she moved very slowly, they might hear her clothing, or maybe even a footfall. But she couldn't linger. Every moment she did increased the risk of discovery. She couldn't wait for them to fall asleep. They might not even make their night's camp here. Maybe they had only stopped to rest. Perhaps they would continue on to Duncan Manor. And what about this Clyde? Were they to meet him here? No, she couldn't linger. Ever so slowly, she shifted her position, placing her hands on the ground on either side of her body, and in slow increments lifted her feet from the ground and brought them closer to her torso. She would stand, and as quickly and quietly as possible, flee down the path she had already chosen. If they did hear or see her, she would be in the woods before they could come after her. She would leap up and run and hope for the best. She knew the way she had come up to this cluster of rocks, but naturally she hadn't memorized the placement of every shrub, every rock, every exposed tree root that could easily hamper her efforts or worse, injure her, or leave her easy prey for those two men on the other side of the rocks. She rose, resolved that she would go back to the manor house, warn the laird and then leave again. She wasn't going to stay anywhere, she was not welcome. She might not be welcome on Duncan lands, but she would help Sarah and Heather. She owed them that much. After that, she would eventually find some place she would fit in. Maybe her memory would come back one day, and maybe it wouldn't. At the moment, it no longer mattered. She was coming into her own as Alice. Simply Alice. No history, no future, at least that she could imagine at this point. So, her heart pounding with anxiety, listening for the slightest sound that would indicate that the men had discovered her, she dashed away from the rocks, 
focusing on exactly where to place her feet as she scrambled along the slope, careful not to step on any fallen branch, no stone that might roll, nor brush up against shrubs as she swiftly headed down slope on the balls of her feet. She held her breath, didn't even dare to breathe, until she disappeared into the shadows of the forest around her. She would warn the lead. Whether he believed her or not was up to him. She didn't much care. Chapter 15 Mackay was worried. Very worried. Alice was out there and darkness would fall soon. She was all alone, probably growing chilled and maybe more than a little afraid. He sat on his horse, scanning the silhouette of the mountains, squinting against the glare of the setting sun illuminating the landscape. She'll be all right. He turned to Hugh and nodded. I know. I know she can survive out there but it's... You more than like her, don't you, Mackay? At that moment, he had to accept the truth. He had grown more than fond of Alice. Did he love her? He wasn't certain. He'd never been in love before. Was love something that twisted one's stomach into tight knots? Made a person feel sick and happy at the same time? Did love precipitate such heart-pounding concern for the welfare of someone else? Of course, it was his duty to protect the inhabitants of the village, and Sarah and Heather. That was his duty. This, this feeling with Alice, it went deeper than duty. Much deeper. When did it happen? How did it happen? He shook his head. I don't like it. Like what? He turned to his friend. I don't like this feeling, but it's there, and I don't think it's going to go away any time soon. You want it to? No. He didn't. In fact, the knowledge that he could very well be falling in love with Alice filled him with an odd sense of contentment and pleasure. Ever the loner, yet always friendly, Mackay had spent most of his life alone. His youth was nothing to boast about. The concept of loyalty was one thing. Love something else. Of course he saw how much Philip and Sarah meant to each other, and Heather and Jake as well, but he never in his life imagined that he would become emotionally involved with someone to the point that he understood what his friends shared with their spouses. I was in love once. Mackay knew that. A few years ago, Hugh had been besotted by one of the villagers. A beautiful young woman with silvery white blonde hair, the fairest of skin and incredibly light blue eyes. Mackay remembered Hugh walking around with a perpetual grin on his lips, his chest puffed proudly because everyone in the village knew that Hugh and the young woman, Elise, had eyes for one another. It had lasted an entire summer, with Hugh becoming increasingly annoying and difficult to be around because all he wanted to talk about was the beautiful lass. Not that Mackay was jealous, it was simply tiresome, to the point that Mackay had suggested he merely marry the girl and get it over with. But then she had gone into the woods one day to gather berries. When she hadn't returned home by late that afternoon, her little brother had found Hugh and told him that his sister had failed to return. Both Hugh and Mackay had ridden into the woods searching for her. Less than an hour later they'd found her, horribly mangled and bloody. She'd been attacked by a wild boar, her clothing and her body nearly ripped to shreds, only the sight of her silvery blonde hair definitively identifying her. Hugh had been crushed. It had taken him more than a year to overcome his grief and sorrow. Mackay didn't want to experience the same. Maybe it was best that Alice learned the truth, the true reason why Mackay had invited her to live under his roof. Still, it hurt. If she truly had loss of memory, he didn't wish her to think that she was unwanted. How many times could a person be abandoned before they gave up on life? We'll find her, Mackay, don't worry. But that was just it. He was worried. With memories of Elisa's bloodied body now foremost in his thoughts, Mackay said nothing. It will soon be dark. We're not going to make any more progress tonight. She's hiding. It will be difficult to see and we could be way off track. He turned to his friend. We should go back to the manor. We'll head out at daylight and pick up her trail then. Nodding, Mackay turned his horse and followed Hugh as they made their way back to the manor house.
He wanted to keep searching, but Hugh was right. He didn't want to risk Bruce stepping into a hole or slipping on the rocky soil and injuring himself. He could have insisted that he would simply make camp, but they hadn't ventured far enough from the manor house to stay out here. His heart heavy, not sure what to do with his feelings, not the least of which was guilt, they rode back in silence. By the time they returned to the manor house, Mackay wanted only to stable Bruce, brush him down and then climb into bed. To put Alice out of his mind, if only for a little while. She would be all right. He convinced himself of it. Besides, he had to decide what he was going to do about the feelings which he had acknowledged. What if Alice didn't feel the same way? What if she already belonged to someone? What if she already had a husband and children or a family who loved her? He frowned. If she had a husband or a family who loved her and were looking for her, why hadn't they heard about it? Gossip travelled fast in the highlands and even across clan lines. If someone was out there looking for Alice or whatever her real name was, they would have heard about it by now. He was sure of it. And if not, what then? What if he proclaimed his affection for her, and she did agree to stay? What if she, what if she woke up one day and remembered who she was, and wanted nothing to do with him or? Mackay. Mackay glanced toward the side door where he saw the cook gesturing for him. He turned to Hugh. Thanks for. Well just thanks. Hugh nodded and continued on toward the stables while Mackay turned his horse toward the side yard and then dismounted, ground tying Bruce. What is it, Cook? Inside? Come inside. Without waiting for Mackay to reply, she grabbed his tunic sleeve and literally pulled him into the kitchen after her. He followed, frowning with consternation. Why are you? She paused in front of the door that opened into the great hall and then turned to him, fingers pressed against her lips. Look. She opened the door slightly and Mackay peered over her shoulder. At first his heart thudded with relief. Overwhelming relief, so startled he couldn't move. He saw Philip, Jake and Sarah and Heather gathered around the fire, speaking softly among themselves. And in the middle of that small cluster stood Alice. So relieved was he to see her that he quickly brushed past Cook and rushed into the great hall. Alice. Without a thought to what others might think, he made his way toward her and then enveloped her in his arms, hugging her against him. I can't believe you're safe. We've been out looking for you. She wasn't hugging him back. At the moment, he didn't even care. She was safe. She wasn't injured. She'd come back. She looked up at him, eyebrows lowered in anger. Alice, I know you heard. Philip interrupted. Mackay, we've got trouble. Mackay glanced at the small circle, saw how close Heather and Sarah stood next to their respective husbands, Sarah's hands wrapped protectively around her belly. Their faces were pale but Jake's was red with anger, his jaw clenching and unclenching. Philip kept glancing toward the front door. What's wrong? Alice brought us some news. Mackay glanced from Philip back down to Alice, who had put some space between them. She crossed her arms over her chest, her expression displaying reluctance. She didn't meet his eyes. Alice, I'm sorry you had to hear what you did. She turned on him with a look, her voice thick with pain. You think I'm a spy? What could he say to that? Her accusation was true. He glanced helplessly at Philip. And tell me this, Mackay, she said, then turned to Philip and then toward Jake. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. If I am a spy, who am I supposed to run and report to? I can't even remember who I am. She paused. But you think I'm pretending that I really do know who I am? Mackay placed his hand on her shoulder. She shrugged it off. Alice. I can understand the suspicion, she continued. After all, I appeared out of nowhere. She paused, swallowed and blinked back tears that filled her eyes. I wish I knew for sure. She looked at all of them. Don't you think I want to know who I am? Don't you think I want to know where I belong? Alice, it no longer matters, don't you see? Sarah said gently. Even if you were a spy, you're not a spy any longer. 
you have a chance to start a new life here with us. Philip opened his mouth to say something, but Sarah raised her hand, preparing to say her piece. Despite what you heard, despite what you believe, you came back. You came back to warn us. She looked at Philip and then at Jake, then finally to her sister. You risked your safety and braved the Laird's suspicions to warn us. If nothing else, your actions proclaim the person you are. Someone who is compassionate, loyal, and who seeks justice and righteousness. Alice said nothing, but stood with drooping shoulders as if in surrender. She finally forced herself to look at Mackay, but quickly glanced away. What's happened? Mackay asked impatiently. Sarah replied. In the forest, she came across two men heading for the manor. Mackay glanced at Heather, who looked pained. Sarah continued. Apparently, our stepfather has found us. He's riding with at least one other person who has legal authority, and he's planning on using that authority to take us away. He can't do that. Mackay frowned. You've both married into the Duncan clan. He has no right. But he can make trouble, and it's apparent that he's made contact with the McGregors. Mackay glanced at Alice, then at Sarah before once again turning his gaze on Jake. Clyde? Jake nodded, a growl rumbling in his chest. Bastards, Mackay muttered, then shook his head. You're legally married. Neither of the women were forced into those marriages, he said to Jake and Philip. And we have plenty of witnesses to testify to that. He has no charges to bring against you. He might be able to, Philip said softly. Mackay understood exactly to what incident Philip was referring. When they had first ventured down to the coast toward Kirkordy, they had taken Sarah against her will. That things had turned out differently, that she had fallen in love with the Highland Laird and eventually married him, might not overrule the original charges of kidnapping. Still, he was confused. How do you think he found out? I have no doubt that Siana had some role in this, Jake grumbled. A note penned to Patrick MacDonald would be all that it took. The timing might be right too. Mackay sighed. Would Siana's betrayals and treachery never end? Even from beyond the grave? We'll be ready for him, Philip said, his expression somber. He glanced down at Alice. Alice, I will be honest with you. I don't know whether you're a spy or you're not, but I do swear to you now that because of your deed, you will be given the benefit of the doubt. I truly believe that you have lost your memory, and so I cannot place blame where it cannot be proven. Mackay was happy to hear that. But still. A voice from outside shouted a warning. Riders coming. Four of them. Philip glanced down at Alice with a frown. You saw two riders. She offered a small shrug. I heard two different voices. I didn't actually see anyone. It doesn't mean there were not others behind them, or some who joined them later. Sarah Heather go upstairs. They immediately did as he bade, quickly mounting the stairs. Mackay heard a door slam shut behind them. For the moment, Alice was forgotten. Mackay watched her stiff posture, her uncertainty. She was still angry and he couldn't really blame her. At the moment, however, they had more pressing matters that needed to be attended to than her feelings. Philip gave orders. Jake, gather the men. If there is to be trouble, I want to be prepared. He glanced at Mackay. Alice stood, not sure what to do. Mackay wanted to guide her, to wrap his arm around her shoulder and offer his support, but knew she wouldn't appreciate that, at least not at the moment. Stand here with us, he told Mackay, gesturing toward Jake, whose face had taken on a foreboding, threatening scowl. Alice, I think it's best if you return to Mackay's house. Go through the kitchen and behind the house. Mackay saw the ensuing frown. She felt reluctant to do so. His heart sank. As far as she was concerned, he had betrayed her, and it would take a lot of effort to convince her otherwise. He was about to speak to her when the door opened and Hugh entered, his expression troubled, one hand on his short sword. The look in his eyes was less than pleased. Alice turned to walk toward the doorway, 
leading into the kitchen area. Everything happened at once. A heavy set and red cheeked man pushed his way past Hugh, his expression belligerent. He pointed a fat, stubby finger at Philip, while another man followed closely on his heels, unable to halt Patrick MacDonald from walking directly up to the laird. Are you the laird of this clan? Patrick, not this way. You Highland bastard. I'll. Patrick, enough. And behind that man, much to the surprise of everyone in the room, appeared Clyde McGregor. Jake immediately lunged toward Clyde, ready to do bodily damage. Jake. Philip spoke sharply, speared a glance at Mackay and gestured with his chin. Mackay quickly stepped in front of Jake, only diverting him for a second but it was enough. Hands balled into fists he glared his hatred at the McGregor, while the heavyset man roared with anger. You kidnap my daughters. I'll have your neck for this. Mackay, trying to keep one eye on Jake, the other warily on the blustering newcomer and the McGregor, glanced at Philip as he stepped forward hands raised his features calm. For the moment at least there would be no bloodshed. Not in the manor house. Mackay turned once again toward their unwelcome visitors, but then noticed the startled look on Clyde McGregor's face. Clyde stared beyond Jake. Mackay glanced over his shoulder to find Alice frozen in the doorway leading to the kitchen area, watching the goings-on with wide eyes. The sound of Clyde McGregor's shout filled the room and reverberated against the walls. Mary, what in the bloody blazes are you doing here? Every person in the room stilled, all eyes turned to Alice. Confused, Mackay could only stare. Alice's eyes were wide as that of a frightened doe. And then he realized. Och, this can't be happening, Jake muttered. Philip shifted his gaze between Alice and Clyde McGregor, eyebrows lowered. Mackay swallowed, his heart thumping hard in his chest. Who is she to you? Philip asked, his voice deceptively soft. Clyde tugged his gaze from Alice and turned to Philip. Straightening his shoulders and lifting his chin, he answered. Surely you know her. That's Mary McGregor, cousin of mine and niece to the laird of the McGregor clan. Chapter 16 After a moment of stunned silence, gasps of surprise, swearing and the resumption of the belligerent accusations erupted. The ruddy-cheeked man shouted at Philip, so angry that spittle flew from his lips. His companion reached for his arm trying to calm him, but he shook it off. Alice stood frozen to the spot, heart pounding, her mouth so dry she couldn't work up enough spit to swallow if she wanted to. She couldn't tear her eyes from the man staring at her, as if they were the only two in the room. Long reddish-brown hair fell to his shoulders, cheeks stubbled with several days' growth of beard, a little redder than his hair. A raised pinkish-looking scar on one side of this forehead, extending from his hairline down to his eyebrow, cutting it in half. And those eyes cold hard cruel. No mistaking his emotions when he saw her. Chin lifted he maintained eye contact, frowning with disdain. At that moment she realized. That man recognized her. The McGregor they called him. Enemy clan. She glanced at Mackay and noted his tight jaw. His hands balled into fists at the clansmen, but she also thought she saw his head cocked to the side, his gaze darting between the two of them. Her heart skipped a beat. Whatever affection she had seen in McKay's eyes moments earlier wasn't there anymore. Now he only looked confused, likely as stunned as she. Patrick was blocked from any further advance on the Duncan Laird by Jake's stiff arm, his glower frightening to behold. Sarah and Heather's stepfather stared down at Jake's arm and stopped moving. The lawman, perhaps a sheriff from their home county, stood close by, trying to calm Patrick while Philip stood feet spread, arms now crossed over his chest staring at him. His face displayed no emotion, but Alice saw the stiff neck, the throbbing of a vein there. Mackay stood slightly hunched, arms to his sides, massive hands balled into fists ready to defend or strike. The glare he gave the McGregor sent a shiver through her. Behind the McGregor stood another man, a companion for sure, watching all of it with a grin of amusement. Mackay moved close to Jake, one hand on his shoulder, back turned toward her now, carefully watching the interlopers. Philip said something to Mackay. The moment he turned his attention from the McGregor, his eyes turned toward her again. He took a step toward her. 
Her heart caught in her chest and she blinked not sure what to do. Run or stay. He knew her. He had called her Mary. He couldn't be mistaken, could he? No, he had said her name the moment he laid eyes on her. Was she, was she a McGregor? An enemy to the Duncans? If so, why did no one come looking for her? Had no one even noticed she was gone? By the time those thoughts ran through her brain, the man had taken several steps forward and grabbed her arm. The snake-like move startled her, and she squeaked a mule of fear. She tried to tug her arm from his grasp, her heart pounding now. She didn't want to go anywhere with this mean-looking brute of a man. She clutched the side of the doorway with one hand, planted her feet and pulled against him just as Mackay turned toward her in response to her cry of fear. The McGregor ignored him, his eyes wide with surprise at her refusal to come with him, but only for an instant. The snarl returned. Nothing about him, triggered any memory. His grip tightened and slid down to her wrist, his hand easily encompassing it in an iron grip. You're coming with me lass. No. I don't want to go anywhere with you. I don't know you. Don't be playing games with me Mary. You're coming. Let her go. Mackay approached, one hand resting on the hilt of the knife tucked into his waistband, the other reaching for Alice. She glanced between the two, saw their angry expressions as they glared at one another. Mackay was a full head shorter than the McGregor, and she feared for his safety, even in the midst of the other clan members in the Great Hall. He didn't flinch. I said let her go. Mackay stepped in front of her and wrapped his arm around her waist. She'll not be going anywhere just yet. She's a McGregor. Clyde fumed. What is she doing here? Before Philip could respond, Patrick MacDonald shouted for Sarah and Heather. Jake took a threatening step toward Patrick, hands held at his sides but ready to strike at a moment's notice. The sheriff desperately tried to calm the increasingly belligerent Patrick, as Hugh took his stand at the bottom of the stairs, just in case. No unwelcome visitor would get past Hugh. In seconds, the great hall was filled with the sound of shouting as two separate groups argued with one another. To Alice's surprise, the laird stood calmly, arms still crossed over his chest, watching MacDonald and the sheriff, for the moment ignoring the McGregor and his companion, knowing that Mackay had his eye on both of them. Until the very moment that Patrick took a step toward the stairs. In a flash of movement Philip reached for him, grabbing a handful of his shirt. You have been given safety here, in this room, but this room only. Do not take another step. You kidnapped my daughters. Nay he did not. Jake argued. Patrick glared at the two of them, paying the others no mind. You highland scavengers, you're nothing but wild animals. I've come for what's rightfully mine. You will do no such thing. Silence fell over the room at the sound of the female voice. Even Clyde and Mackay broke their glares long enough to glance upward. Sarah stood midway down the stairs, arms crossed over her chest. Alice couldn't help but feel an intense surge of admiration for the woman's bravery. Did nothing intimidate her. She quickly glanced at her stepfather, noticed his eyes widen with surprise as his gaze swept over her lovely visage and then focused on her swollen belly. His mouth turned down in disgust. Alice thought he might spit. Don't even think it, Philip growled taking a step toward him. Enough of this, the sheriff said. Let us settle this like gentlemen. There are no gentlemen here, Patrick snapped. I want what's mine. He pointed at the stairs. You kidnapped her. You forced her up here and you forced her to, to bear your bastard child. He did no such thing Patrick MacDonald, Sarah retorted. He is my husband, and I will not be going with you. Patrick sputtered and then turned to glare once more at Philip. A different female voice interrupted his curses. Nor will I. Another gasp of surprise from Patrick MacDonald, as Heather came down the stairs to stand next to her sister. Patrick stared at his two stepdaughters in dismay, before he once again glared at Philip and then Jake. I'll have your heads for this. Heather is my wife now, Jake said, barely choking back his fury. You no longer have any rights to her. You kidnap them. 
No, they did not, Sarah interrupted again, her voice raised and firm. My sister and I have married into the Duncan clan of our own free will. Patrick turned toward the sheriff, who seemed flustered and uncomfortable. Because everyone seemed distracted by the drama playing out before them, Alice took the opportunity to forcefully jerk her hand from Clyde's grasp. Surprised he turned toward her, but she had already dashed through the doorway heart-pounding terrified, eyes wide with panic as she stared at Cook who stared back at her. She clapped her hands over her mouth to prevent the scream that threatened to erupt from her throat. Cook gestured for her to leave through the door. Alice offered a jerky nod of thanks, and brushed past her as the cook picked up a cleaver, before turning back to the doorway leading to the great hall. Blinking back tears she raced from the manor house. She didn't know what to do, didn't know what was happening in the great hall, but she ran behind the house, and past the armory to McKay's home. As she ran she noticed the Duncan clansmen arming themselves and heading toward the manor house, prepared for any orders that might come. She reached McKay's door, opened it, and then slammed it shut behind her, leaning against it as tears streamed from her eyes. Her legs shook with fear, her heart pounded, and she tightly clasped her hands around her waist, trying to still her trembling. Despair racked her shoulders, her heart racing so fast she thought it might explode. She tried to stop her crying and held her breath, gulping down her choking sobs, resisting the urge to flee into the depths of the woods once again. Things had gone from bad to worse. She. A heavy thud on the door prompted her to scream. She leapt away from it, then quickly spun around and braced her hands against it, pushing it shut as someone from the other side tried to push it open. No. She wasn't going anywhere with that man. Alice. Alice, it's me, Mackay. Let me in. Trembling with relief, Alice stepped back from the door and stood in the middle of the room, her emotions awash with pain, her sense of betrayal by Mackay, the arrival of the McGregor, and terror, so many emotions at once threatening to buckle her knees. Alice. Anger surged. I'm not Alice, she choked out. My name is Mary, and, and apparently I belong to an enemy clan, she took a step back, shaking her head. I won't be going with him. I won't. It's all right, Alice. Mary. Mackay said, standing in front of the closed door, one hand extended in an attempt to calm her. You don't have to go anywhere you don't want to. Warm tears filled her eyes again. Where am I supposed to go? You think I'm a spy? You think? Mackay closed the distance between them in two steps and wrapped his arms around her, pulling her close. She nestled herself against his warm body and for a second, a brief second, she leaned into him, welcoming his strength, his comfort and that warmth. But then everything came flooding back, ruining it. She pushed herself away and back toward the table, hand extended and finger pointed. You stay right there Mackay. I. I'm not ready for this. For any of it. She began to tremble again, and a wave of miserable loneliness surged through her. You, you think I'm a spy, uh? she choked back a pained cry from the stab of hurt that originated from her heart. She couldn't help the angry bitterness that swept through her. She didn't want to cry. She didn't want to feel this abject fear, this sense of isolation, let alone experience this sudden lack of confidence. Alice, it's going to be all right. No it's not, she cried. You heard him. I'm the niece of the McGregor Laird. You've already told me that the McGregor and Duncan clans are enemies. She lifted her hands then dropped him down to her sides. What am I supposed to do? She shook her head, angrily swiping at the tears staining her cheeks. I don't know them. I don't know that man, I don't know anything about. Mackay stepped toward her, but she was too tired, emotionally at least, to fight him off. Once again he wrapped his arms around her one hand gently pressing her head against his shoulder. She heard the thudding of his heart, as he awkwardly patted her shoulder. Don't worry Alice, he said, now stroking her hair. I won't let them take you. I won't make you do anything you don't want to do. He paused and cleared his throat. I know you're very angry with me at the moment, and I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry for doubting you. She lifted her head and saw him gazing down at her. The past is the past, Alice. It's Mary. 
He offered a small smile. You might be Mary McGregor, but to me you'll always be Alice. He brushed the hair from her face and with the pad of his thumb, wiped away her tears. When his thumb lingered on the bottom of her cheek, so close to her lips, she felt her heart crumble. She wanted to forgive him, but she didn't know. Could she trust him? Could she trust anybody? Then his lips were pressed against hers, as if attempting to prove to her that he meant what he said. Warm soft, filled with tenderness. She hesitated only a brief moment, and then wrapped her arms around his neck as she returned the kiss. For these precious moments at least, she didn't have to be afraid. She could revel in this momentary world of peace, comfort and security. What would happen in the next hour, or tomorrow was pushed to the back of her mind. She would take this moment and treasure it. The pressure of his lips increased, and she responded in kind, her arms tightening around his waist while his pulled her even closer. In this moment, she realized how deep her affection for him had grown. Yes, he had hurt her, but she didn't believe he had done so deliberately. She believed that his feelings for her were real. At that moment, she wished that she could stay here forever with Mackay and... A loud pounding on the door jolted her back to awareness. With a startled gasp she pulled out of Mackay's grasp, shaking her head. She flinched, her muscles tense, fighting back the scream of denial that built deep in her chest. At that moment, her legs almost buckled. She saw black spots. Mackay. It's Philip. I need you and Alice. Mary to come out here. Alice felt the blood drain from her face as she stared up at Mackay, eyes wide. Don't let them take me, she choked out. Please Mackay don't let them take me. Mackay heaved a heavy sigh, then bade Alice to wait while he stepped to the door and opened it only a little bit, blocking the entrance with his body. Alice waited, heart pounding as the laird spoke. Where's Alice? She's here, Mackay said, opening the door a little wider. The laird stepped through, alone, and Mackay closed the door standing with his back to it. Alice stared at Philip, unable to tell what he was thinking. His expression emotionless he eyed her, then glanced at Mackay, then turned back to her. Are you all right? She hadn't expected that question, but offered a jerky nod. You're not going to make me go with him, are you? She cringed at the sound of her trembling voice. Philip said nothing for a moment, then sighed. Clyde McGregor claims that you are the niece of Angus McGregor, laird of the McGregor clan. If these claims are true, I will have no right to keep you here. Even if I don't want to go with them. Philip offered a small shrug. Unfortunately, Alice. Mary, you don't have any choice in the matter. If you belong to the McGregors. I don't belong to anyone, she protested. This isn't right. I don't want to go with them. I don't know them, I don't remember anything about them, I don't. Alice. The McGregors and the Duncans have been enemies for generations. Even if you chose to stay with us here of your own free will, the McGregors don't have to honor your request. You're just a woman. Tears filled her eyes again. This wasn't fair. I think some questions need to be answered, Mackay said. Philip nodded. What do you mean? she asked a hint of hope in her voice. Philip didn't answer the question. He nodded at Mackay. It might give us some time. Alice didn't understand what they were talking about, but anything that would give her a chance to stay here with the Duncans was better than having to be forcefully taken by that other clan, back to a place she didn't remember, know or want to know. Clyde and his companion have ridden a short distance to the west to make camp for the night. Tomorrow, they will return for Alice. When they do, I will have questions for them. If I don't like their answers, we will decide then what is to be done with you. And if you find their answers suitable, she asked hesitantly. Then it is out of my hands. Chapter 17 I need you to come with me, Philip said to Mackay. Mackay nodded and glanced down at Alice. Stay here. He didn't want her to bolt and run again. Promise me, Alice, that you'll be here when I get back. He placed a hand on her shoulder and gave it a comforting squeeze. I need you to trust me. We'll work this out. 
somehow. She appeared hesitant, but nodded. I give you my word. I'll stay here. With that, Mackay followed Philip out of the house. What's going on in there? he asked, gesturing with his chin toward the manor. Philip growled low in his throat. The Kirkcaldy sheriff, if he is who he says he is, finally managed to get Patrick calmed down. He shook his head, a put-upon sigh erupting from his chest. I've got them camping in the woods to the east over there, he said, gesturing. What a disaster, and it had all happened at once. Mackay worried about all of them, Alice, Sarah and Heather. They belonged here. His thoughts still reeled from the knowledge that Alice, Mary, was a McGregor. He looked to Philip. We can't let her go with them. You know that, don't you? Philip frowned and turned to him, eyebrow cocked. What would you have me do, Mackay? Invite open warfare between the clans over a woman? Mackay frowned in return. And if it was Sarah or Heather we were talking about? Philip swore under his breath and turned to Mackay with a frown. You think I like it? Sarah's right. Even if Alice was supposed to spy on us, and I'm finding that increasingly doubtful, she did risk a lot coming back here to warn us about the riders. She didn't have to do that. He paused and gazed around the property surrounding the manor house. And it's also painfully obvious that she doesn't know Clyde. She has not regained her memory. We were all looking at her, Mackay. Don't you think we would have seen some sign of recognition, some expression other than fear? But Philip, what if Clyde or another of the McGregors are the ones who beat her and left her in the woods? If so and she goes back with them we both know what that means. And that's why the McGregors are going to have to answer some questions before we let her go anywhere with them. He paused again and placed a hand on Mackay's shoulder. But you know that I can't start a war over her. Too much is at stake. Mackay said nothing, though he realized the truth of the matter. He didn't like it, but he understood. If it came to that, he would try to think of something to protect Alice. Just before they entered the manor house, he spoke. What are you going to do about Patrick MacDonald? I know what I would like to do with him, Philip muttered as he pushed open the door and entered the great hall. Mackay followed, closing the door behind him. At one side of the large table near the fireplace, Jake stood over Sarah and Heather both seated on the benches. He was between them, legs spread, arms crossed over his chest, his face still red with emotion. Where's Alice? Sarah asked. Is Alice all right? Heather asked at the same time. She's all right, Philip said, his voice tinged with irritation. She's in Mackay's house. What are we going to do? Philip turned to his wife. For now, we stall for time until I can think of a solution. He's got no right to the women. Philip held up a hand, halting Jake's growl of frustration. Where's Hugh? With about a half dozen of our clansmen keeping watch over the McGregors. Another six are watching Patrick MacDonald and that sheriff. Philip nodded, closed his eyes and turned his face to the ceiling. Mackay could see the tension on his face. Knew the thoughts running through his head, the problems and how he might solve them. Had it really been only this morning that he and Alice had such a nice time fishing, just by themselves, no worries. And now? His heart thudded to dully in his chest. Once again, he realized how fond he had grown of her. Not just fond. He admitted it. Finally. He had fallen in love with her. To what end? Only to learn that she was a McGregor. And he belonged to the Duncan clan. An impossible situation. Mackay, are you all right? Jolted out of his own musings, Mackay glanced at Sarah, her hands resting on her belly, her glistening eyes focused on him. Touched by her concern, he nodded. Leave it to Sarah to always worry about everyone else. In spite of her stepfather's sudden appearance and his threats, she still worried about Alice about him and put herself last. Her compassion stirred him to turn to the Laird and make a vow. You have my word, Laird Duncan, he said formally. You have my word, my promise, that I will do my utmost to protect those you hold dear. 
He turned to Sarah and Heather, both now watching him, tears in their eyes, faces flushed with emotion. Jake watched him as well. As long as I have breath to breathe, I'll not allow your stepfather or anyone else to harm either one of you, nor your child. Heather's face crumpled, and she lurched from her seat on the bench and approached Mackay, clasping his hand in both of hers. And you have my undying gratitude, Mackay. She smiled up at him. And I also promise the same to you. She glanced back over her shoulder at her husband, then offered him a smile. I have gotten quite adept with my bow, as you know. Mackay smiled and beside him Philip swore. The tension was broken, if only for a moment. Sarah spoke. Now that all that is settled, what are we going to do about it? I will go have a talk with the sheriff, Philip said. Sarah, we may have to provide him with an official statement. The same applies to Heather. And if they don't accept it? Mackay glanced at Philip and saw the hard glint in his eyes. If Patrick MacDonald knew what was good for him, he would let it go at that, but he wasn't sure the man would. He had travelled many miles to fetch his stepdaughters. Not out of love, based on the way he had treated them in the past, but more likely due to a matter of pride. And Clyde McGregor. That came from Jake. Philip turned to his brother. The McGregor came to us under the guise of peace, and it will stay that way as is traditional. However, we will continue to watch them carefully. I don't yet know what brought them here in the first place. Mackay, what say you? Jake said. If what they say is true. That Alice. Mary is a McGregor. All eyes turned to Mackay. He didn't hesitate. Clyde McGregor be damned, he said. If Alice. Mary does not want to go, and I wouldn't blame her for that, and if she accepts me I will take her somewhere far away from here, away from the Duncan and McGregor clans so there is no renewed blood feud. Immediate disagreement, from both Sarah and Heather, denying his intention to leave Duncan lands, Jake purporting that he was touched in the head, and Philip gazing thoughtfully at him. You love her then? Mackay turned to Sarah and swallowed. With a brief nod, he replied. I do. Sarah smiled. He continued, I don't think she knows it yet though, and I'm not sure she has forgiven me for believing that she might be a spy. She will, Sarah said. After a moment she turned to her husband, a frown of contemplation lining her forehead. Philip, this might be. I know what you're going to say, Philip said, shaking his head. It wouldn't work. Our clans have been at each other's throats for generations. But surely. You don't know the McGregors, Jake interjected. No common sense to them, none whatsoever. They're a violent, bloodthirsty lot, all of them. Do you really think that if she proclaims her love for Mackay, of the Duncan clan, they're just going to shrug their shoulders, walk off and allow the past to fall away? Has it ever happened before? Heather asked. Jake frowned down at her. No, why? Then you don't know how they're going to react. She shrugged. Jake rolled his eyes, and Philip held up his hand to hold any further conversation about the matter. We have a more immediate problem to address. Patrick MacDonald. I think I'd better go talk to him, Sarah said, starting to rise. Heather placed a hand on her shoulder. If you go, I'm going with you. Neither one of you are going to speak to him if I have anything to say about it, Philip said. Jake stepped forward. Same. Mackay stood, uncertain. If it had been just the McGregor or Patrick MacDonald who'd arrived this evening, it wouldn't seem so overwhelming, but the coincidence, the chance that both of them had arrived at the same time. I think this was planned. All eyes turned once more toward him, Philip's eyebrows lifted in question. Mackay continued, think about it, Philip. What a coincidence that Patrick MacDonald and Clyde McGregor, coming from two different directions, would arrive at the same time. So you think this was a coordinated attack of sorts? Jake proposed. Mackay nodded. What are the chances? He turned to Philip. As Sarah has told us, there is no love lost between Patrick and his stepdaughters. Why come all this way? I don't believe he would do so without some sort of... 
A reward. Something, Sarah broke in. She glanced at her sister. Patrick MacDonald has never done anything without something gained for himself in return. You think he might have been offered money to come up here and stir trouble? To what end? Philip asked no one in particular. Not only to start trouble with you, Philip, but what if? It's plausible that in arriving with the McGregors, he's hoping to create dissension between our clans. But to what end? Patrick loves only one thing, Philip. Money. Sarah shook her head. And what you said earlier. Philip, what if all of this had something to do with Siana? If so, it was put into motion a while ago. Philip said nothing for several moments. I will deal with Patrick MacDonald first, he said. Jake, come with me. He turned his wife. I don't want you to feel that you're a prisoner in your own home, but for the time being, I think it would be best if both of you go back upstairs and wait for my return. Sarah and Heather nodded as he turned to Mackay. Since Hugh and his men are watching both camps, I think it's best that you go stay with Alice. Perhaps the arrival of the McGregor triggered a memory or something, anything. He paused, shaking his head. We have no proof that she is who he says she is. Nevertheless, the chances of him arriving at this time, along with MacDonald, is too much of a coincidence. He agreed. He needed to talk to Alice, to see if the arrival of Clyde McGregor had triggered any memories, even vague ones. Don't press too hard, Sarah suggested. With head injuries, the outcome is uncertain. There is a chance, Mackay, that she will never remember anything that led up to your discovery of her in the woods. Are you willing to accept that? Even if she is a McGregor? Mackay didn't hesitate. Yes, I am. Chapter 18 Still wearing the breeches, the laced-up leather boots, and the tunic she had worn when she and Mackay had gone fishing early that morning, Alice paced back and forth. Six steps one way and six steps the other. She nibbled on her fingernail, trying to make sense of it all. Her head pounded, and she couldn't stop her hands from trembling, even when she clasped them together in front of her chest. Looking for an answer though none presented itself. Her anger at Mackay had evaporated the moment he had stepped between her and that intimidating Clyde McGregor. She tried to understand the situation from the perspective of the Duncans. The arrival of Clyde McGregor might seem suspicious to them, but she didn't know them or their history. While she was aware of the animosity between the clans, she had no knowledge of their history above or beyond what Mackay had told her. Apparently, the McGregor and the Duncan clans had been sworn enemies for generations. Why she didn't know, nor did she think it mattered. Nevertheless, she had felt a visceral reaction to the sight of Clyde McGregor. She wasn't sure what had triggered it, his size, his voice, the surprised expression that had given way to fury. All she knew was that at that moment, she had never been so terrified. Nor so grateful, when Mackay and Philip had interceded on her behalf. She still couldn't get over the fact that they had, if albeit briefly, considered that she might be a spy. When she removed emotion from the question, she could understand, at least up to a point. If she were to be completely honest, she was every bit as unsure as they were of her past. More than anything, she longed to remember. The name Mary didn't trigger any internal sense of recognition. It didn't bring back memories of her childhood, her parents or friends or family. She didn't feel like Mary. She felt like... She felt like Alice. How long would that last? The thought that the Laird would make her go with the McGregors was terrifying. She resolved at that moment that if he did, she would run away. She would rather risk death in the woods than be forced to go where she didn't want to. She didn't wish to cause trouble or to trigger a renewed spate of violence between the McGregor and Duncan clans. Sarah was close to giving birth to her first child. The thought of something happening to her or to Heather, or to either of the Duncan brothers, let alone Mackay, filled her with a sense of dread. If she had to go with the McGregor, and she ran away from them, they wouldn't blame the Duncans, would they? Then again, perhaps they would. It could be that they wouldn't believe she couldn't remember any more than the Duncans had, 
when she'd first come to them. Then what? She stopped in the middle of the room and stomped her foot in frustration. Why had Clyde McGregor come here? And of all the people who claimed her, why did it have to be an enemy of the Duncan clan? What could she do? A knock at the door prompted her to freeze. Her heart dropped her stomach and she half crouched in a frightened reaction, staring wide-eyed at the door, heart pounding. Alice, it's Mackay. Let me in. A surge of relief passed through her body as she quickly stepped the door and allowed him entry. Immediately after he stepped inside, she shut the door and stood with her back to it. She wasn't taking any chances. What's happening? Mackay turned to her, his expression somber. Clyde McGregor and his companion are camping in the woods to the west. Patrick MacDonald and the Kirkordy Sheriff, or whoever he is, are camping in the woods to the east. So they're not going to take me away? Mackay gazed down at her, and she saw the concern and worry in his eyes. Philip is trying to give us a little time. Besides they need to answer a few questions. He wants some proof that you are who they say you are. And if I am? She didn't like the fear she heard in her voice and straightened her shoulders. If I am who they say I am Mackay, I will probably have to go with them won't I? His silence gave her the answer. She looked down at the floor, forcing herself to stay calm, blinking back a sudden stinging warmth in her eyes before looking up. I know this is a difficult situation, and I don't want to put the Duncans in. Mackay again wrapped his arms around her and pulled her close, resting his chin on the top of her head. She could have stood like this forever, enveloped in his strong embrace, listening to his heart thudding beneath her ear, feeling his breath against the top of her head. She relished the moment, and tried to memorize every sensation, just in case she would never have the opportunity to do so again. There's something you should know Alice. She appreciated that he didn't call her Mary. After all, she was Alice. What is that Mackay? He gently nudged her out of his embrace and gazed down at her, one hand under her chin so she could look up at him. She searched his eyes as he stared down at her. Her heart sank. She knew. She would have to go. She? I love you. She stared at him, surprised. That wasn't what she expected to hear, but his words brought her great sense of relief. Despite her worries she could help the smile she felt lifting her lips, her heart and her spirits. I think. I know. I love you too, Mackay. He grinned and pulled her into his embrace again. She wrapped her arms around his waist, both of them reveling in the moment. Oh what she wouldn't give to feel his embrace forever, to know that she would be with him. But despite their proclaimed affection for one another, it didn't change the circumstances. Her cheek pressed against his tunic she spoke. If I am who they say I am, if I am truly the niece of the McGregor Laird, I'm going to have to go with them, aren't I? To prevent bloodshed between the clans. He said nothing and once again her heart sank. What did it matter that she was in love with him, or he with her? Alice, I promise you I'll do everything within my power to keep you here with me if that's what you wish. But I also want you to know that if, if you want to go, I won't stop you. This time it was she who gently pulled away from his tight embrace. I want to stay here with you, Mackay, and the Duncans. Everyone has been very kind. I don't know the McGregors, and I don't think I want to. That man unsettles me. If that's what the McGregors are like, I want nothing to do with them. I don't understand why I fear them, but at the same time I can't let. I can't let it be my fault if something happens. I can't be the reason for renewed animosity between the clans. There is no such thing as renewed animosity, Mackay said softly. Our clans have been fighting for longer than any of us can remember. It takes little to trigger bloodshed. Not that long ago Clyde and Jake clashed. I would assume that's why he's here, he's planning something but we haven't discovered just what yet. But why would he come here if there's such open animosity between your clans? What could he hope to gain? If he's already tried to kill Jake once and he's after revenge, why would he come here? Why not ambush him in the woods? I don't know, Mackay replied. 
and that's probably something the laird also wants to know. Alice hadn't realized how secure and comfortable she'd grown living here with the Duncans, and in McKay's house, until it was soon to be ripped away from her. Wasn't it always that way? To become so comfortable with something and taking it for granted, only to realize what you had only when one risked losing it? How did she know that, and why did everything have to be so complicated? As she stood securely wrapped in McKay's embrace, a mixture of thoughts raced through her mind. While she appreciated the fact that Philip was trying to stall, and that for now at least a McGregor was camped in the woods with his companion, how long could she possibly hope for a reprieve? Who was to say that the man riding with Clyde wasn't racing back at this very moment to McGregor lands to gather reinforcements? And when it came right down to it, why would she, a lone female, be so important to the McGregor clan that they would risk open warfare with the Duncan clan? She was only a woman. Women weren't a particularly important component in clan hierarchy. Again, she wondered how she knew that. But she did. Especially not a niece, potentially one of many to the McGregor Laird. What was she? A convenient excuse to wage war? Who are my Mackay? she asked, not really expecting an answer. They say that I'm the niece of the McGregor Laird, but if so, why was I left in the middle of the woods by myself? Now that's a question that we all would like an answer to. They continued to stand as they were, arms wrapped around one another, not saying anything, both of them absorbed with their own thoughts, fears and anxieties. After a while she forced her thoughts from our own problems and focused on Sarah and Heather. What do you think is happening with Patrick MacDonald? I don't know. She felt the vibration of his voice rumbling from his chest and tilted her head, resting her chin against his breastbone. I'm worried about Sarah and Heather. What kind of trouble can this bring to them? We're worried, Mackay admitted. And the simple answer is that we don't know. Philip and Jake married them legally, but gossip travels far and fast. It could lead to bigger problems in the future. Why don't you go see if you can find anything out? If nothing else, it might distract us, and me especially, from worrying about the McGregors. Anything is better than standing here, dreading what's going to happen to me or to us. Mackay leaned back and frowned down at her. I cannot interfere with that issue. That is between Philip, Jake, and Patrick MacDonald. Not necessarily, she said. You think of Sarah and Heather as sisters, don't you? She didn't give him time to answer. I know that all of you are close, and Sarah told me that you, Hugh, Philip and Jake grew up together. He said nothing. Aren't you curious? Mackay shrugged. Of course I'm curious, but I was told to stay here with you. She frowned. I'd like to go sit with Sarah and Heather, if it's at all possible. They've got to be worried sick. Maybe we could provide comfort to one another. He shook his head. I don't think that's a very good idea. Why not? For one, because the laird told me to stay here with you. And for two, as I said before, that particular situation doesn't involve me. Or you. She stepped away from him, shaking her head. Please, Mackay. It should be safe enough, don't you think? The McGregors are camped in the woods. I really would like to at least see if there's anything I can do for them especially after everything they've done for me, and the support they've shown me. She felt guilty about it, but truth be told, if she had to stay cooped up in this small house much longer, she would simply collapse with worry. She needed to be doing something, anything to distract herself from her own problems, even if it was sitting with Sarah and Heather, in an attempt to provide them some comfort. There had to be something that she could do other than sit here, and wait for the axe to fall. She said as much to Mackay. Finally he seemed to relent and offered a deep sigh. Fine. But Philip isn't going to like it. He doesn't have to know, she said. Please. He gestured toward one of the hooks on the wall, where a rough blanket cloak hung. Cover yourself with that. We'll go to the manor house, but if I get any indication that there's trouble afoot, or if Philip or Jake are there, we're turning around and coming back here. Understood? She barely hesitated. Understood. 
Alice looked forward to getting out of the house and doing something, but the thought of Clyde McGregor lurking nearby had her nerves on edge. She and Mackay left the house, he in front, searching the grounds before gesturing for her to come outside. He grabbed her hand and held tightly. Afraid she would run? Or was it out of protection? She wanted to believe it was the latter. Mackay, what if? Shush. He lifted a finger to his lips. Let's just get to the house as quickly and quietly as possible. His nervousness startled her. It was at that moment that she realized what she was asking him to do. She tugged on his arm prompting him to stop. Never mind Mackay, she whispered. I don't want to go anymore. I'll go back to the house. He paused and turned to glance at her over his shoulder, obviously confused. She didn't want to argue with him here, and tugged again on his arm, heading back toward the house. With a sigh, he followed. As soon as they were inside, he shut the door. What's the matter? A minute ago, you were insisting that we go. What happened? I'm sorry, she said. After we were outside, I didn't. I didn't realize that I was putting you in such a difficult situation. He said nothing as guilt washed over her. I was thinking only of myself. I don't want you to get into trouble with the laird. I can wait. I'll try harder to be patient. His expression softened as he let go of her hand and placed his own on her shoulder. I know this must be incredibly difficult for you, he said. I'll go check on Sarah and Heather. If I see Philip or Jake, I'll ask if it's all right if you stay with them at the manor house. Thank you, she said. To convince him that she meant what she said, she moved to the table and sat down, folding her hands in her lap. While it went against the grain for her to do so, she would wait. It was difficult, but if he could do it, so could she. Chapter 19 Mackay left Alice sitting at the table and walked outside, inwardly relieved that she had changed her mind about going to the manor house. The only reason he had even acquiesced was because he was trying to assuage his own sense of guilt and sympathy for her situation. And his own growing misery. He wanted to please her, to make her happy, but in doing so he knew he was potentially opening a door he didn't want to open. He had never been conflicted in regard to what the laird needed or wanted from him. Now, with Alice, things could grow more complicated. He had to abide by the laird's orders, but at the same time, he wanted to assure Alice that he was supporting her in any way he could. He knew he should have refused outright, but he also understood a little of what she must be feeling. Fearful, her destiny to be determined by everyone but herself, sequestered in his house as if she were a prisoner. He sighed as he walked toward the corner of the armory and around to the manor house. To his surprise he found the door open. Approaching he glanced inside. There, at the end of the great hall, Sarah and Heather sat at the table near the fireplace. Across from them sat Patrick MacDonald, his face flushed red, that sheriff standing slightly behind him. Both Jake and Philip stood at the head of the table, close to their wives, both wearing scowls, arms crossed over their chests. He paused at the door, not wanting to intrude, prepared to turn around and return home. He felt a tap on his shoulder and quickly spun around, his surprise fading when he recognized Hugh in the darkness. What's going on? he whispered, stepping away from the doorway into the shadows beside the house. Sarah and Heather are giving their statements to that lawman. Their stepfather isn't too happy, he replied. I think he believed that he was going to come here, tell them to go back with him, and they were going to agree. What made him think he had any legal grounds? You kidnapped my daughter. That from Patrick MacDonald, and even from outside, Mackay could hear the slurring of his words. Sarah had not exaggerated. Her stepfather was a drunk. Even in dangerous lands like the Highlands, and far from the comforts of his own home, he obviously had no qualms about indulging in his usual habits. Fool. He did not kidnap me. Sarah retorted, her voice firm and angry. His brother was severely wounded. He heard of my healing skills. You're a liar just as you always were. Patrick snarled. 
voice raised Sarah snapped back a sharp retort. And you're still a drunkard same as you always were. The cacophony of raised voices soon had the sheriff trying to calm Patrick, while Sarah and Heather both berated their stepfather. The laird tried to calm everyone, to no avail. Mackay glanced at Hugh and shook his head. Do you see any resolution to this? Aye, I do. Hugh nodded. And that is? Kick his ass all the way back to Kirkcordy. Mackay sighed and shook his head. It didn't look like Alice would be visiting the manor house any time soon. What are you doing here? Hugh asked. I thought you were supposed to be guarding Alice or Mary. He frowned at his friend. Not guarding her, Hugh. Just watching over her. Have it your way. He shrugged. So why are you here? She wanted to see if she could sit with Sarah and Heather to keep them company, but I see that's not going to be an option any time soon. He turned to his friend. Where's the McGregor? Hugh gestured with his thumb over his shoulder. Camping about a mile to the west. Don't worry, I've got half dozen men located in the woods around their camp. Mackay turned to walk back to his house but Hugh stopped him. Is it true then? Mackay frowned. Is what true? You proclaimed your love for Alice or Mary. Mackay hesitated, but only briefly before he offered a short nod. Aye, I did. And if she has to go? Mackay didn't respond. He had no answer to that possibility. He would just have to deal with. I heard them talking. Hugh tugged on his shirt, and Mackay turned to him as his friend pulled him farther away from the door and deeper into the shadows of the trees near the armory. He allowed his best friend to do so, although he didn't understand why. Heard who talking? The McGregor. Mackay's interest was piqued. And? Mackay, from what I gather, Alice. Mary, rather, was betrothed to one of the Orkney clan. What? Mackay interrupted. An Orkney? Was it possible? Apparently, old Angus MacGregor betrothed Alice. Mary to Keith, the grandson of the Orkney clan leader. Mackay frowned, confused. The MacGregors and the Orkneys didn't get along much better than the MacGregors and the Duncans. Why ever for? Apparently to join their clans or build a bridge between them. Join forces to provide greater opposition to our clan. Mackay thought about that. Such practices were certainly not unusual, but he'd never known anyone, man or woman, who had been forced into such a marriage. Knowing Alice as he did, he couldn't imagine that she would have liked the arrangement at all. She ran away. Hugh hesitated. Is that why she was out in those woods all by herself? Mackay prodded. Hugh shook his head and lowered his voice, his words slow and measured. No, Mackay, she didn't run away. When she refused the arrangement, she brought shame to her uncle. He ordered her banished. And? And she was beaten near to death and left in the woods for the wolves. Mackay's growl of anger broke the stillness under the tree. His hands balled into fists, his heart pounded while bloodlust ran through his veins. He stared at Hugh. Are you sure? He couldn't fathom someone treating Alice this way. Though it was not unusual for men to beat their wives, nor for women to become an easy target for men's desires, he hated to think that Alice had taken the brunt of something like that. He would never lay a hand on a woman. Mackay, calm yourself. You. Does the laird know about this? Hugh shook his head. I had come to tell him, but as you can see, he's otherwise occupied. He can't allow the McGregor to take her back, Mackay muttered. She refused to bow to the betrothal before. Now, without her memory, you know how she's likely to react. Aye, Hugh agreed. And they're likely to do more than beat her and abandon her in the woods if they get their hands on her. She's brought shame to both clans. They would kill her. Mackay knew it. The McGregors were not known for their kindness. He sighed, trying to gain hold of his anger. He dipped his head, pinching the bridge of his nose with his fingers. That was all there was to it then. He wouldn't let Alice go with them. 
He couldn't. Are you going to tell her? Hugh asked, his voice tinged with hesitance. He lifted his head, thinking about it. He didn't want to, but perhaps she should know. Don't you think I should? Don't you think she has a right to know? Hugh shook his head. I don't know, Mackay. What good will it do? Is she better off knowing or not knowing? I think. Keep in mind, Mackay, that this is a delicate situation. It must be handled carefully. I know the Laird wants to avoid renewed bloodshed with the McGregor clan, and that's especially important if they're joining forces with the Orkneys. He paused, then asked quietly, is she worth the risk? Aye, Mackay said, his voice firm, looking his friend in the eyes. He wasn't surprised when Hugh offered a short nod. As soon as the Laird is available, I'll let him know what's happening. In the meantime, I think it's best that you go back to your house. Wait and see what the Laird wants to do about it. Despite his desire for Hugh to let Philip know what was happening immediately, for Alice's sake, he knew that the Laird also had another serious situation to deal with. And when it came down to it, Mackay didn't doubt for a moment that Sarah's safety and well-being would and always would take precedence over a member of an enemy clan, no matter how said member came to be in their midst. He turned to walk away from Hugh, his heart heavy, his thoughts somber as he realized that Philip would never risk the safety of his clan for the sake of one woman. At least not a McGregor. Chapter 20 The moment Mackay left the house, Alice felt a heavy shroud of dread settle over her shoulders. She began to pace again. Her stomach felt like it was tied in a knot. She felt afraid and helpless. She hadn't felt afraid in a long time, but now that deep, unsettling feeling that burned into her stomach caused for more than a bit of trepidation. It wasn't just the fear of having to leave Mackay and the Duncans. No, that fear was almost instinctive, likely learned. Which brought right back to why she had been living in the woods by herself to begin with. Coupled with her intense and instant dislike and wariness of Clyde McGregor, she could only wonder. Think, think. She paused in the middle of the floor, closed her eyes and concentrated. Tried to force herself to remember. After several intense moments, hoping that something, anything would happen, she mumbled with disappointment and resignation. It was all a blank. Everything about her past was a blank. She was Mary McGregor. What did that mean? What could it mean? What if she? A soft knock on the door. Once again she froze and sent a startled gaze toward it, her heart pounding. Alice, it's Mackay. Open the door. With a sigh of relief, she lifted the latch to allow Mackay entrance. She closed the door, turning to reach for the cloak she had hung on the peg, prepared to visit with Sarah and Heather. What a welcome distraction that would be. When she turned, she noted McKay's troubled expression, his frown and the tightening of his jaw. Her heart sank. They don't want to see me. He shook his head. No, it isn't that. They're all talking to Patrick MacDonald. I didn't even go in the house. She felt disappointment but tamped it down. How are they? Mackay shrugged. It's a tense situation. Without saying anything else, he stepped toward the table and sat down in the chair, watching her. He had something to say, but hesitated. Her heart sank. More bad news? What is it, Mackay? You might as well tell me. After all, how much worse can it get? He offered a snort and leaned back, rubbing the back of his neck, looking anywhere but at her. She waited patiently, at least as patiently as she could, until her churning stomach caused her insides to quiver. She offered a false smile. Is it that bad? I was talking to Hugh, he finally said. Hugh's been watching the McGregor camp with some of the others. Alice waited for him to continue. Mackay, just get it over with. Tell me. What happened? Her fear and anxiety increased. Was she a spy? Did you, did you hear something? Her voice trembled. Mackay, tell me the truth. Tell me. I'm not a spy, am I? He looked up at her, then shook his head. No, no, Alice, it's nothing like that. 
She felt his tension, which wasn't helping her own shattered nerves. Mackay. Mackay closed his eyes, inhaled deeply, and then looked at her, his eyes never leaving hers as he spoke. From what Hugh was able to gather, it turns out that you were betrothed to a member of the Orkney clan. Your uncle, the clan leader of the McGregors, facilitated it with the Orkney clan leader. The Orkney clan. They're enemies of the Duncan clan as well, aren't they? He nodded and her mouth went dry. Betrothed. Apparently you refused, and... I refused, he gasped. And what, he asked, arms crossed over her chest now. She wanted to hear it all. She had refused a betrothal. She resisted the urge to clap a hand over her mouth with dismay, and forced herself to blink back her tears and growing fear. Women didn't refuse betrothals. Dire consequences. You were banished. They... They beat you and then abandoned you in the woods, more than likely assuming that wolves would finish you off. Alice stood stunned, but only for a few moments before a rush of feelings welled upward. Tears filled her eyes. She had been thrown away like garbage. Abandoned, left for dead. Well then. She stood staring at Mackay, blinking through her tears, waiting for the surge of emotion to pass. It did, and the sense of betrayal transformed into anger. She stood now with her hands balled into fists at her side. So they threw me away, and all because I refused to marry? Who is this person I was betrothed to? Mackay gave her an odd glance. Does it matter? Of course it matters, she replied. I mean. She shook her head. What kind of a woman am I, to refuse an order by a clan leader, much less a relative? Why would I? Obviously you didn't want to marry, he said simply. Even you know by now Alice that you're not, typical, of other females and you're certainly not afraid to flout convention. Perhaps she shouldn't be surprised at all that she had refused to follow through with a betrothal. So tell me, who is this person I was supposed to have married? Did I know him? Did I, did I have any feelings for him? Mackay shook his head. You probably never met him. The Orkneys and the McGregors have always been wary of one another, and animosity runs between those two clans as well. Maybe not as ferocious as the animosity between the McGregors and the Duncans, but it's there. From what I gathered, the McGregor wanted to forge somewhat of a tentative bond with the Orkney clan, to join forces by the two of you marrying. To what purpose? Isn't it obvious? to war against our clan and others. She closed her eyes. Men and their foolish blood feuds their wars, and over what? No one remembered. What happens now? Hugh is going to talk to Philip, as soon as he's finished dealing with the situation with Patrick MacDonald. The unsettled feeling returned, and once again her stomach roiled. As the clan leader, she didn't think that Philip Duncan would dare risk open warfare with the combined forces of the Orkney or the McGregor clans for her sake. Which left chances better than none, that she would be sent back with Clyde McGregor. And if she ran away? The McGregors would still blame the Duncans. Th there's no way out of this, she stammered. No matter what happens to me or what I do, there's a chance that the McGregors and the Orkneys are going to attack the Duncans, isn't there? Mackay didn't mince words. I but will be ready for them. It won't be the first time. What an impossible situation, and she was right in the middle of it. With no memory of anything involved with the entire situation. Perhaps it would have been better if she had died out there in the woods, never been rescued by Mackay, nor, nor fallen in love with him. Alice, you should. A loud single knock on the door interrupted Mackay. Alice turned toward it, while Mackay rose and stepped forward. Stay there, Mackay said softly. It's probably Hugh. It could be that Philip is ready to see us. The door slammed open. Alice took a step back, heart pounding and eyes wide with startled dismay, as two large men she didn't recognize burst into the room. Mackay instantly crouched into a defensive position, reaching for the knife at his side, but one of them snarled and swung his own knife at Mackay, plunging it into his side. Alice opened her mouth to scream and rushed to Mackay's defense, but it was too late. 
Another blow with the butt of that knife slammed into the back of his head. He crashed to the floor unconscious. The other man stepped toward her, muttered something under his breath, and swung his fist in her direction. Before she had taken two steps, she felt the force of the blow against the underside of her jaw. Her teeth clacked together and she flew backward. After that, she neither remembered nor felt anything at all. Chapter 21 Pain jolted him back to semi-awareness. What happened? His thoughts foggy, he slowly opened his eyes, surprised to realize that he lay face down on the floor of his home. What was he doing here? Why was he? It all came back to him in a rush. The two men forcing their way into the house. One of them had brandished a knife before he could react. Where had they come from? What did they want? Alice. He tried to push himself off the floor, but a jolt of pain prompted a groan and caused a renewed wave of agony to shoot through his body. He froze fully conscious now, aware that he had been stabbed. Where was Alice? Alice? Alarmed by the weakness of his voice, he moved his arms, braced his hands beneath his shoulders, and fighting the pain, the nausea and the trembling in his muscles, forced himself upward onto his hands and knees. His heart hammered when he saw the pool of congealed blood on the floorboards beneath him. Shifting position, he managed to get onto his knees, one arm outstretched and bracing himself against the floor, his right hand clasping the wound in his side. It felt sticky, but glancing down he noticed no fresh blood oozing between his fingers. Gathering his strength he quickly glanced around, but as expected his small house was empty. They had taken Alice. But who were they? Had those men belonged to the McGregor clan or the Orkneys? He had to get help. Alice was in great danger. The thought of her in their hands brought a surge of fury rising to his throat, and his pain was not physical this time. What would they do to her? He didn't want to contemplate it. It took him several minutes but he managed to stand up, though hunched over, the pain in his side taking his breath away as he lunged for the door. He collapsed against it, fighting the blackness that threatened to pull him down into unconsciousness. Not yet. He had to get help for himself and for Alice. Just the effort expended in reaching the door exhausted him. He leaned against it for several moments trying to catch his breath, trying to breathe, trying to fight the pain. Gasping he glanced down, saw fresh blood now oozing between his fingers. He couldn't die. Not before he knew Alice was safe. With the greatest effort he scrambled outside. It was dark, the moon part way to its zenith. How long had he laid there on the floor? He glanced toward the house, saw just the corner of it past the dark outline of the armory. His ears ringing, his legs weak and unsteady, he staggered several steps away from his house, focusing on the armory. Once there, he would make it to the house. He had to. All was quiet. The only sound disrupting the night was that of the bullfrogs croaking near the edges of the pond, and the even more distant chirp of crickets. He tried to shout, but couldn't work up the effort, all of his energy focused on simply putting one foot ahead of the other. He didn't think any vital organs had been punctured, or he would have been dead by now. Still, he'd lost a lot of blood. After what seemed an incredibly long and arduous journey, he managed to reach the armory house, crashing against the side of the building before collapsing to the ground. The jolt triggered a renewed round of throbbing pain, each pulse of his heart sending shafts of agony throughout his body, every heartbeat caused him to bleed more. If he didn't hurry, he would run out of time. With a groan he battled to rise, but found it difficult to gain his footing. Doubled over, every movement tortured him with new waves of pain. The ringing in his ears grew louder, while darkness hovered around the edges of consciousness. What if he couldn't make it to the house? What if? No. He had to. Who goes there? The voice came from around the side of the armory, the tone threatening and guttural. He recognized it and nearly collapsed again, this time with relief. Q. Q. His voice barely louder than a whisper, he tried again. Q. A figure rounded the armory, short sword at the ready. Mackay recognized Hugh's profile in the moonlight. 
Mere seconds later, Hugh recognized him as well. He lunged forward, reaching for Mackay just as his legs gave way. Mackay. Hugh managed to break his fall, easing him to the ground. Mackay, what happened? Hugh hovered over him and swore when he found the wound. Then he shouted for help. Alice? Alice? Mackay couldn't make his mouth work, couldn't transform his thoughts into words. His head was swimming, the ground beneath him undulating as if he were in a boat. Everything was upside down, and through it all, over the buzzing in his ears, his fear and his pain, he could only think of one thing. Alice. Voices surrounded him. Shouting voices, questions, orders. Into the house. Philip. Mackay, who did this to you? What happened? He felt himself lifted upward. Pain racked his body, and he barely managed to stifle a garbled cry as he was carried, arms and legs dangling by two men taking him to the manor house. Just before darkness overtook him, he heard alarmed female voices and willed one to be that of Alice. Before he could place any of them, darkness overtook him, carrying him away on waves of pain-free blackness. Mackay dimly heard the sound of voices but couldn't make out the words. He felt trapped weighed down by, by what? He tried to force himself to move, to open his eyes but his body refused to cooperate. What was the matter with him? Why couldn't he move? He tried to speak but no sound emerged from his throat. Even those unsuccessful efforts left him feeling exhausted, so exhausted that he succumbed to the blackness once again. The bleeding stopped. He will recover. Mackay forced himself upward from oblivion, relieved that he could make out the words, the female voice. Alice? He felt a hand stroking the hair back from his forehead. A cool damp cloth replaced that hand a moment later. You're going to be all right, Mackay. Try not to move around too much. You've lost a lot of blood. He tried to open his eyes, and after immense effort, finally managed. Everything looked blurry. Shadows and figures moving around. Voices wafting in and out, seemingly in time to the waves of pain thrumming through his body. Not as bad as before. He took that as a good sign. He knew Sarah would be looking after him. Maybe his confusion was caused by one of her herbal drinks, something to make him sleep. He was sure that one of the figures hovering over him was the healer. Then, as before, it all came back to him in a rush. Along with the memory came an overriding sense of fear. Not for himself, but for Alice. He blinked and forced his eyes to open, forced himself to wake up, to focus, to concentrate. Mackay, please stay as still as possible. I managed to stop the bleeding, but if you move too much it's going to start again. Is he going to be all right? Heather was here too. If Sarah and Heather were, chances were that Philip and Jake were as well. After several moments his vision cleared, but the room spun crazily for many seconds before that too gradually ebbed. Alice? His voice sounded strange even to himself. He turned his head and saw Philip and Jake leaning against the wall beside the window, their faces wavering in the shadows cast by the firelight in the hearth. He realized where he was, the room where they had brought Alice when she first came to them. Thoughts of her prompted a renewed pounding in his heart. They took her. I know, Philip said, stepping closer to the bed. Hugh and I went to your house after you were brought inside. She's gone. You have to find her. Mackay tried to sit up, but only managed to lift his head and shoulders off the bed before a stab of pain and Sarah's hand on his chest stopped him. Mackay, I told you not to move, she scolded. The bleeding has stopped, but if you keep moving around it's going to start again, and it will take even longer to stop it if I can. It wasn't Clyde, Jake said, frowning down at Mackay. As soon as I learned what happened, we paid a visit to his camp. He's still there. He sent a glare toward his brother. But he will be leaving at dawn. Mackay didn't understand. If it wasn't Clyde, then who were the two men who had pushed their way into his house? Two of them, he said. What happened? Philip asked, arms crossed over his chest. Alice and I, talking. A knock on the door, thought it was Hugh, Mackay said, glancing around the room but did not see his friend. 
opened the door. Two men. He paused to catch his breath. Said nothing, stabbed me. Hit on the head, don't remember anything after that. Hugh is patrolling the grounds, trying to discern who they are and where they came from. Jake turned to his brother. The McGregors might have had this planned. Distracted us with his presence while those other two hid deeper in the woods. But why risk coming here, taking such a chance? For her. A woman? Philip shook his head. It doesn't make sense. McKay's heart skipped a beat. He frowned as he gazed up at the laird. Hugh didn't tell you. Tell me what, Mackay? Philip frowned. I haven't even had a chance to talk to him. The minute we found you, I sent him off to check on Clyde, and then find out who dared to attack you in your own home, and take Alice or Mary from right under our noses. Mackay started to inhale deeply, frustrated, but the pain prompted him to wince and change his mind. Hugh found out that Alice, Mary, was betrothed by Angus MacGregor to an Orkney. She was? A betrothal between the MacGregors and the Orkneys. Jake interrupted, his tone disbelieving. He glanced at Philip, confused. But they're enemy clans. To join the clans, Mackay broke in. He needed to make them understand the danger Alice was in. She refused. She refused. Sarah gasped, pausing in her ministrations. She was in the process of mixing a poultice for his wound, the crunching of herbs by the pestle in her bowl now silenced. Mackay, what else do you know? He turned toward the laird. Only what Hugh told me. Alice refused the betrothal. The MacGregor laird ordered her, banished. He fought the lethargy sweeping through him, tugging him down into the blackness of oblivion once again. They beat her, abandoned her in the woods hoping that, hoping that a wild animal would finish her off. Philip growled low in his throat. He glanced at his brother, then down at Mackay. So, the MacGregors are involved in this treachery. He shook his head and glanced toward Sarah and Heather. Maybe all this was planned, the arrival of your stepfather and the MacGregors at the same time. The MacGregors were here for Alice. How they found out about her presence I have no idea. And Patrick MacDonald and that sheriff were somehow coerced to arrive at the same time, to distract us. I don't think so, Sarah said, gently placing a fresh poultice on McKay's side, holding it there as she looked up at her husband. Unless. The only thing that motivates Patrick MacDonald is money. But how could they possibly have timed this out? She shook her head. That doesn't sound like him. And what was he offered to do it? Heather broached. Mackay tried to keep pace with the conversation, but found it increasingly difficult to pay attention. He felt so tired but he fought against it. He couldn't lie here in bed while Alice was out there at the hands of the MacGregors, the very members of the clan that had tried to kill her once already. Both Sarah and Heather started talking at the same time, each to their respective husbands urging them to go find Alice. Mackay felt much the same. Philip, find her, find her. Blackness pulled him down into its comforting embrace before he heard Philip's reply. Chapter 22 Alice woke, just as sunlight made its way over the eastern horizon. Her head felt heavy, her hands throbbed and every muscle and bone in her body ached. Within seconds of regaining consciousness, she realized she'd been tossed over the withers of a horse in front of the clansmen like a sack of potatoes. Every hoof-fall jarred her. She desperately sought to prevent herself from sliding too far forward or too far backward, but she had nothing to grab onto. The ground sped by just an arm's length away. Every time the horse took a stride, she felt her body lift slightly, not enough to toss her off, but certainly enough to threaten her precarious balance. She had managed in amazingly quick time to gauge the horse's pace, had learned to hold her breath every time a hoof bit into the ground to prevent the air from being knocked forcefully from her. It wasn't comfortable, and in addition to her physical discomfort, her mind raced through any number of not-so-pleasant scenarios for what would ultimately happen to her. She tried desperately not to succumb to her fear or her despair, and after those first few dreadful moments of alertness, anger then prevailed. Mackay. 
She had watched in horror as the clansman thrust the knife deep into his side, then knocked the base of his knife against the back of Mackay's head. Mackay had dropped to the floor, unmoving. Then a fist had struck her against her jaw, pain exploding before darkness took over. Where were they going? Where were they taking her? Most importantly, why? If she had been left to the wolves the first time, why even bother come looking for her? It didn't make any sense. Something wasn't right. Something was. There's a good place to stop. The sound of the voice above her sent a shiver of dread through her body. Stop. Why? To kill her? She was at their mercy with no way to defend herself. How long had they traveled before she had regained consciousness, only to find herself dangling upside down on a horse? How far had they traveled from Duncan Manor? Every muscle in her body protested her position. Her rib ached from the constant bouncing and she yearned to take a deep breath, to fill her lungs with air. Maybe she should simply pretend to be unconscious. Maybe that would provide her with a better idea of who these men were, and what they wanted with her. At the same time, feigning unconsciousness would make her extremely vulnerable. What to do? What to do? Before she could come up with a plan, the horses pulled into the deeper shade of the woods. She smelled pine spruce and wildflowers. How incongruous for her to notice how good it smelled, when in a matter of moments they could be slitting her throat or... A hand grabbed the back of her shirt tunic and yanked her upward. With a garbled cry, she felt herself pulled over the withers of the horse and falling through the air. She landed with a solid thud against the ground, the air knocked from her body. So much for pretending to be unconscious. She lay sprawled on her side, one arm extended in front of her, every bone protesting the abrupt ascent. Now what? The two men dismounted. Maybe if she lay still, they would leave her here. Get up. One of the men was talking to her, but she didn't respond. She knew they were going to kill her, or even worse, take her back to where they say she belonged, which was not where she wanted to be. Maybe it would just be easier if they killed her here and now. Maybe. I said get up. A foot swung in her direction and pushed against her hip, forcing her to roll over onto her back. She lay sprawled, looking up at the two men staring down at her now, arms akimbo. One of them had long curly reddish-brown hair, and a beard to match. The other was blonde-haired and clean-shaven. Neither looked pleasant. She did her best to keep emotion at bay. She didn't want to show them fear, not that her heart wasn't pounding, not that her mouth and jaw didn't ache from the harsh blow one of them had dealt her. Not that she wasn't worried sick, literally sick to her stomach about Mackay. Was he alive? Had someone found him in time? What if? I told you to get up Mary, Redbeard ordered. She looked up at him. Neither one of them looked like that man who had identified her, Clyde McGregor. Neither one of them looked like the man that had come into the manor house with him, either. These men were rough-looking, dirty, whiskered, their clothes showing the wear and tear of a life in the open. My name is not Mary, she managed. Even talking was difficult, and her eyes filled with tears as she accidentally bit her tongue. Ah you are, Redbeard said. He reached down with a meaty fist and grabbed her wrist, yanking her up from the ground. Her shoulder felt like it was going to rip apart, and she swatted at him as he lifted her to her feet. She stood feet braced as he, her legs weak and wobbly. No I am not, she muttered. My name is Alice. The man guffaw. Whatever you say Mary, but I've known you for most of your life, so I can say with confidence that I know who you are. Pretending will not make it otherwise. She didn't recall either one of them. She stared at them, trying to force herself to remember to think but nothing came to her. The one with blonde hair turned toward Redbeard. I don't think she remembers. I don't care whether she does or not. We have our orders. Orders? Redbeard was about to reply when the sound of another horse approaching prompted the two clansmen to stiffen. Blonde hair roughly pushed her deeper into the trees. She lost her balance and fell, grunting with pain after she landed hard on her shoulder. 
She barely managed to scramble to a half-sitting position when the rider approached. Over here, Clyde. Her heart pounded and she fought back an instinct to scream, cry or to try to run away, deeper into the woods. That was the man who had recognized her in the manor house. That was the man who had looked at her with such an expression of disgust and revulsion that she had frozen, pierced by his gaze. His horse stopped, scampered a bit, and then the man spoke in a demanding angry voice. Where is she? Over there. Blonde hair gestured. Alice soon found herself staring at a pair of legs, feet and calves encased in leather boots anchored in place by narrow strips of leather. Thick knees, hairy legs, and then the bottom edge of his tunic. Her gaze swept upward past the hands balled into fists, up past the broad shoulders and into the face of Clyde McGregor. Despite her efforts, she doubted she was able to disguise her fear, certain that he could see the pulse pounding in her throat, perhaps watching her try to work up enough spit to even swallow. She grasped handfuls of dirt, pine needles and dead leaves, not much of a defense to be sure, but anything at this point was helpful. Maybe not in actually defending herself, but... Explain yourself. She stared at Clyde, then glanced past his shoulder at red beard and blonde hair, both watching with curiosity. She turned back to Clyde. She didn't like feeling so vulnerable, but had a feeling that if she tried to stand, she would just be knocked down again. Explain what? She was proud of herself for managing that much, without revealing any trembling in her voice. What you're doing with the Duncan clan? She recalled what Mackay told her. Mackay? She blinked back warm tears and glared up at Clyde. I've been told that you left me for dead. What difference does it make, that? He reached down for her so fast she didn't have time to duck the blow. Instant pain burst again in her head, heating the side of her face as the flat of his hand struck her cheek, knocking her sideways. Her head bounced against the pine needles beneath her. She cried out not in fear but in pain and outrage. She scrambled to a sitting position as quickly as she could, locking eyes with the McGregor, anger boiling deep inside. Answer me. I don't remember, she gritted out. You will answer me, Mary McGregor. He leaned forward as if to slap her again, but this time grabbed a handful of her tunic and yanked her upward, so hard and fast that she bumped into him. Answer me lass. I don't remember. He slapped her again. And again. Her lip broke open. His fist grazed her eye. Then he pushed her, and she slammed her back against a tree before her legs gave way beneath her. She didn't utter a sound. He lunged forward and grasped her jaw in his hand, squeezing as he glared at her, his nose nearly touching hers. He squeezed harder. She tried not to wince. He stared down at her for several heart-stopping seconds, the look in his eyes filled with fury, gazing at her from head to toe and back again. I think she lost her memory. Blonde hair's voice broke the silence. Clyde sent him a silencing glare, and the man dipped his head and pretended to find something interesting at his feet. Clyde said nothing for several moments, just continued to stare down at her, so close that she felt and smelled his foul breath on her face. Finally he spoke. I suppose it doesn't matter whether she remembers or not. He gestured toward blonde hair. Tie her up, Rory. She'll ride in front of you until we get far enough away. The Duncans may not be far behind if they dare risk their lives for this piece of waste. She wanted to ask questions. She wanted to know why they had kidnapped her. Why they had hurt Mackay. Why they had come to Duncan lands in the first place. So many questions but no answers. Get over there, Clyde snarled, shoving her toward the horses. Once again, she stumbled. She barely managed to catch her fall in time, to prevent her head from slamming into the trunk of a nearby pine tree. Infuriated, she glared up at him. She wanted to rail against them, scream vulgarities but she kept her mouth shut. She would bide her time. For now she had to keep her wits about her, her temper in check. Blonde hair reached for her, holding a strap of leather in his hand. She wanted to run, but knew that her chances of escaping them, at least at the moment, were slim to none. She desperately wanted to live. She wanted to escape, but to do so she knew that she had to be patient. Yes, they could kill her at any moment, 
but she had a feeling if that was their intention, they would have done so already. They could have killed her at McKay's house or anywhere along the road. No, what they had planned for her would not be quite so easy as slitting her throat. Her hands were bound behind her back so tightly that her fingers turned numb in a matter of moments. Blonde hair roughly grabbed her arm and propelled her toward his horse. In one swift move, he lifted her upward and placed her astride in front of his saddle. He leapt up behind her, arms reaching around her to grab his horse's reins. At least she was no longer dangling. Redbeard and Clyde quickly mounted, and then they were off again, this time at a gallop, putting more distance between them and the Duncans. She tightly clasped her thighs against the horse's barrel, and though she still bounced with every hoof fall, at least she could breathe. And think. How was she going to escape three enemy clansmen, with her hands bound behind her back? And that's what they were to her. Enemy clansmen. She was not a McGregor. At least not anymore. Nothing about any one of them triggered a memory. It was as if they never existed, as if her life before waking up in the room at Duncan Manor had never been. She wasn't sure how far they rode. Morning turned into early afternoon. Finally, the horses breathing hard, Clyde ordered them to a halt. Even though she hadn't eaten since the day before, and she didn't even remember what she had eaten, she felt an uneasy rumbling in her stomach. The thought of consuming food filled her with a rising sense of nausea. They were going to make camp. In the middle of the day. What would happen to her? What would they do to her? She felt cold, her hands so numb she couldn't even move her fingers anymore. Her thighs ached, as did her back from trying to maintain her balance on the horse without having to lean against her captor. As they stopped Clyde dismounted, watching while blonde hair slid off his horse. He laughed when blonde hair yanked Alice off his horse and once again she landed hard on the ground. She tried to maintain her dignity, to straighten her back and lift her chin, but inside her mind whirled with fear and uncertainty. Clyde stared down at her expressionless. She watched him warily. Not that she'd be able to defend herself if he pulled his knife or decided to cut her heart out right here and now. It was at that moment that she realized how desperately she wanted to survive. She needed to survive. She had to go back to the Duncans to see how Mackay fared. And if he had died? The thought left her feeling despondent. Get up. Maintaining as calm an expression as possible, Alice managed to get her feet under her and gradually rose. She faced Clyde, trying to hold his stare. Trying to pretend that she wasn't afraid of him. Trying to pretend that she was brave and would face anything they had in mind for her. You don't remember why you were found in the forest? His voice was softer than before, as if he might just might believe that she truly had no memory of her life before. She gently shook her head. You don't remember anything about the McGregor clan, growing up as the niece of the clan leader? Of me, your cousin. Again she shook her head. Who are you? If he thought to trick her, he failed. You tell me that my name is Mary McGregor, but I'm not. I'm Alice. Alice what? The question startled her. She offered a slight shrug, wincing at the pain even that small movement caused in her shoulder. Just Alice. You were living with a Duncan. He was, sharing his roof, his food and his protection. Nothing more. Clyde's expression transformed from calm to revulsion, his lips turned down into a sneer. It doesn't matter what you remember or not. You have brought shame to both the McGregor and the Orkney clans by refusing the betrothal. You were left for dead in the woods once. This time the woods is where you will stay. Her heart skipped a beat. What did he mean by that? He turned to red beard and blonde hair. Take her deeper into the woods. Before she could utter a cry of denial, the two clansmen stepped toward her. They each grabbed an arm and forced her deeper into the woods, Clyde following. Put her back to that tree. She was spun around and slammed into a pine tree, its trunk bare of branches until just over head height. The canopy of branches overhead started maybe half an arm's length above her head. She smelled the pine needles, the sap oozing from the bark, 
the scent of the dead pine needles underfoot. Tie her to the trunk, Clyde ordered. In a matter of moments, her bound arms had been released. She had a brief respite of relief as blood rushed into her hands, before her arms were yanked roughly behind the tree trunk, her hands separated by maybe six or seven inches. Out of nowhere, it seemed, Redbeard produced another length of rope, thinner than before, but sturdy. In a matter of seconds her hands were tightly bound, her arms stretched in their sockets, her elbows bent at an awkward angle. Her hands grew numb instantly. Clyde approached and bent down so that his eyes were on a level with hers. She stared back at him. So they were going to tie her to this tree tonight while they ate, slept and rested the horses. What if she had to? Clyde gestured to the other two. Come on. We will ride through the night, and return to McGregor lands before the Duncans catch up. He turned to glare at Alice. And you, you will never bring further shame to our clan, nor to your uncle or what little family you have. You are dead to them. You are dead to me. What? They were leaving her here? He turned to red beard and blonde hair. Leave her here to rot. Chapter 23 Nake, please lie back down. I've already warned you against too much movement. I can't just lie here and do nothing, Sarah, Make argued. He felt better. Weak, but better. She had told him that no vital organs had been hit by the knife thrust. He was fortunate indeed, but now he focused on Alice. I know how you feel, Make, but you can't. Make gently removed Sarah's hand from his shoulder, pressing him down onto the bed. You're in no condition to fight me, Sarah, and you know it. He sat up, wincing with the effort but managing. The room swam crazily around him for several moments and then steadied. He looked up at her with satisfaction. See. I'm all right. She glowered down at him, then heaved a put upon sigh. Mackay, you need rest. You lost a lot of blood. And what if Alice is lying out there in the woods, wounded, or... He didn't even want to contemplate what might be happening to Alice. Or what would happen if the McGregors managed to get her within their own clan again. She had already been banished and left for dead. They would make sure of it this time. Mackay. He looked up at her. I love her. I can't just leave her to the McGregors. You understand that, don't you? Of course I do. Believe me, I do understand. But what good is it going to do, Alice, if you die out there trying to save her? She tried to coax Mackay back down onto the bed. Let Hugh and Philip take care of it. He was prepared to respond when Philip entered the room, her Jake behind him and then Hugh. Mackay's eyes widened in disbelief before he erupted. Why aren't you out there looking for her? Philip approached the bed while Jake, his face red with anger, followed his brother with his eyes. Hugh refused to meet his gaze altogether. Mackay turned toward the laird. Philip, why isn't anyone out looking for Alice? Mackay, you know that this is a precarious situation. We. The longer we wait to follow, the farther they'll take her away. Mackay interrupted, his voice raised in anger. How could they stand here? He glared at them until Sarah placed a hand on his shoulder. He looked up at her and saw her eyes filled with tears. If anyone sympathized with his emotions, it was Sarah. Mackay, Philip said tone low. He wasn't speaking to him as a friend at this moment, but as the laird. We cannot risk war with the McGregor clan, especially if they have joined forces with the Orkneys. Mackay stared at him, heart thudding dully in his chest, stomach clenching into a tight knot. Philip, what are you suggesting? Are you suggesting we just let her go? He turned to Jake. What do you say, Jake? It doesn't matter what he says, Philip spoke into the awkward silence. I am the laird. I don't like this decision, but I have to think of our people. Alice. Mary is a McGregor. She belongs to their clan. Would you have me risk slaughter of our own people by keeping someone who doesn't belong to us? You're saying that to me? Mackay questioned, disbelieving. You're saying that to me? Frustration overtook pain then rising anger. 
He pointed to Sarah. And your wife and Jake's wife. Did they belong to you before you took them? Sarah gasped. Mackay knew that he should not dare take such a tone with the laird, but he didn't care. At the moment, he didn't care what Philip thought. He needed to find Alice. He continued without waiting for Philip to respond. You do know that they're going to kill her. It wasn't a question but a statement. He turned to Hugh. Did you tell him what you overheard at the McGregor camp? Aye, I did. Mackay turned from his friend and looked once again to Philip. In spite of everything you know, that she was banished, beaten and then thrown to the wolves, you still refuse to go to her aid. He glanced at Sarah, then back to the laird. She saved Sarah's life. She saved your baby's life. He shook his head and closed his eyes, nearly overwhelmed with disappointment and sadness. And this is what she gets in return. Philip, Sarah said into the ensuing silence. Nake is right. You brought me here from Kirkordy, and Heather too of her own free will. And then when the Orkneys kidnapped me, you didn't hesitate. I didn't belong to the Duncan clan then. I didn't even belong to you, not as your wife. And yet you risked a renewal of bloodshed to come after me. Philip turned his wife, eyebrows low, his voice soft as he spoke. Sarah, neither you nor Heather belong to an enemy clan, let alone the McGregors. And if I had? Philip said nothing while he and his wife locked gazes. Heavy with child, Sarah stood calmly, back straight, chin lifted as she refused to bend to her husband's will. Laird or no, Mackay was once again taken with Sarah's determination and humbled by her loyalty to him and those she held dear. Is it Alice's fault that she was born a McGregor? She shook her head. I admire her, whether she is a McGregor or not. She is a woman who stood up for herself, regardless of the potential consequences. She paid dearly for that. We helped her, Philip. We brought her here. And now all of that is for nothing. Means nothing. If so, then we should have just left her in the woods to die. Not to mention the fact that Mackay is in love with her. All eyes turned toward the door. Heather stood there, arms crossed over her chest, looking at each of them in turn. She has no memory of her life before us. How awful it must be for her. She stepped into the room, dressed in tunic and leather breeches like Alice. Don't forget that in spite of the fact that some of us believed she was a spy, she came back to give us warning of our stepfather's approach. She stared at the laird just like her sister had. Is this how we repay her? Philip muttered a growl deep in his throat then spoke hands cocked on his hips. What can I say to make any of you understand? She's a McGregor. Much as you might disapprove and disagree, the laird has the right to arrange marriages however he sees fit, and... Philip! He lifted a hand toward Sarah, his face red with anger. I don't say I agree with the practice, I am merely stating reality. The laird has the power to do as he pleases. I have no right to interfere. Mackay, tired of the argument, slowly rose. I will go after her myself. Mackay, you can't. You can still bleed to death out there. Hugh stepped forward. I will ride with you, Mackay. Enough. Philip snapped. He cast a warning look toward Hugh. No one will ride unless I give them permission to do so, is that understood? He eyed each of them. Mackay broke the silence. Philip, I have never gone against you in any way. I have been loyal to you since we were children. But I can't. I can't let Alice. We can't leave her to the McGregors. They're going to kill her. They're going? His voice cracked and he paused, closing his eyes in an attempt to calm the nearly overwhelming surge of emotion that rushed through him. He felt a gentle hand on his shoulder and opened his eyes. Sarah stood beside him. Philip please. Her gentle voice broke the tension in the room. Philip heaved a sigh, shaking his head. It's not that I don't have sympathy for her plight. I do. Do you think I'm some sort of animal without emotion? He too paused. Philip if I have to, I'll go away, Mackay said. But Alice needs to have a choice, maybe for the first time in her life. 
if you feel that our being together will endanger the clan, we'll go somewhere else. They want her dead. Do you truly think they're going to want to wage war for someone they've already tried to kill once? That makes sense, you said. Nake and I will go look for her. We can. You can what? Philip interrupted. Kill Clyde McGregor. Those other men with him. For certain, that will renew the bloodshed. That bastard Clyde tried to kill me no thanks to Siana, Jake broke in. We all know that Clyde is nothing but trouble. I would venture to say that Angus McGregor is more than aware of that. He rubbed his whiskered chin. Maybe it's time that all of the clans came together for a little talk. Philip shook his head. You know as well as I do that Angus McGregor is stubborn and will cling to the feud no matter how many years pass under his feet. But you may be right. He paused. Clyde McGregor is a thorn in his side, I know that much. And he and I both know that you would be within your rights to seek vengeance against him, but that doesn't mean. I won't kill him unless I have to, Jake muttered. But I know one thing. That lass is out there all alone, once again facing an uncertain and most likely unpleasant future. Do you really want us to stand by and let it happen? You all know that it's not about what I want. Or what I feel. I like the lass as much as anyone else, but... Sarah interrupted. The moment we took her in, the moment we accepted her, she became one of us. She doesn't remember her past. She doesn't remember any of it. I believe that. Chances are, after all this time, she will never remember. Oh, there may come a time when small bits come back now and then, but I've seen this once before. She turned to Mackay. There's nothing wrong with her, with her mind. Sarah. She turned to her husband. Yes, Philip, going after her might initiate some problems, but the McGregors don't want her. They don't want her. They're going to kill her, Heather said, as quietly as her sister, but the force of her words was not to be doubted. What if, what if we managed to get her away from the McGregors? Then spread the word that she died. Heather. Jake, think about it, Heather continued. If they think she's dead, they're not going to bother looking for her anymore. She turned to her sister and then Philip. They probably only found out about her through Siana. And now Siana is dead. Who's going to know? Mackay felt a surge of affection for Heather. Both she and Sarah were strong, devoted and loyal, not only to one another but all the members of their clan. And now to an outsider who had no one to turn to but themselves. He stood, hiding his pain, which after a few moments ceased throbbing and dulled to a constant ache. I'm going, Philip. If you don't want me to return, say so now. Philip looked at him, still frowning, then glanced at the others. He was outnumbered and knew it. Fine, he muttered. Jake, you and Hugh go with Mackay. I'm going too, Sarah said. Mackay might need me, and Alice. She might need me too. No, absolutely not, Philip snapped, staring down at his wife. And nothing you can say is going to change my mind on that. I'll go, Heather volunteered, glancing at her sister. I think I know enough to provide some assistance. I can take some healing herbs and supplies just in case. Mackay turned to Sarah, saw that she didn't like it, but she placed her hands protectively over her belly and nodded. Sarah then turned to her husband. Well, Philip? Philip said nothing for several moments, then glanced at Mackay, Jake and Hugh in turn. Go well armed. Do what you have to do. I suppose we'll just have to deal with any ramifications later. In less than an hour, the men were mounted. Heather climbed into her own saddle and reached for the satchel Sarah lifted up to her, a leather pouch containing a variety of herbs, tinctures and bandages that Sarah had fashioned from old linen. Mackay waited on his horse, trying to hide his pain and weakness from the others. The moment he showed any sign of either, he had no doubt they would leave him behind, and he wasn't about to let them go after Alice without him. He loved her. He would give his life for her. He just hoped that they could catch up to the McGregors and wrest her from their grasp before it was too late. Chapter 24 
Alice fought against the urge to give up. Crying and bemoaning her fate would not help her. It was hard not to feel despondent, exhausted, cold, hungry and afraid but she forced herself to think. To think of a way to free herself from his tree. Unfortunately, she had yet to succeed. After Clyde McGregor had left her, she had spent most of the day scraping rope between her hands against the tree, hoping that somehow, the rough bark of the pine tree would start cutting through the rope. She tugged, closed her eyes against the pain of her skin scraping against the bark, trying to focus only on this particular task no avail. It wasn't working. At least, it didn't seem like it. The bindings felt as tight as ever. Every muscle from her shoulder down to her wrist screamed in pain. Throughout the hours of the afternoon she had tugged, yanked and even tried to slide her body down the tree trunk, hoping that might help loosen her bindings, but nothing worked, blonde hair had bound her wrists tightly. Every moment struggling to free herself, trying to ignore the pain, trying not to worry about what would happen later, she thought of Mackay. Was he alive? As twilight approached, she abandoned her efforts exhausted, focusing instead on her surroundings. The tree to which she was bound, was located on the bottom of a slight slope. Able to glance a short distance behind her, she saw the woods were filled with pine, spruce and elders, the underbrush thick. Out in front of her, a short distance away through the trees, she saw the edges of a small meadow. In the same direction, she heard the gurgling of a small brook. That wasn't good. Soon animals would venture from the dense woods looking for water. She was in their path. That meant not only the possibility of rabbits and squirrels, but possibly wildcats, seeker deer, wolves and possibly even wild boars. She tried to ignore the hollow feeling in her stomach. More than anything, she wanted to feel McKay's arms around her, telling her that everything was going to be all right. Nothing would be all right. No matter what happened, her presence would cause trouble for the Duncan clan. She was an embarrassment to the McGregors. She resolved, if fortunate enough to escape her present situation, she would have to make her way through life on her own. Somehow. That thought devastated her. It hadn't been until the moment when she saw Redbeard stab Mackay that she realized just how deep her affection, her love for him had grown. That love had burgeoned gradually, but now, knowing that he might be gone, she felt his loss as if she had been stabbed herself. Even if he did manage to survive, she couldn't put him in more danger, nor anyone else of the Duncan clan. She would not bring trouble upon them, now that she knew the truth about her identity and her history. It didn't matter, that she didn't remember any of it. She didn't remember living with the McGregors, or where she had made her home. All she knew was that they had tried to kill her. Her own uncle, leader of the McGregor clan, had ordered her banished, beaten and thrown to the wolves. Her cousin had been part of it. Perhaps even her own parents and siblings, if she had any. She didn't want to belong to such a family. As twilight approached, ever so slowly ebbing into darkness, she heard animals scampering about. A rabbit emerged from under a nearby bush and froze when it saw her, nose twitching, ears laid back against its body staring at her before deciding she was no threat. Eventually, other animals ventured toward water, including the expected deer. Then, as overwhelming fatigue caused her to droop against her bindings painful as that was, she heard another sound, one that filled her with dread. In the distance, a wolf howled, its cry repeated a few moments later by another. She prayed that they were upwind of her, that they wouldn't catch her scent on the night air. Defenseless, she had no way to ward off an attack. With every passing moment, her heart pounded harder. The howls of the wolves grew closer. She glanced down at her feet, but couldn't see anything save pine needles and a crushed pine cone. Nothing even remotely helpful in warding off an attack, bound hands or not. What if? A long low growl captured her attention. She peered into the darkness. A meager shaft of early evening moonlight shone through the trees. There, a short distance ahead and a bit to her right, she saw the wolf, his grey coat just slightly lighter than the darkness around him. He hunched low, creeping toward her, now issuing a near-constant growl that erupted from deep in his chest. Her heart pounded so hard she felt it would burst. A cold chill raced down her spine. 
Her gaze riveted to that of the wolf, she realized for the first time seriously realized that she might not manage to escape. The wolf crept closer, maybe twenty feet away before it paused, head low to the ground, yellow eyes still watching her every move. Could he see the pulse pounding in her throat? Could it sense and smell her fear? No. If she was going to die, she would die fighting to the best of her ability. Tamping down her panic, praying that the Lord would accept her soul if it was really her time, she screamed. Not a frightened scream but an angry scream, shouting at the wolf, ordering it to go away. She made her voice sounded as fierce and strong as possible. The wolf froze, likely startled by her outburst. He stared a moment, then turned and slunk into the shadows of the woods beyond. She heaved a shaky sigh of relief. Every bone in her body felt like it had melted. She knew better than to think that this would be the end of it. In time the wolf would return. Each time he would grow bolder. She might be able to frighten him away one more time, maybe two, but then? Wolves were smart. Because she couldn't move, she was easy prey. She could kick out at him, lash out with her feet but what good would that do? The wolf would merely clamp her foot or her limb in his mouth, able to crush bone and tear blood vessels. She would bleed to death. Or be eaten alive. Or. Frantic, she renewed her efforts to loosen her bindings. Tugging, yanking, groaning against the pain. The skin of her wrists bled but she kept trying. She had to get loose or by dawn there was a good chance she would be ripped to shreds. Even if she wasn't by then, the wolf knew where she was, and soon so too would others. She would be no match for them. Make, she gasped. She desperately wished to see him one more time before she died. It might be too late for that already. She blinked back her tears. She would not give up. She would not. Two more times during the night she scared the wolf away with her shouts. Exhausted, every muscle in her body screaming with pain, her eyes burning with weariness, she finally noticed a brief glimpse of dawn toward the east. She offered up a quick prayer of thanks that she had survived the night, but her predicament hadn't changed. By the time the sun breached eastern horizon, she knew that she had to get out of her bonds or she wouldn't make it through the day. Her legs wobbled beneath her, so weary that they barely managed to hold her weight. The muscles of her arms had stiffened, not only due to her strenuous efforts in the awkward position, but from the night's chill. She couldn't feel her fingers anymore. Hours ago, the tingling numbness had given way to no feeling at all. She wanted to sleep, desperately. Perhaps if she just allowed herself to sleep for a little while, no, she couldn't. If she fell asleep, she might never wake again. Not sure what kept her going, acknowledging that Mackay was probably dead, she nevertheless pushed herself upward, her ankles protesting, her knees wobbling as she lifted herself further upright. She made a tremendous effort to tug against her bindings, her head lifted, leaning against the tree. She watched the sky slowly brighten as she soared her arms up and down. Birds sang in the trees overhead. She saw a rabbit nearby, possibly even the one from the night before, munching contentedly on some kind of nut. At least the wolf wasn't around. If it were, the rabbit wouldn't be. The birds wouldn't be singing. Her arms felt as if they had been pulled from her shoulder sockets. She could barely move her elbows but as she forced herself to tug, taking a deep breath and closing her eyes in concentration, she continued to rub the bindings against the bark. She could only move her hands couple of inches up and down, but perhaps it would be enough. She felt some give in the rope. Her heart leapt and hope burgeoned inside her. Had her hands moved farther apart? Had she just imagined it? She tugged again. Yes? She felt some slack in the rope. The bindings had weakened. She began to laugh, blinking back tears of relief. She would escape. She willed it. Despite the pain, despite the stiffness and protest every muscle in her body screamed at her, she continued her efforts. Up. Down. Up. Down. She had no idea how much time had passed, but the sun continued to rise. Misty fog wafted between tree trunks, ebbing as more sunlight filtered through the trees, gradually offering warmth. Her face throbbed, her ribs hurt, and it was difficult to breathe, but she kept going. She would keep going. 
for Mackay. For herself. She would. She paused when she heard the sound. What was that? It sounded like a snort. She searched the trees and underbrush, and there, in a patch of woods between the tree to which she was bound and the small clearing in the distance, she saw a shadow of movement. Her heart sank and then began to pound. No. A wild boar. This couldn't be happening. She'd made it through the night, managed to scare the wolf away, and now, a wild boar. She didn't know what she was more afraid of, a wild boar or the wolf. Boars were extremely dangerous, outweighing a grown man by five or six times, not afraid of anything, too stupid to be afraid, their tusks capable of eviscerating human flesh. Close to panic, she struggled against the bindings holding back her groans of pain. She had to get loose. Now? The rustling, rooting sound in the trees grew louder. Hurry. Her heart pounded so hard her ears buzzed with fear, and lightheadedness caused her vision to swim. No, she couldn't faint. She wouldn't. Suddenly, the boar emerged from in between the trees. It saw her and paused, its black eyes riveted on her. It tossed its head, snout lifted in the air, nostrils flaring. It had picked up her scent. Her mouth felt so dry she couldn't swallow, could only stare wide-eyed in horror as the boar approached. No, no, no. She tugged hard against the bindings, pulling and heaving as hard as she could. Suddenly her hands were free, bits of rope dangling from each wrist. Startled for a moment, she was frozen. The movement had alerted the boar, and pawing the ground it lowered its massive head and charged toward her. No way could she outrun a wild boar, not in her condition and not even if she were in prime shape. She looked upward, saw a branch overhead maybe four inches around. It would hold her weight. She had to make it. She would only have one chance. She focused on that branch, and resisting the ache and stiffness in her muscles, she refused to succumb to weakness. With every last bit of effort left in her body, she jumped, barely managed to clasp onto the branch, feet dangling a couple of inches above the ground. The boar caught an edge of her legging, one tusk tearing her flesh. She screamed. She kicked at it. Her free leg swept down, her heel slamming into its eye. The boar released her and shook its head, grunting. She hung panicked. She couldn't do it. She was too weak. Her eyes wide with horror, she stared as the boar lifted its head again, so close she could see the crack in one of its tusks. The black-brown and rust-colored rough hair on its back rippled with its bunched muscles, short legs churning at the dirt. The boar charged again. With a garbled cry she pulled herself upward, lifting her legs and using the momentum to help her swing higher up off the ground. Move. Climb. She grunted with the effort, demanding her body to do what she ordered. She barely managed to lift her feet high enough to avoid the second charge of the boar, so intent on her legs that it slammed into the bottom of the tree, taking a glancing blow against his shoulder. A pinecone tumbled downward, and landed next to the enraged animal. Blood and adrenaline raced through her veins, giving her another surge of strength. She scrambled to lift her legs higher, to wrap them around the branch, now hanging like a deer trussed up after the kill. She heaved herself upward as the boar turned with a squeal, snorting and pounding the ground, lifting itself onto its haunches. Its front hooves slammed against the tree trunk. She couldn't help the wild, panicked cries that escaped her mouth as she heaved herself higher, so much so that she managed to pull herself completely up, rolling onto her stomach, arms still wrapped around the branch. Frozen, but only for a moment. She needed more height. She managed to force herself to let go with one hand, and grasp another branch over her head. Ever so carefully, she maneuvered herself upward. Finally she managed to scramble up even higher, until she was maybe fifteen feet up off the ground, tightly hugging the trunk of the tree, her legs straddling another larger branch, feet dangling. Her face pressed against the rough pine bark, heart still pounding, her chest heaving with exertion and fear, she inhaled the scent of pine, felt the bark pressing against her cheek as she looked down at the wild boar, now sitting on its haunches staring up at her. Her pulse racing, her breath escaping her chest in wild gasps, she clamped her arms around the tree trunk and her legs around the tree branch, not daring to loosen her hold for fear of tottering and falling out of the tree. She finally pulled her breathing under control, 
but was unable to stop the trembling that shook her entire body. The sun slowly peeked through the tree branches but she was nowhere close to safe. Yet, the boar held its ground, looking up waiting, waiting for her to fall. Chapter 25 Mackay continually swept his gaze along the trail they followed, and into the woods on either side, seeking some sign, some indication that Alice was still alive. They had not found her body tossed into the brush, so that was good. He willed her to be alive, though he knew that the chances of success lessened the longer it took to find her, or the McGregors. She's going to be all right. He glanced at Heather, riding beside him. Jake had taken the lead, followed by Hugh, then Mackay and Heather. He said nothing. Mackay, she's strong and determined. She survived in the woods by herself, even after they left her for dead. Don't underestimate her. I have a feeling there's a lot more to Alice than you think. He wanted to believe that. He wanted to have a chance to get to know her better. She would never be Mary to him. She was Alice. He loved her. He wasn't sure when or how it happened, but he had fallen in love with her. He had fallen in love with her personality, her smile, her ability to survive against the greatest of odds. If he found her, he... There. Mackay saw Jake pointing to some long grass at the edge of the deer trail they followed through the woods. Hugh dismounted to take a closer look while Mackay urged Bruce closer. He started to dismount. No, Mackay, stay where you are, Heather cautioned. You can see from your saddle. The more you move around, the greater the chances of you bleeding again. He cast her an annoyed glance but knew she was right. Besides, Hugh could read signs better than just about anyone in the clan. Two horses. They milled around here for a bit, and then headed off in that direction. He stood, eyes narrowed as he pointed deeper into the woods. Let me follow the trail a bit and see what's up there. The others waited, Mackay impatiently, as Hugh carefully meandered through the trees, touching a pine bough, leaning down to observe a broken twig, just before he disappeared into the undergrowth he stood, glanced in the other direction then at the ground, then gestured for them. Jake, leading Hugh's horse and Mackay, followed by Heather, urged their mounts deeper into the woods. Look there. Hugh pointed. They've dismounted, and an imprint has been left in the pine needles. Mackay glanced down and saw where a large cluster of dead pine needles had been disturbed. Scuffed boot prints in the dirt beneath them prompted him to believe that some sort of fray had taken place. And here. Mackay pulled his gaze from the ground and looked to where Hugh pointed at the base of a nearby pine tree. He tried to discern what he saw. What is that? Hugh turned to him, his frown unmistakable, his eyes taking on a darker look. It's blood. Mackay felt like he'd taken a blow. He stared at the disturbed ground at the base of the pine tree, then swore. The bastards. Another rider joined them here, Hugh continued, pointing toward a trail that meandered deeper into the woods not far from the one they had taken. Two men barged into my house. That third rider is probably Clyde catching up with them. But where is the other one? The one that arrived with Clyde? Jake shook his head. Maybe that one's ridden ahead. We may have to backtrack and see if we can pick up his trail. Figure out what he's up to. Mackay swallowed the lump forming in his throat. This wasn't good. The thought of those bastards laying their hands on Alice filled him with rage, but at the moment he was helpless to aid her. Do you think they took Alice with them or, or do you think they killed her and left her out here somewhere? What if we split up? A noise whistled past Mackay's ear, followed by a dull thunk as an arrow embedded into the tree trunk not far from Jake's head, the shaft slightly vibrating. He reached for Heather, yanking her from her horse as he slid off Bruce, protected between their mounts. He dragged her to the ground, the horses prancing nervously around them. He covered her body with his while Jake also quickly dismounted, he and Hugh taking shelter behind nearby trees. You're not going to find her. The voice came from a short distance away. Mackay recognized it. Rory McGregor. He looked at Heather. Stay put. Ignoring the pain in his side, 
his heart pounding with a combination of dread and a thirst for revenge, he pulled his axe from his belt and crouched, seeking the source of the voice. Laughter rang out in the woods, joined seconds later by another. Mackay cursed. They had walked right into a trap. A trap obviously set by the McGregors. He gestured for Heather to find shelter behind a nearby tree while he did the same, standing, his eyes scanning every shadow, every tree trunk for some type of movement. Moments later, they heard the sound of pounding hooves. Quick. After them. Mackay moved toward Bruce while Heather also scurried to grab her horse's reins. Jake and Hugh had already mounted and were in pursuit. Mackay followed, Bruce darting his way among the trees, every jolt, every stride prompting a bolt of pain to surge through his body. Heather's horse was right behind his. He followed a short distance behind Hugh, Jake now in the lead, hunched low over his horse's neck. They had to catch them. They had to rescue Alice. An arrow came out of nowhere and embedded itself into the meat of Bruce's left shoulder. Bruce neighed and stumbled but continued to gallop after the others. Protect Heather. That shout came from Jake, just before he uttered the Duncan war cry and charged deeper into the woods. Mackay followed Jake's orders and pulled up behind a close-growing cluster of trees. Worried about Bruce, knowing that he had to protect Heather, even though every part of him wanted to continue after the McGregors. Bruce. He's bleeding. Mackay nodded and turned to find Heather behind him, her horse prancing nervously. She held her bow in her left hand, already knocked, her gaze quickly searching the surrounding area. Heather, get behind the trees, deeper into the woods. Her eyes suddenly narrowed. There. In a flash of movement she lifted the bow, pulled back the bowstring and released her arrow and let it fly. An instant later he heard a pained cry. Stay here. Mackay ordered. He urged Bruce forward, his axe at the ready. A short distance away, lying among a clump of brush he saw the body. It was Rory McGregor, an arrow protruding from his chest. He looked dead but just to make sure, still fighting pain and his body thrumming with bloodlust and anger Mackay leaned down and swung his axe, burying it deep in the man's skull with a sickening crunch. Is he? Heather uttered a garbled cry as she appeared behind Mackay. She covered her mouth with her hand and quickly turned away. I told you to. We need to take care of Bruce, she interrupted, quickly turning her horse deeper into a thicker grove of trees. With one last glance at the McGregor clansman, Mackay growled as he yanked his axe from the man's crushed skull and followed Heather. As soon as they reached shelter, he dismounted. Heather had already dismounted, waiting for him. She peered closely at the arrow protruding from Bruce's shoulder and then offered Mackay a comforting nod. It's not deep, Mackay. A flesh wound. Without hesitation, she grasped the shaft of the arrow where it disappeared into Bruce's flesh and pulled it out in one firm yank. Bruce snorted but otherwise did not seem the worse for wear. Another reason for Mackay to hate the McGregors. He watched as Heather quickly made a poultice from some of the herbs that Sarah had given her and tended to Bruce's wound, murmuring comforting words to the horse as she did so. Someday you're going to be as gifted as your sister in the healing arts, he told her. She turned to him with a smile. I'll never be as gifted as Sarah, but this I can do. She paused and peered in a direction that Jake and Hugh had gone in pursuit of the McGregors. How long should we wait here? He noted the worry in her eyes. He felt the same, but this time he would do as he was ordered. He would protect Heather, while at the same time praying that Alice was with the McGregors and that Jake and Hugh would rescue her. We wait until they return. The sun had dipped toward mid-afternoon before Jake and Hugh returned. Hugh's left tunic sleeve was torn, hanging down to his elbow, stained with blood. Jake sported a wound in his thigh, but whether it had been made by an arrow or a knife thrust, Mackay didn't know. Heather barely stifled her cry of alarm when she saw her husband's injury. It's all right, Heather, not serious, Jake assured her. Mackay saw her concern nevertheless, the injury in Jake's already bad leg. He had taken an axe blow on the battlefield a little over a year ago, leaving him with a permanent limp. 
Heather rushed toward her husband, and placing her hands on his injured thigh, peered closely at the wound. Hugh glanced at Mackay, slightly shook his head, and then gazed at Heather and Jake. Don't worry about me, Heather, I'm fine too. That seemed to jar Heather, and she quickly looked at Hugh with a look of chagrin. Are you really, Hugh? Your wound? Is it serious? He chuckled and shook his head. I already bandaged it myself. No need to worry about me. He glanced at Jake and winked. A mere scratch, really. Mackay watched Jake and Hugh, his heart thudding dully in his chest. He asked the question, even though he already knew the answer. She wasn't with them. Hugh sobered and shook his head. Jake and Heather exchanged a glance, and then Heather turned a sorrowful gaze toward Mackay. We'll find her, Mackay, we will. She turned to her husband. Won't we, Jake? Aye, we will. We can't. And what about McGregor? Clyde and his two miscreant friends are dead. Mackay closed his eyes and again shook his head. This was going to cause a lot of trouble. Killing the... We hid their bodies in a cave and covered the opening with rocks. We set their horses loose. No one is going to know what became of them. Mackay glanced at Hugh and hoped he was right. Clyde was a troublemaker, even somewhat troublesome for his own clan or so the rumours went. Maybe no one would much care. With Clyde dead, no one from the McGregor clan would know that Alice, if she was still alive, had survived both attempts to dispose of her. He allowed himself a small glimmer of hope. I suggest we go back to where the trail into the woods disappeared. We might be able to find something there that we missed, some indication of what they did with Alice. Mackay didn't want to think the words his heart dreaded. What they did with Alice. Where they had tossed her lifeless body. Without another word, Heather and Mackay mounted their horses. Mackay glanced down at Bruce's wound satisfied that the bleeding had stopped, and his horse barely seemed to notice the injury. Still, he wouldn't push him too hard. As they rode slowly back to the area where the trail had disappeared into the trees, Jake turned to Mackay. There was a third rider. He wasn't with Clyde and his companion. He might be. Heather killed him, Mackay interrupted. Jake cast a wide-eyed glance at his wife. The bastard was hiding in the woods. His arrow struck Bruce on his shoulder. He cast an approving wink toward Heather. She's gotten quite adept with her bow, hasn't she? Hugh grinned but said nothing. Jake stared at his wife for several moments and then he too grinned. In silence they rode back to the trail they had found in the woods and entered the forest. Mackay felt weary, but he refused to allow himself to rest or to ask for it. Alice was out here, somewhere. He wouldn't stop looking until he found her. Chapter 26 Move. The boar grunted, then snorted at Alice's angry tone. He looked up, his eyes piercing those wicked-looking tusks long sharp and ready to tear her flesh to pieces the moment she got within reach. She had lost track of how many hours she had clung to the trunk of the pine tree, straddling the branch. Her muscles stiff and sore, despair tugged at her brain. What if the boar didn't leave? What if it stayed there forever? How long could she stay up here without succumbing to exhaustion? If she fell asleep she could fall out of the tree. If the fall didn't kill her, the boar would. It was mid-afternoon. Tired and hungry, she also tried to ignore the fact that she had to relieve herself. For the past couple of hours, she had tried to ignore that need, but she could no longer. Her bladder would surely burst at any moment. But how? How could she with the boar standing guard far below? She finally decided that she couldn't wait any longer. Carefully she maneuvered herself, moving just enough so that she crouched on the tree branch. One arm firmly curling around another branch close overhead, she managed to wiggle her legging down. Wickedly she hoped that the boar was directly below, as she relieved herself with a sigh. Thank goodness no one would see what she had just done, her bare ass exposed to the cool afternoon air. After she finished, adjusted her clothing and repositioned herself more comfortably on the branch, she decided she had no recourse other than to outwake the boar. 
He would get hungry and thirsty, sooner or later. Perhaps that rabbit she had seen earlier in the morning would prove adequate for the boar's appetite. In the meantime, she scanned the ground, looking for something that she could use as a weapon, just in case. Still, whether she had a weapon or not, she knew that boars were vicious. That animal down there more than outweighed her. She was no match for its brute strength and ferocity. What could she? She heard a sound in the distance. The breeze rustling through the tree branches. A distant animal, a deer perhaps calling for a mate. She listened carefully, but didn't hear it again. She returned her attention to looking for something down below that she could use to defend herself. She sighed, not finding anything suitable. She heard the noise again. Closer. She frowned, peering through the tree branches trying to discern its origin. That wasn't an animal. It was human. Somebody calling for... Alice. Her heart leapt into her throat and tears filled her eyes. Someone was looking for her. The voice was still distant, its echo carried on the wind. The only people who would call her Alice were those of the Duncan clan. Choking back her excitement, she lifted her head and shouted. Over here. Over here. She carefully watched the trees for any sign of movement. Nothing happened, and then she heard the voice again, louder this time. Alice. Pause. Alice, where are you? Over here. In a tree. She choked back tears. Up here in the tree. And then not two hundred yards away, she saw movement. A horse then another, and another emerged from the deep woods. She recognized Jake's reddish-brown hair, and then the figure following him, so large it could only be Hugh. I'm over here, she shouted. Watch out for the boar. The riders halted. As they did so, Alice watched as two more figures emerged from the tree line. Her heart skipped a beat as she stared, narrowing her eyes to make sure they weren't deceiving her. Mackay. He was alive. And beside him rode a smaller figure, female. Heather. I'm in the tree at the far end of the clearing, she shouted, half laughing, half crying. Relieved to find Mackay alive. There's a boar. At that moment the boar grunted stiffened, and tail lifted high and nose in the air, turned to face the newcomers. It squealed and then grunted several times. She heard the sound of horses' hooves approaching. The boar lowered its head, grunting louder now, pawing at the dirt with its hooves. Jake, watch out. The boar charged the horses. She cringed in horror as several of the horses shied away, ears back, teeth bared in fear. Jake pulled a heavy short axe attached to his saddle. Two-handed he lifted it above his head, his horse standing its ground. He swung the weapon back over his head, and then heaved it forward with all his might. His aim proved true. The axe struck the boar dead center, right between the eyes. The animal dropped immediately, a cloud of dust rising around him. Alice. Alice, where are you? She heard the fear in McKay's voice as he looked for her. Tears filled her eyes, and she had to swallow thickly before she could call out to him. Straight ahead Mackay, I'm in the big tree straight ahead. All four horses headed toward the tree, Jake pausing and dismounting as they passed the boar. Alice stared down as Heather, Hugh and Mackay stopped their horses beneath the tree, staring upward. Trembling with relief, fighting back her tears thanking God that Mackay was still alive, she sat frozen for several moments, eyes locked on his. His face was pale and dark circles smudged under his eyes, but he had never looked so wonderful. He scowled, his mouth turned down in a frown of displeasure. Why was? She realized that her face must surely be bruised from her altercation with Clyde, but she forced a smile, trying to reassure him that she was all right. I was beginning to think I would be stuck up here, forever. She tried to laugh. Mackay finally allowed a small smile. So, are you going to come down from there, or are you just going to stay put for the rest of the day? They sat around a fire at the edge of the clearing, the air around them filled with the aroma of roasted boar meat. Jake had gutted and stripped the meat from the animal's bones, packing most of it in his cloak. The bundle of meat was now tied to the back of his saddle to take back to the manor early the following morning. 
Alice had managed to make her way down the tree, every muscle in her body protesting, Make offering encouragement, and Heather worrying about everyone. The sun had started its descent toward the western horizon, by the time Make swept her up into his arms. Hugh thought it would be best that they remain here for the night. Heather had looked at her injuries, determined that nothing was broken, and assuring Mackay that her cuts and bruises would heal within a few days. She then turned her attention to cleaning and bandaging Jake's and Hugh's wounds, much to their grumbling dissent. Finally she had turned to Mackay, and insisted that she allow him to clean and place a new bandage on his wound as well. He had protested, and quite vehemently, not wanting to let Alice out of his grasp, not even for a moment. Finally, between cajoling from Heather and Alice, he had finally acquiesced, but only after Heather threatened to complain about his behavior to Sarah. Later, after they had all gorged themselves on boar meat, Alice turned to Mackay, sitting close beside her. She had to ask. Had to know what was to become of her. What's going to happen to me now, Mackay? Where do I go from here? Mackay gazed down at her before face set with determination, he spoke. You're going to marry me, Alice. She blinked in surprise as her heart skipped a beat, then dropped to the pit of her stomach. She frowned in confusion. But what about? Clyde McGregor's dead, as are the men who rode with him, Hugh quietly broke in. No one is going to know they are dead, and no one is going to know that you didn't survive your first attack in the woods. It took a moment for the words to sink in. Everybody thought she was dead. The only people who knew that she wasn't, were also dead. Her relief was somewhat tempered by a concern that had to be spoken. She turned to Mackay. But what if I remember Mackay? What if I remember that I'm a McGregor? You're not a McGregor, Alice. He shook his head. You're going to marry me, remember? You'll be Alice Douglas now. Even if you do remember someday, you'll always be Alice to me. No matter what. Alice's heart skipped a beat, the worry, the fear, the unknown no longer quite so terrifying. Not caring that everyone watched, she leaned toward Mackay and wrapped her arms around him. She lifted her lips to his and kissed him, deeply, giving him his answer. Yes, she would marry him. No matter what the future brought, she would indeed be his wife, and she would become the newest member of the Duncan clan. Hugh grumbled. Ock, now I'm the odd man out, the only one still untethered by the marital yoke. Alice broke off the kiss as they all turned to Hugh, saw the twinkle in his eyes and started to laugh. Mackay shook his head and clapped his friend on the back. Just you wait Hugh, he said. Sooner or later, there's a woman out there who is more than capable of taming a big brute like you. Another burst of laughter followed, and then the levity was broken by Heather's ensuing comment. I wonder what's going on back at the house, with our stepfather? She turned to Jake. He can't take us away from you and Philip, can he? Jake scowled. Let him try, and he'll end up like Clyde McGregor. Heather smiled up at her husband, cradled her head on his shoulder, and stared into the dancing flames of their fire. Alice smiled as she gazed at the faces around her, reveling in her newfound sense of belonging. After several moments, she turned once more to Mackay. He watched her, a smile lifting the corners of his mouth. She couldn't stop herself. Once again, she lifted her face toward his, welcoming his kiss, the warm embrace of his arms around her shoulders, reveling in his love and support. She felt transformed. Alice Douglas. It certainly had a nice ring to it. I hope you've enjoyed this latest production. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.